still inside my blood Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to LCK Spring 2024. I am Atlas. I am joined by Orcs here. We are double A's, much like the batteries, ready to energize you this morning. Yeah, I'm right? just kind of shocked by that massive dice we saw. I know. And it looked, it sounded hefty. Yeah. You know, they really had to put effort into to rolling that one. Might need that sort of luck today. Yeah, exactly. And uh, look, sometimes uh, putting effort in is difficult. Taking him out is something that T1 has done. Uh, and Bro are struggling uh, alongside him. Let's uh, move on from this, shall we? Because it's an auspicious day. Today, we could see Faker achieve 3,000 kills and 600 wins. Yeah. Which, which is uh, pretty ridiculous. Quite an achievement. Obviously, Faker being around for, you know, I'd say a hot minute at least. Um, but relatively long. Yeah. It's not always that you have like two big achievements align. And given the matchup today, expectation is. They're probably going to get the two wins, but DRX hoping to play upset. Exactly. Um, and they've done that before. There was a, I think there was a match uh, in 2022. Can't quite remember. Um, but oh. that was one where it, it, was, it seemed like T1 were going to win, and then yeah. they didn't. Um, T1 are aiming for a four win streak um, versus DRX trying to secure their first victory. Um, well, I mean, they did. But uh, the first one that isn't Bro, I think, would be an important one as well. Yeah, I mean, Bro been struggling, so them beating them, kind of, you'd, you'd hope. I feel like that's like, you, you really want to be winning the Bro matchup, but it was close. So it definitely felt like quite a bit of a struggle to get that one. Um, and today we'll need even more struggling. I think there are some positives to be drawn. I think the bot lane has looked pretty positive, but uh, definitely a very big uphill battle. I would say so. I think that um, the top side of the map is where that battle is going to be fought the hardest. I think that Rascal, in his heyday, was definitely one of our better top laners here in the LCK, but it's not that time right now, unfortunately. I'm feeling like Rascal and Kingen are two players that have seen better days when it comes to their top lane performance, and we'll see whether you know both him and Kingen uh, can get themselves back in order. But against Zayus? I'm not sure about that. Uh, he yeah. was our OPGG uh, Player of the Week for a reason. And with top laners struggling a fair bit, to be perfectly honest, here in the LCK, um, Zayas kind of skipped it, and he said, I'm just a god. As uh, we can see, the GOAT Faker, this is what we were talking about before, nine kills away from 3,000 and two wins away from 600 with a 2-0, 2-1 um, 
Benfica will be able to achieve that uh, 600 win milestone, which is absolutely huge. It's mammoth, honestly. Um, I, I, not many players will ever even get close to that. Uh, not, I'm not sure anyone really will even be within reaching distance. It is such a massive yeah. amount. This is the crazy thing is that we may not ever get a player to achieve any of the the records that Faker is getting. We're not. We don't even need to bring up like the the thing that says there's this player that's this much, and you're catching up to this guy. No, because Faker's just at the top of like almost all of those metrics. They're also going to be welcomed to Lol Park first. T1 making their way out. A team that has become a well-oiled machine here in the LCK. Everyone staying together after winning the big one in 2023. Looking to see whether they can do that a couple of times in a row. And uh, look, I don't know whether this is necessarily the match where they're going to be going all out. But uh, after suffering their first defeat up against Gen G, they have certainly looked like they're just not willing to lose anymore. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a thing. It's like, you know, coming off the Worlds win, that was obviously massive for them. But it's not a situation where they can kind of just relax, take it easy, because Gen G has had the edge domestically for quite some time, and the fact that they've already lost against them in this spring split, definitely not want to let that happen again. No, absolutely not. We'll see whether they can overcome that in round two, but first, they're going to have to overcome this team right here. With two new players coming from Challenger, of course, in Sponge and Satab. Satab especially having a few struggles here and there. Uh, you can see Pleta of course, formerly Becca, and has spent some time in the LCK over the last couple of years, to be perfectly honest. Um, but he was also in Challenger, so three new players making their way up to join the veterans in Rascal and Teddy. Teddy has upped his performance, and I think that that is definitely very important because he is sort of the, the big guns of this team, but still hasn't necessarily reached the highs that we knew he was once capable of. Uh, and against this team right here as well in the longest game of all time. Gumiyushi versus Teddy will be our matchup here, and you can see the damage percent is the huge one. That's what I really want to focus on because Gumiyushi is in 10th place, but it's largely because Zayas and Faker do so much damage. Yeah, you know, it's definitely... This is one of those stats where it really uh, looks at the weight your teammates are kind of pulling. Yeah. Teddy is the guy for DRX. If they're going to come out ahead, he needs to be the carry, whereas Gumiyushi he can kind of relax sometimes. He's got a lot of, a lot of yeah. force in the early lanes, and it's also quite competitive just to, to maintain that damage. Uh, you can see as well, kill participation. You know, often a player with low kill participation, it indicates that people are doing other stuff on the map. Or their top lane, it keeps getting solo kills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's definitely true. Um, I think the bot lane for DRX have actually been really solid. You know, as much as the team has been struggling as a whole, I think they can go pound to pound with quite a few bot lanes in the league. I would agree. I will say T1's bot lane is kind of their own beast, right? So this yeah. is, you know, regardless of the outcome of the game, I'm hoping we get to see Teddy and Pleta put up a good form against them. You know, that is that is kind of what I'm looking for from them. And then if you, you know, if they manage to even win bot lane, you just take it from there. Doesn't mean you'll win the game, not necessarily, but you'll deal with, it, <laughs> deal with that when you get to it. We're gonna, okay, so this, this is, you know, the classic David and Goliath, right? We're not gonna sugarcoat it. We don't wanna, we don't wanna, you know, try and throw around some narratives to make this uh, more interesting than it otherwise is. This should be a T120 stomp, yeah. right? Um, but they might win bot lane. So that's what we're gonna focus on. We're gonna focus on the bottom side of the map and then immediately after the, the early laning phase, um, that's when we can open the tables to all we'll the see floodgates we'll that Zayas may have provided. Yeah, we'll see what we get to this point. Uh, Zayas, Zayas is leading the solo kills. He has 10 <laughs> in two weeks. And that used to be Rascal. Rascal used to be the solo kill guy. He w he won years, like seasons in a row, Yeah. Uh, as far as that stat is concerned. Um, you know what that means? What does that mean? That means we get mano a mano fights to the death in the top lane. And based on what I can see here with the solo kill standings and the fact that there is no Rascal on the list, that might just mean that that 10 in the number one spot is just going to increase. Is yeah. that what we're thinking? Yeah, probably. I think as well, like just saying the 10 out of context isn't that meaningful, but second is Showmaker with seven, and then it drops to Clear with four, which a bunch of people are tied at four. So like, other than Showmaker, no one is even close. No, and Showmaker like was a fed Cassidy, which I think you solo killed by accident. Yeah, I don't. In a team fight. We count that? Do we allow it? Yeah, well, I mean, we're going to have to because it exists. Let's jump into the draft here. As we can see, already the Shadow Isles are being decimated. T1 do not want to see that whatsoever. Callista and Maokai both taken away. Ash and Varus. Archery is banned on the side of DRX. 
Thematic bands. I actually really like that. Um, really, uh, it adds to my immersion. Yeah, it's clearly a theme going. You know, if this was this was TFT, there'd be synergies. Yeah, we need a Viego band here to really stick with the Shadow Isles vibe. I don't think we're gonna get it, honestly. You don't think so? Sponges. Oh, oh Shadow Isles! There we go, Sinner oh Man. My. Oh, it's perfect. Okay, what do we? Do want? we have anybody else with a bow? I guess Corky's got a. Uh, it, no. I don't think it comes a bow. Ranged characters so is the theme. So we think T1 got the edge in terms of synergy on the vans over DRX. Yeah. Uh, and then they, they go for the first pick, Lucian. And Lucian is married to Senna? I think there's synergy yeah. that's still, uh, it's still, still going. Still following that. I'm honestly not a huge fan of the Lucian first pick. I kind of prefer the, the Milio. Yeah, and uh, that's what's going to be picked here. Yeah, you kind of just get matched. So it's going to be like Lucian Nami into Phileos Milio. I really like the Aphelios Milio side of that. That being said, T1 are a pretty good team uh, yeah. at, at applying pressure with that Lucian Army. And the Orianna coming out for Faker. Oh, God. The Azir. Well, uh, you know what? Can Azir's win rate really get any worse at this point? Well, I mean, that is. I'm really. Do you know what I really like, you uh, four Orcs? It's your ability to spot a silver lining. <laughs> and. That's what, yeah, I don't think that the percentage can really go down by that much. You know, I have, a lot of people talk about silver linings. I don't think it's quite silver. I feel like it's like a copper lining, you know? Ah. Like a tier below. That doesn't sound like a very silver lining attitude to me. <laughs> um, I prefer the gold lining, personally. Um, but yes, Faker on the Orianna. It's also going to further augment uh, the Lucian composition, right? You can throw command protects at him and things like that. Make sure that he's doing as much as possible. And we actually saw Bull yesterday really play sort of that frontline dodging and weaving Lucian to really great effect. It was very impressive. So we'll see whether Grimushi is going to do the same thing. He's sort of known for that as well. And now with the added protection, of both, you know, Nami and the Orianna. Certainly could be a possibility here as Nocturne and Jarvan both taken away. And the Sejuani as well. Sponge and Ona both getting focused. As there is Udia. Not I going think to let Rascal have a free time <laughs> towards the top side. I think DRX kind of have to take Vi here. And then T1 probably go Rel. Would make sense. You know, Rel or Orianna really powerful combo. But I think if you leave Vi open, like how is your Aphelios going to play the game when you're just going to get ulted and blown up? Like, True. the Vial combined with the Orianna ult is going to be pretty devastating. I kind of like the Rel as well, just given the fact that there isn't a massive amount of range on the side of uh, T1 just yet, but it does, like you say, leave up the Vi. Yeah. You know, as much as I think Rel is obviously super strong, paired with Orianna, it's really devastating. I think Milio has an easier time peeling Rel, because you can interrupt her W with your Q, whereas Vi will just press R, and it's like, well, unlucky. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Zayas thinking about uh, the Aatrox, and will lock that one in. Ona taking a little bit of extra time, figuring out what he wants to do, and then immediately locks in by. So never you mind. Yeah. One final pick as Rascal does have counter into the Aatrox, and I Yone would... being considered. That would be... That would be a gauntlet. This feels like, like you could just go Cassante, but I feel like he's he's opting into the the duel to the death. Yeah. yeah, he saw that 10 solo kills, and he's like, oh. Oh, no. no. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, sort of. Jax is okay. A middle ground. Yeah. Pull out the middle ground. You know, if Yoni's on one side, Cassante's on the other, Jax is somewhere in between. Yep. Um, Does like to do fighting, even though he doesn't have a real weapon. Yeah. So I'm okay with this, and should still be a difficult time for Rascal there towards the top side of the map, but if they do manage to get a top side lead, then that is something that they can play through. Of course, Jax has been known to be able to take uh, games in under their control uh, in the past, and you can also team fight relatively effectively on the champion as well. So, relatively well rounded, not a massive amount of range, but they do have the Aphelios there. And if Calibrum is armed, then you can certainly uh, do some pretty devastating damage from a long way away. And Pleder on the Melio, we actually saw it was Kellen yesterday, even though they weren't able to win the series. His Melio was absolutely incredible. And Pleder, I think, has been the silent achiever on DRX. I think he's been absolutely fantastic. So, if, like you say, that bottom lane can go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, that's a win condition as well. So, some opportunities here for DRX, um, but it is still, you know, T1 with a mid-game composition that should be able to just roll over the top, right? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the main thing is whether they're going to storm early, if DRX can not fall behind too far, they have a chance, but 
Definitely going to be a big battle. The bot lane is really where I think you need to have an edge over this Lucian. You can't let him take over the game or it's just going to be boom. Absolutely right. Uh, T1 also just in the lanes should have a relative amount of control. And we'll see where the sponge can get around and really change that one up. But ladies and gentlemen, it is time to jump onto the rift for game number one. DRX fans, full voices yep. here in Low Park today. T1, of course, tend to drown everyone else out. But still, you can see relatively even when it comes to the volume. That is great to hear. As Owner and Sponge, very close by, as we have a five point defense system. An oldie, but a goodie. Sponge actually going a little bit deeper. Cheeky ward. Yeah, like that, like that. Get that information early. Make sure you don't get owner shown up where you don't expect him. Um, you know, I think this is a good opportunity to talk a little bit about Azir. Please do. I feel like one big thing um, is that we're seeing a lot of tank junglers. Like, a lot. Vi is kind of like the exception where... She's a bruiser who's... She's actually like a tank just pretending to be a bruiser in terms of what she offers. Yeah. But she at least has more damage. I feel like the problem is when you have like a Rao and an Azir, in the mid jungle 2v2, if you shuffle like Faker, you just don't quite have enough damage to burst him down, you know? Yeah, who and kills him? Exactly. And if Owner and Faker opt into that 2v2 and you get violated in your shockwave, you're just you're just going to go down if you're, if you're Satab. So... One thing that Azir has struggled with, though, is dealing with the Rookerns. And there aren't very many champions that will build a Rookern in, uh, in T1's composition, right? So that might be something that he can mitigate. True, true. I <laughs> Where's the Frozen Heart coming from, you know? Uh, yeah, actually, that's a valid point. Probably not going to see a Frozen Heart anytime early. Like, Owner's probably going to go... Uh, it might be third item as Gumiyoshi is going to be exhausted here. Very early on, hits the level two and just dives on top of Teddy and Pleta. Yeah, Exhaust taken by Teddy, it is interesting. Yeah, interesting, because normally we get the barrier heal combo just to try and mitigate the burst. Going for the Exhaust here instead. Uh, Does mean that if he dashes forward and presses culling, then you can mitigate a lot of culling damage. I feel like Exhaust is relatively valuable there. Yeah, I also think that one big thing is that for a big reason why we saw Exhaust not being taken for a while with Lucian is because Lucians would run Cleanse and they would just cleanse it and then yeah. you didn't have the option to do anything. But obviously, Gumiishi has gone the Ignite, so still a big ability to just mitigate that damage. I'll we'll see how it does work out as this game continues. That's Rascal. Doing pretty well. Yeah, pulling out the uh, ranged minions before he does decide to head home. Does get himself a nice little back timing there. Double crash of the wave. I'm pretty sure. I think some of the range minions may not necessarily get there, but still, good time to go back home and does collect a cull. So, investment banking early on here for Rascal. Teddy, with the help of Pleta, able to uh, land a really nice trade there onto Gumiyoshi. Yeah. I mean, we're only three minutes in, but this is a good start for DRX. Yeah, I would say so. And we're going to stay positive as... Oh, that was... Okay, cut the video. As we can see, in. low health bars everywhere. Satab almost just solo killed here by Faker, who needs nine kills for 3,000. Um, there is a Shattering Strike. Crash down. But a bit of a crash in the jungle just in general there from Sponge, unfortunately. Owner is going to be able to achieve full control. Should be able to grab a couple of scuttles here as well off the back end after both junglers have completed their full clears. I think I just spoke a bit too soon, you know? Say yeah, that. it was, I mean, I didn't want to say cast a curse or anything like that because you are the silver linings guy. Yeah. Or at least the bronze copper linings. Copper lining. Yeah. Well, the copper lining is they didn't actually die there. So There we go. Didn't flash either. Yeah, exactly. You know, Beautiful. I would go as far as to say that's a silver lining. You yeah. know, I think All right. up, up, up to tier, I think that is a full silver lining. Well, there, there Also, you know, there isn't any Rift Scuttlers to take, but still only a camp behind is Sponge. And he will be able to find some of these angles as this game goes on. Zayas finds an Infernal Chain, cut the video, and Gumiyushi taking a bit of damage here. Good fire kick, and actually Teddy going forward. A couple more autos and he's dead, and that's first blood for the bottom lane of TRX. I'm, that's that's not even silver lining. That's that is just great. Yeah, fantastic. Teddy and Pleta winning out the 2v2, and this is one of the weaknesses of Lucian Nami in the early levels. 
you don't have the burst to 100 to zero, and once your cooldowns are gone, you're kind of just you're kind of just auto attacking a solution, which never feels that good. So Teddy and Pleda managed to just match um, up to them. Pleda gonna get bubbled, and no why dies? There's no. I'm just gonna Surely keep saying not. it. Carrier no does have flash, but doesn't have enough mana for ebb and flow. If he could have just flash W'd himself, then it could have just been a dead sweater. But didn't want to go too far, as of course Teddy was up and available. And Sponge going to be able to take one of these uh, Void Grubs. Only going to deal with the remaining two by the looks of things. Wants to push him out, but you can see Satap, he's going back, doesn't have Teleport. Faker's still here. So that does mean that this is very dangerous for Sponge. Yeah. That's I will one say Grub a piece. A bit a piece. Kevin Steve just both taken away. Bob yeah, just by himself. The big thing with getting the first Void Grub is that... Oh, okay. a minute. Rascal gets a flash out of Zayas here on this top side. Oh, no. And owner is back again. Uh, that is going to be a secure. Very nicely done there by Sponge. Collects two of them. But yes, what's good about taking yeah. the first one? So the big thing, you know how with jungle items you get extra XP for every camp you take? Like the, the big monster gives you like 80 extra XP roughly, right? Yep. Um, we'll watch this replay first and I'll get into that. But yeah, so Gumiyushi's low on mana, uses his combo, and then there's just nothing left in the tank here and he's stuck up close. You can see he's trying to get to the wall to flash away. Doesn't get it in time, just beautifully disengaged, but... Oh, uh, Satab is, that's not the lane, that's the river. Um, Faker is gonna get shuffled actually, delivered to Sponge. Flash has to come through, but Sponge is immediately flashing after him. Faker could die as well. It's a decent shockwave, but it ain't gonna save him. And Satab moves DRX to 2 0. What a start, honestly. And they're able to find the 2v2. Faker just a bit overconfident there. You know, I was talking about would they have the damage? It looks like they, they had enough. They had enough damage in that situation. Took a bit, but they finished him off. Man, that was. This is the. This is not a DRX that uh, we just witnessed lose a game to Bro. Oh, you know that was that was a difficult series to watch. Uh, and, you know we and, joked about it. Yeah. Lured them into a false sense of security. T1 confident. Oh, you know we're three and one. They're one and three. But DRX have started off really well. And this, you know, I didn't want to say it right because this is a very different story to what we saw yesterday. D plus versus Guangdong Freaks. It was D plus that was playing more of these mid range compositions. Um, Mid-game compositions, around Lucian, things like that, and it didn't work out for them. There were a lot more whoopsies that I don't expect T1 to make, um, but maybe we do need to have that conversation about the fact that DRX does have a lot more longevity to this composition, and if T1 don't start that snowball or rolling, things could become difficult. Rascal coming forward as Sponge is here again. Remember, no flash on Zeus. No Umbral Dash either, as there is the Magnet Storm. They didn't even want to invest it, as the Leap Strike comes in and the Flash has to be oh. used, but Rascal is able to lock down the kill. That was almost a flub, but they nailed it in the end. Yeah, so well played actually at the end. You know, Rascal goes in for the finishing blow and Sponge just tanks the tower, makes sure he's the one with aggro. There's still a CS lead for Zeus in this matchup, but really nice gang coming out from Sponge. He's been doing a solid job so far. Man wasn't on my bingo card. There's a lot of things that haven't been on my bingo card over the last couple of days. This is certainly one of them. As owner is going to lock down the first Drake of the game. And it's only 300 gold, right? But when DRX are winning like this, after the woes that they have had here in the LCK, this is not the 2-0 uh, winning streak that I was expecting for this squad. Yeah, and it was just a really nice uh, shuffle there from Satap. Timed it for when Faker threw the ball out to make sure there wasn't really any recourse immediately and then have the follow-up. And we see here Rascal just getting out of the tether distance in time to follow up here. Oh, yep. Um, Ona is going to go a bit aggressive onto Pleta, but Teddy might have been his target. Now Kerry is going to come on over. Teddy is in so much trouble. There he goes. Faker moving in as well. Flash out from Pleta. Faker moving real quickly thanks to the Aqua Prison. More like freedom here as T1 will be able to take down Teddy, the prime target here on DRX, and now move towards more plates. And I'm really glad that we got to have that moment <laughs> where we were talking about DRX and doing some winning around the map. Like, it's, it's those moments that we really do need to cherish because now T1 moved towards a 500 gold lead. They have a lot of control towards the bottom side around that turret. And the more they're able to open up this map, the more they will be able to get that snowball moving as we see how this all occurred. Yeah, Teddy's just kind of completely overstepping there. I mean, an important thing is they don't have the level 6 from the Milio to get them out of the Aqua Prison. Now they're super low, and Owner actually kind of baits this here, so goes in initially, and then he kind of backs away like, oh, I don't want this, waiting for the backup from Carrier, and Carrier gives him the boost, gives him the extra damage just to make sure he gets the quick kill. 
And then a nice flash on Plat at the end. Reads that one from Ono well, but... Stop play from T1. You know, the game looked like... I won't say it was getting out of the hands, but definitely had a really strong start from DRX, and they have made that answer back. Yeah, and uh, I don't want to take anything away from DRX and their ability to find a few picks in this early stage. Um, but they're going to need more than that if they want to actually win this, especially now that things have become a little bit more uphill. Uh, Sponge coming on over, though, and if they can lock down five grubs, that is certainly good news. Ona moving on in here, though, oh, no. and Zayas in position at the same time. Cheeky little smite to deny the mites. And that is enough. T1 is going to back away, allow four to go over to DRX. Yep. I mean, the big thing is they deny the fifth, they deny, uh, deny the little void bub spawning. Yep. Uh, but also, the way it works, so as I was saying before, the jungle item gives bonus XP when you clear a camp, but you only get that on void bubs for the first one you kill. Aha! Uh -huh. So, Ona, he's only gotten two void bubs, but he actually gets quite a lot of XP from that. So, it, it, it is pretty significant. Uh, the the other the remaining two aren't worth as much investment, and it's the first one that each jungler gets. It's not like just the first one. So you know, if Ona gets the first one and Sponge gets the second, they both get the bonus XP. Yeah, and so that's why we often see junglers moving in, taking one grub, and then continuing their clear from that point on to try and get towards that level six as soon as possible. Things like that in the early stages of the game. Very cool. And DRX. Yeah, it's not it's not over, right? But we can see even though Zayas went down towards the top side, he still has a 20 CS advantage. Uh, Rascal had been trying to move over to help out his mid lane. Will ignore the fact that he just missed a cannon. Might be able to get himself a plate here, but ooh, yes, there it is. Thankfully, void bub damage going to come through. And it's just it's for me it's a little bit sad, right? Because I felt like DRX were doing everything right in the early stages of the game, but it feels like that it's still falling out of their hands as it goes yeah. on. It's still it's still an okay game state now, but the mid game is really where a lot of factors come online. Like Carrier now has the Imperial Mandate. The one item spike for the Lucian Army is really powerful. Not as much as it used to be when you had the Gale Force, but uh Mandate for the Nami definitely a big factor, so DRX, if they make a mistake, the burst available from this bot lane will punish them pretty heavily. Oh, yeah. Say tab in this brush as well as Faker moving on over. We're only going to have to get out of there. As you saw Sponge had moved into position. Giving Yushi dashing forward once again. Pleta taking a bit of damage, but otherwise not too worried. You can see a bit more timidness here for DRX as this game moves towards the mid game. Yeah, we have a minute and a bit on these plates. 30 seconds on this next dragon, though, and it feels like both teams are kind of jockeying for position over the river, trying to get control. Oh, no, Saytab. Yeah, that's a shockwave, and that is an immediate cease and desist. Saytab able to get out of there, though. Doesn't have teleport, and now doesn't have flash. So this Drake should go over to T1. He may not be able to get back in time, and definitely not back into position to try and fight for it. But Derek, you have control of the bot side. Oh, Ona was there. thinking about it, but good work not being in the shot by Saytab. Yeah, we see T1 move bot just to answer the wave, and now kind of feel comfortable to set up for this dragon. Saytab, they stalled out the recall. He's not going to be back in time, so likely just see DRX give this one up. Yep. And so that is going to be two dragons. We'll see what soul it's going to be. It's T1, it's often clouds. They, they do have my back there. And Faker is on defense. That's a flash magnet storm. Teddy gonna flash out of the way of the tidal wave. Faker should go down. But they do secure the dragon. And the soul will be Hextech, actually. A lot of power if they are able to lock down the soul as DRX. They do get the kill. They get Teddy's flash on the side of T1, though. So follow ups could be dangerous here for T1. And they know that. Looking for Pletter as Arden Blade is going to fly out of the brush. And now Moonlight Vigil comes in. Gumiushi could be punished yet again. Red White Guns here for Teddy as Pletter is going to tank up the culling, but still, T1 able to offer enough back to deter the aggression. Yeah, a lot committed there, though, and Teddy and Pletter holding the goom. That is a scary Aphelios right now. He is. Got to be really careful about that. TP actually coming in here from Zeus, going for the bot lane play. They really don't want Teddy to do any... Wow, that's a jump scare if ever I've seen one. But Teddy, yeah. not going to be too frightened. Just able to walk his way out. That's a flash. Um, Infernal Chains. Not sure about that one. Not sold on that. Uh, and one of the things I was going to say was, like, the Dragon, DRX, only got that one kill. They committed the teleport to make it happen. But Zayas teleport there, not the best. It will secure them that bot lane tower, which is something. But it kind of feels like... T1 were looking for a bit more out of that play and didn't really get rewarded with it. Yeah. Sponge now 
wants to see whether his blue buff will come back, and it will. Should have Shattering Strike. Doesn't it always have find the way home. Smite, but yes, does manage to find his way home. This might be able to take that one down. Nicely done. Is Ace just continuing to jungle now? Um, wondering uh, what is next here. Does have the Lethality Hydra. Let's see that replay here. I guess they just didn't have clear window on what the hell the Dragon was. So they commit for the kill on the Faker, which is great. But Rascal being the TP here doesn't really amount to much, unfortunately. And now, with it being a Hexax Hole, with T1 already having a two Dragon lead, DRX in terms of gold aren't really behind. They're kind of okay. But they're going to need to win this next Dragon fight. They're going to need to put a stop to the Dragon stacking. And Sponge is looking to put a stop to Zayas here, who doesn't have Flash. Remember, Magnus Storm comes down, Emperor's Divide, and he's just going to be swept under the rug. Sponge will take a few too many turret shots, but he isn't going to die for it. Now Rascal is chasing after Faker. Shockwave comes in, but doesn't exactly do what he wants. Still slowed down by the dissonance. Rascal will be deterred as Faker gets into that pixel brush. And now, oh, Moonlight Vigil avoided. That was really cute. Kleta still diving in, and that is not really the direction he wants to go. Satab wanting to get over. Isn't going to be able to. Good dive here by T1, keeping up that aggression as much as possible. But Rascal's coming in. This is fight after fight after fight here in this mid game. Rascal not quite finding it. Sponge a little bit late to the party. But not able to punish T1 for the dive. Yeah, some non stop aggression there. And T1 managed to find the dive. It looked a little bit dicey at points, but the Culling doing a lot of work just to finish out better. Uh, and. I mean, one advantage is you do burn the flash from the Milio, which can be punished later. We see here, I mean, the thing is Zayas doesn't have ult, doesn't have flash. Not in an ideal situation for this. And he just doesn't really get to do much. Yeah. So. Did hit the Infernal Chain, which meant that Sponge took an extra turret shot. Uh, but still, not exactly too impactful as Ona gets out of the way of the Moonlight Vigil. Yeah, I don't even... It, huge. it seems strange, the movement that he went for. Um, and did manage to avoid it just perfectly. And Plenty's play was a little bit odd. I yeah, I didn't he, understand it either. I think he was trying to get like the guaranteed Q to interrupt the culling, but he, he I think he hit a minion instead, and he sent a face tank in it. It's not the best play, uh, but you can also see how, you know, this is one of the issues with that Vi. Milio has so much peel, but if the Vi presses are, you can kind of just at the whim to it. Yeah. But keeping up the aggression, Keeping up the tempo, RT1 trying to get to a larger gold advantage. Right now it's really not even evident as Sponge is going to park the Rift Herald probably you know, into this turret. There we go. Look at that. Look at that driving. We've seen definitely some flubs with the Herald driving. Yeah, Lucid is taking notes right now, dude. Yeah. 100%. That's going to be on the test later. And you know, for anyone who's keeping count, so we said before the game started that Faker needed nine kills yeah. to get 3,000. So far, he has gotten zero of those nine, so still nine to go. Nine to go, yes. Good. Yeah. I'm glad that we're keeping tabs. Yeah. Um, no change. Uh, Sponge going to be able to take away a Raptor here. Baker still scaling, of course, as this Orianna will start to do more and more damage as more items come in. Only on one at the minute. And we're clearing our vision. We have the next Drake in 10 seconds' time. That's why we see everyone congregating. Rascal and Zayas, both with Teleport. Rascal has his Flash, though. Flash Counter-Strikes can be devastating in these teamfights. And DRX are getting closer and closer to teamfight ready. T1, well and truly there. They want to be starting fights as often as possible. DRX, couple of items here and there. And they're going to be feeling so much better about it. Teddy does have his Blood Song complete, as well as his Storm Razor. It's a happy Aphelios. 2, 1, and 0. He's down on farm. Still probably pretty happy about how the situation is going. His owner is oh. spotted on vision. DRX immediately back away him. towards him. Yeah, Rascal is actually going to... Ooh, like ships in the night. They do uh, go past each other. But there is a flash counter-strike. And owner, he's uh, going the wrong direction. Gravitum is going to be picked up by Teddy. And that means that there is no way out. Somehow, the kill goes to Pleta. But that is fine. There is no jungler. This might be a dragon opportunity for DRX. Yeah, big mistake there, Ona. I mean, it was a really good read from the side of DRX, spotting him out with the blue trinket, uh, and just collapsing down, and Rascal, perfect timing, coming from the base to answer that. Ooh, Zaytab's positioning a little bit scary here, but you can see his posturing, trying to find an opportunity for that Emperor's Divide. Teddy gets vision down, spots T1, and still standing his ground here. I don't know uh, about it. Damage. Yeah, uh, does have Pleta there in his back pocket. Yumiushi able to offer a lot back. So, 
without Smite. They do have Teleport, and T1 is still wanting to fight for this one. That's a flash over the Tidal Wave. Shockwave comes through, though, and that's a great double bubble. Zayus able to take down Satap here as the Dragon is still amongst it. It's a double kill for Zayus, who is just a wrecking ball. And they were a man down, but T1 is still making it work. Make that a triple. Oh, no. It's a catastrophe for DRX. It's all falling apart, and... Honestly, it felt like they tried to go for the engage, they tried to go for the turn, they couldn't quite connect onto the right targets, and this Aatrox just kind of slid into the back line and demolished DRX, and now T1 should be able to secure this Dragon. I think DRX need to rush straight, they should be able to secure the Baron, and DRX need to rush to the Dragon. If they lose Baron and Dragon here, it's going to really be rough. Yeah, and you can see Faker teleported to the bottom lane. Uh, he knows that this, uh, this Baron is well and truly T1's now we're going to be able to take it down. Of course, it is on spawn, so it takes a while to kill it. Faker, not quite aware of what's going on here. Will be able to put the ball in if he wants to, but gets the bad news. The Baron is going to be going down. Has to use his flash to avoid that Emperor's Divide. The Sand Soldier starting to get aggressive. There is still a turret here, and Faker has dissonance, so he should be able to get himself out. But Baron for Dragon will be the trade here, and T1 can now fully take control of these waves. Let's have a look at it one more time. Yeah, I just think one of the problems is Teddy is very split right now. And then Sponge telegraphs to engage uh, quite significantly. You know, he just starts walking at T1. He's slowed already. Does flash to dodge the tidal wave, and they get a lot onto Faker here. But he actually is able to peel them off a beautiful bubble from Kerry. And meanwhile, we just have this Aatrox in the back line. He just starts massacring people. Yeah. He's the uh, good old lethality Aatrox that... If he does get onto the squishies, just does way too much damage. It uh, feels unfair. And now, it's only going to get worse. He has Edge of Night, another Brutalizer. And it's it's feeling good to, to be Zayus at this point in time. Still, to check in on the Faker kill count, um, still needs nine. Yeah, yeah. Still a lot of work to be done. Um, still at 2,991. Yeah. But there's still opportunity. Now he's he's pretty strong. Maybe he can find a window. Has gone for the Zonyas though. Uh, is the build path he's going towards. So not wanting to get blown up by DRX. Ooh. And DRX, everyone going to gather themselves a blue buff. Good work there by Spun. It's the little victories. That's you copper really lining. Have to focus on. Yep, copper lining. It is. It is. It's it's rusting. I think the linings here as DRX move further and further behind. About four thousand gold now. The lead for T1. And their Baron power plays have often been relatively good. Um, this is also, you know, hearkening back to some of the earlier days of this exact T1 roster, where if Baron is on the map, they are killing it. Um, you don't need wards on Baron because T1 will be there if it has spawned. You can just assume. Yes. You know, if you haven't seen the entire team for the past like four seconds, yep, you know where they are. Or yeah, or two members of said team for four seconds. That's where they are. Yeah. Going to now take down the Krugs and now move towards this inner turret. You can see the Baron power play. A modest 2.2k. T1 still wanted to augment that further with the remaining 30 to 4 so seconds. Teddy does have an Infinity Edge now completed. So three items, theoretically pseudo three items. We include the Blood Song. You know, and as much as he, as much as T1 have gotten like a 4,000 gold lead here, which obviously isn't great, they haven't taken any tier two structures yet. They didn't get that third dragon, so DRX hold on okay. Ooh, tidal wave coming in here as Sponge does get knocked up. Great shockwave onto Satab, who's trying to get himself out of there. Ona also using the ult relatively defensively. They take down the turret, but they're unable to kill any of the members of T1. Oh, man. Rascal in the mid lane should be able to get something back here as he secures a turret of his own. And now immediately teleports in to try and lock down this bottom lane. They get vision of Gumiushi Carrier trying to run away, and Teddy is looking to try and catch up. But Rascal now finds himself singled out. He has the Counter-Strike running, but now Owner is going to turn up. These Hex Gates really working out here as they change position kind of uh, comedically. And Rascal looking to try and get himself out of there. He does so, but I don't know whether the teleport play really worked, and now he's backing on a ward and will actually get away. It's fine. This game got very chaotic very quickly. Yeah, um, that was that was odd. Okay, let's have a look at the replay, though. Take us through it, Ox. Yeah, so the ult connects on the Satab, the culling, the Shockwave, a lot of damage. It's actually some decent peel on Owen to stop him connecting on the Satab. 
But unfortunately, the tower goes down, and DRX are in full retreat mode at this point. Uh, and they just end up losing their jungler and the tower. It's not great, but definitely could have been worse. Are we scaling, though, on DRX? Are um, we scaling? Is that what, is that what the, the game plan is now? Yes. We will say that's the game plan. <laughs> I, I'm trying my best here. Yeah, I don't think they're they're not really in a position where it's like, okay, we hit this point and we win. It's kind of like, we hit this point and maybe it will be easier to win, hopefully. Well, Saytab is looking to hit this point, trying to find... Uh, well, he does set up a Sun Disc. He gets Acro Prison, though. His carrier is a long way away from the rest of his teammates. Yeah. He's going to speed himself up, though. Do you have a name for that, where you, like, shuffle behind someone and just put a turret down? I don't think that's that's been established yet. I think that's the Sharima construction. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, yeah. Not sure about that. Not S sure about the, the, you know, the residential market in Sharima at the moment is uh, struggling a little bit. You yeah. had a look at the Shariman times. I think part of the problem is that they're structuring these buildings on sand, you know? Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that, safe. heard of that issue before. Is okay, season assist onto Teddy into that back lane. He flashes, he does manage to get the ult, but the shockwave is too strong. As Faker, eight kills to go now. Zayas able to take down a double in the back line as well. Sponge going to be taken away also, and DRX, they're left with only Rascal. And uh, T1 are still chasing after them. It should be sole point here for T1. They might also be able to focus on some of these extra turrets to really start putting the nails in. Rascal also just uh, going to get pulled back by those infernal chains, avoids the bubble. Not going to be able to stand toe to toe, and that is just four for free. Yep, yep, that was a pretty one sided fight, and we're kind of seeing part of the issue with letting this Vi go open. I want to do this neat trick where what you do is you target the enemy AD carry, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you press R. Oh. Very effective, very strong strategy. Um, that was what he did. Yeah, not too much you can do in response. Teddy really just you're kind of locked in there, and we'll see the replay. And I feel like I kind of already just explained it. It's like, okay, dash in, press R on the Aphelios. He gets hit by, like, everything. They just survive longer than maybe you'd initially think. Oh, the teleport from Faker as well for the Shockwave position as Carrier has to flash. Oh, bubble avoided there by Sponge, but now he's in trouble, taking a lot of damage from Gumiyushi. That is the second one here for Faker. As Rascal is getting engaged on here, Zayas, every auto really hurting. Cyrilda's in his back pocket as well. And that is the global red buff secured by T1. Baron back on the table as well. There's a lot of control vision in this area for DRX, but without their jungler, I don't know what they're going to be able to do to try and contest this. Still wanting to, by the looks of things, is Teddy, red, white guns, oh, ready to fight. Teddy. But, uh, oh, dearie me, he is just going to die. Exhaust was able to be pressed onto uh, Gumushi there, but he's still able to kill Teddy. So without jungler or oh, AD carry. Rascal? Ah, uh, Rascal going for it. Gumiushi is somewhat low. The Baron is also somewhat low. I feel like Rascal is kind of just doing his, whole, his own thing this entire game. He's, he's out of there, though. Look at him. He's buying time. Teleporting. Develop the bubble. Dead. Um, it was a cute play. It was a cute plan. Gumiushi able to dash himself out of the way. Good shockwave here from Faker. As Sponge crashes down on top of him, but Faker's got the arm guard and he'll keep himself alive. The fire kick, not really something you're too scared about. And now Zayas is underneath turrets, not too worried about much at all. Wants to find a third Q, there it is. And Pleter is just wondering where the heck damage is. He wants to go back to being an AD carry, I think. But Umbral Dash over the base gate and Zayas is out of there. Uh, and now T1 are just going to rain hell down on the rest of DRX. Oh, Pleather is... Leave him alone! Oh, it's so cruel, isn't it? That's another kill. There's the ace, and T1 will now just destroy these Nexus turrets and take us to a game number two. But one thing I do want to take away from this is the fact that DRX looked relatively competitive in the early stages until they absolutely did. It was going so well until it stopped going yeah, Going well, well yeah. Um, you know, that happens sometimes. I think the main thing is you kind of saw the lanes were competitive competitive from DRX, but it felt like the team fight set up, yeah. they weren't quite there. The confidence T1 has for starting these fights, I think the Vi are a really powerful tool in owner's hands for just kicking plays off. That bot lane play underneath the outer turret, that was it. From that point on, it felt like they were just enough ahead to be able to win every subsequent fight. Yeah, and I just feel like, I feel like they should have denied the Vi, you know, I think it's such, when you yeah. have an AD carry who's representing such a large portion of your damage share Vi is such an effective pick to just not let Teddy play the game, and that's kind of what we saw. Yeah. Uh, on the other side, though, uh, Gumiushi actually does the third highest damage 
uh, on his team. Uh, in comparison to Faker and Zayas, one of the uh, few teams where a mid laner does do the majority, but with Corky uh, rolling around, I assume that that is going to change somewhat. And so now, Faker with 2,993 kills, still looking for seven, moving into the next game. Some progress made. May only have one in order to get it done, but he will, be honest. if it is only one more game, He'll get to 600 wins. And I'm going to be honest, I feel like Zayas was kind of sniping. A lot yeah. Of kind of yoinking them. It was Fair. a bit cruel, wasn't it? Uh, he moved up to a very large number uh, of kills in this particular game, but we're going to have to move to a short break. When we come back, the space will break down that game. We'll have game number two. We'll see you there. ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっと。ちょっ
Hostile takeover available, finds a couple with it, and there is the kill for the Corky. Whirling death is to celebrate, but on the way back, it collects the Azir. Thank you so much for the leashes. Sylvie's down for the double in the meantime. Maybe she's probably pretty mad about what happened in the last game. This time around, seven, one, and three on this game. And over to Odona, step first presence gets a fair bit of value, and package delivered! <laughs> FedEx from Baker into the back line, absolutely obliterating them. That Baron was all a cunning ruse, and how many aces do you need? Especially for a competition like DRX that, okay, so close Wants to find Tate Tab, and that's it. That's just a solo kill. Uh, Spun comes on over with a celebratory ultimate, but he might just be food for the Akali as well. And welcome to the space. We are here after game number one of T1 versus DRX. I am Valdez. With me today is Wolf and Chronicler on the space, and uh, they are looking quite fine. And uh, we are going to talk about this game number one that we have between T1 and DRX. You'll get to see them eventually, I, I promise. Um, so, guys, what did you guys think about that draft? How did that go for you guys? I, I need a moment. Wolf, you take this. I'm, I'm blushing. There they are. Brendan Valdez we, complimenting we us. We look fine, yes. Thank you, Valdez, um, especially Chronicler. But, yeah, let's talk about the draft because we saw the Azir coming through right into the Oriana. The Oriana was, was put in face up here. And we're not big fans of the pick right now. I feel like you could either have gone for, if you want to put some, uh, you know, engage pressure on, be a lane bully, something like a Syndra. Or if you want like more stable damage, you could have done something crazy and gone like Victor or Rise. That's how that's how I'm feeling about the Azir pick right now. Um, and then and then following things up with the uh, Rel here is fine. And they went in for the Jax, and you're just gonna have a tough time, obviously against Zayas. If you want to get a lead with that Jax, maybe this isn't the matchup you want to play it into. The player yeah. matchup. Yeah, and I kind of want to echo what Ox was saying, but also think that it is really hard because if they deny Defy, then owner plays Rel, and then as a result. Uh, Teddy doesn't get to play the game, but if they don't ban Nocturne, but ban Vi instead, then like you see the problem, right? I think that in general, T1 with these style of compositions are just so much better at any mid game fight and skirmish. And we even saw that in this game. I think that I I didn't like the Azir, but it wasn't even that big of a problem. Satip actually did way better in laning than BDD, for example. We still have a really tough time, but at the same time. It didn't feel like it mattered at all that the early game was actually pretty good from the RX. Yeah, I mean, the early game was actually quite nice, and it was good to see them actually make some stuff happen. We can take a look at the first highlight that we have prepared, and this is basically just a highlight reel of DRX kills. Some questionable moments from the T1 players maybe taking it a bit easy early on, but DRX immediately punished, and you got to give them credit for that. Exactly, and for DRX, these type of signs of life, I think, are still a really big upgrade over what we've seen of them in the past, and they need to maintain that. Uh, and we also see, as T1 have mentioned, that they are definitely playing it very fast and loose. Yeah, I mean, a lot of limit testing at Valley like here for T1, a large amount of 
disrespect, I would say, in some of these moments here that DRX are able to punish on. But they're they're so desperate to find these moments. And I think this kind of proactivity we have to champion here for DRX because some of our east side teams are just simply rolling over in the laning phase. And they had a tough laning phase, right? So you have a CS deficit in several lanes. You're massively behind in gold. So if you don't get these kills, you go into the mid game with a terrible, terrible deficit. Even still, though, because of that laning diff, because of that CS difference, we'll take a look at it here. You didn't have an advantage despite being up on kills. Yeah, this is what they're down like three, four kills at 14 minutes, right? And and this is, I think, what makes T1 so hard to deal with is that even if you get a kill left or right, the way that they manage their wave states, how consistent they are in CSing, uh, makes it so hard. And 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 as mentioned, owner still gets two void corrupts. You deny the five or six. You get double dragon early on with composition that obviously skills really well, at least on the top half of the map. And it felt like DRX were doing well, and then you look at the scoreboard and you're like, it, it didn't matter at all. But they got four, uh, four Void Grubs, so that's... That's nothing, yeah. Good, yeah. Um, didn't uh, end up doing anything for them. We can take a look at the second highlight as well, which is basically the 20-minute Dragon fight. This is where, you know, we were expecting this to eventually happen. Actually, it took quite a while for T1 to have this team fight where DRX just slightly overextending, and T1 took the advantage. Zayas actually plays this really well. He comes up with a teleport flank, and they overextended trying to kill Faker, and then Zayas is able to flash in and then blast Cone back in for the second kill there as well. Ends up with a triple, and he's just a lethality Aatrox. If you push too far your front line to try to chase Faker there, your back line is exposed to a teleport flank like that, and he played it extremely well. And we also see there that the Willingness of DRX, Sponge going in that aggressively on only Fake or with Rel. In a skirmish, that's okay. If it's a straight up 5v5, as well, you gotta be looking for a little bit more. And these type of moments were really what we were expecting. And then Teddy doesn't have anyone defending him. There isn't really a straight up front to back. And then obviously T1 is gonna run away with it. Yeah, T1 eventually run away with this game. And, you know, DRX, it was nice to see, pro see some proactivity, some nice plays from them. I believe we should have the POG ready to go, and we can check on who on the side of T1 did pick up the POG. And let's take a look at that. Now it is Zeus on his Aatrox. Yeah, I'm not surprised to see this. Uh, Chronicler and I both went the Zeus route, uh, but you could have gone for a jungle vote here. I think good game from owner, also Karia, pretty consistent, but, you know, Zayas did have his hiccups in this game, but ultimately this is the back-breaking, game-winning play here. And uh, that's why I gave him credit and gave him POG. And it's not only the fact that obviously made a big mistake in laning phase, then overextended once, got caught, uh, and then outside of that got seven straight kills. But it also, to me, is really meaningful that Zayas is seemingly the only player that consistently can not only blind Aatrox, buying his team a lot of space in draft, but also then, even with him getting ganked, he was up like 15 to 20 CS and have an immense impact while getting counterpicked in the matchup. Yeah, maybe they should have played Yone. Oh, that's I love, what, I that's love what carry out votes. Oh, it's good to see it. I, I also respect the owner vote as well. I, I think owner had a great game. Yeah, uh, those are the three uh, guys you guys were talking about for POG, so it kind of makes sense that they do end up picking up the votes there. Six out of 12 does go the way of Zeus, and uh, yeah, who's going to who's gonna challenge this guy? Who's going to be the one to pick the Yone into his Aatrox? Who's going to be the person who can do it? Keen, and that's maybe Doran yeah, on a good day. Yeah, not not in not, not in the last day that we saw. Not Rascal, I think. Not in this series. I, I'm afraid. Probably not. Yeah, not in this one. But guys, we do have DRX moving over to the blue side here for uh, game number two. Uh, is that going to change anything in terms of this? Do you think they're going to blind pick the Azir this I, time instead? <laughs> I hope not. I'd rather see them pick up the uh, Orianna themselves or maybe even try to go for Nico and try to go all in on some sort of engage composition, try to punish some of these T1 overextensions, look for that early lead and try to snowball the game. If you're just going Azir again here, why'd you pick blue? So what are you doing? The one advantage you might have over T1 is that I think they, play, they draft very predictably because they don't need to do anything else, right? So if you leave Corky open, they will pick Corky first rotation, and then maybe you can go for a comp that tries to snowball early. We've talked about some of the counter poke champs, Nocturne and Nico come to mind, also pick them away from T1, maybe something like that. Will that actually be enough given the gap between these two teams? Probably not, but that's like the one angle I think that you have over T1. Like they're just going to draft 100% standard stuff. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in game number two. Let's go back to the casters right now. Thank you very much, everyone, um, for the breakdown there of game number one. T1 rolling away with it, uh, but DRX having a decent start. Uh, as we know, DRX fans looking a little bit uh, subdued, I guess you could say, uh, after that initial victory here for T1, but still.
Game two is a brand new game, Ox. Yep, and hopefully they get a chance to adapt from that game one. Again, like, the laning phase went pretty good. I just think it's so clear that team play from T1 is on another level. So when it comes to those CMCs, those team fights, that is really where T1 just dominate. But up until that point, DRX can hold on. So I think just ensuring you have a composition that can easily transition to those points is important. And also when you know your reliance on Teddy, giving him the best conditions possible to be able to carry because playing the Aphelios into Vi, not a good time. No, I would agree. Uh, I think they can keep the Ash Varus bands uh, and then look for a first pick Corky. That's what I would say on the side of DRX. Um, like they mentioned uh, on the space, yeah, uh, if it ain't broke, kind of don't fix it. It is still going to be uh, Derek stealing a ban here from T1 as the Kalista will be taken away. Not wanting to see that one picked up alongside something like a Renata in the first rotation for T1. Lucian denied as well. Senna and Corky, sort of the big ones for me. Um, we've seen Senna find a lot of success here in the LCK and uh, Corky's broken, like just completely busted. Um, yeah. should always be banned forever. Yep, I agree. I feel like if you just get to a certain point with the Corky, it's so hard to lose unless you really, really play. Yeah, really try, yeah. Like, like, <laughs> like Zek and Maev. Um, Orion actually going to be banned from DRX, so still going to see that Varus and that Senna and that Corky all available. You know, DRX obviously have first pick. They get first choice in those, but a lot of power picks open and available for T1 to choose from. Corky. I would just ban Corky and then take one of the really powerful things uh, so that you will be able to get. That is, that is something you can do. We'll see. I do feel like that we often... Whoa! Okay, so they're banning away the Nord, so we're not going to see like the center Nautilus, but there's still a lot of options. I do think one of the things is that I don't think T1 are too afraid of the Corky, simply because as a team, they're definitely confident at driving the pace forward, you know? I think teams who go at a slower pace, or if it's an equal match, Corky can be really problematic. But I think T1 are confident they can just push the game pace forwards and not worry about Corky hitting that major scaling point. They are going to pick up the center themselves. We'll give them a fair bit of sustain. You can play center Seraphine and sort of hope to sustain, but you're not going to do that against 3 Adam Corky if Satav actually gets to that point. And this is what you were talking about. Just go for the engage. Yep. Uh, Ona going to be locking away the Nico, most likely for Faker. Of course, Faker, one of our premier Nico players, even before she was... Reworked and got a bunch better. Uh, he was our best Nico uh, here in the LCK. So typically how you see the draft pan out from here is the Quarky kind of warps the whole draft and everything becomes about him. So T1 start to go for dive threats that can try and get on the Quarky. And then DRX are like, okay, we need anti-dive. Yep. So they go for the Zaya. They're like, okay, Zaya can survive well against uh, the Nico. We're going to pick up the Rakan as well, which is a solid peel champion, good lane with the Zaya. And then T1, I wouldn't be surprised to see them pick up like the Nocturne or something along those lines. But there's still a lot of junglers available, so I don't feel like there's a heavy obligation to go for it. They could just look to secure that bot lane duo and pair up with the Senna. Yeah, I wouldn't mind it. Uh, oh. Or just get a solid top lane pick there as well. And if you can get in amongst it, uh, the Aatrox will be devastating here. Yeah, I think this kind of shows the confidence Understandably, that T1 have in their top yeah. lane there, but picking up the Aatrox here, not what I would typically expect from most teams. Uh, we do see DRX now starting to target some of those pairings that go together with the center. And the thing is, because T1 are on red side here, they kind of get first choice of junglers, so they can start to thin out the pool a little bit. They're taking away the Sejuani. There's still like the Rel open, the Vi open, the Nocturne open. They have a lot of options, and they can kind of ensure that DRX don't really get a good choice on this one. Yeah, we'll see whether DRX take away something like the Seraphine next up, or whether it's the Tom Kench, um, which could certainly still fit the bill. The Poppy going to be removed as well, and there goes the Nocturne, so Nocturne. at least eliminating that part of the dive threat. Yeah, Nocturne Nico is super strong. Uh, I think in this situation, I feel like Vi makes a lot of sense for T1 here, but they could hold off in the jungle. Jarvan also could work, theoretically. Yeah, I think Jarvan pretty good into Zaya, not as good into Corky, though. What about Briar? Uh, yeah, I think you just go for the buy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest. Uh, and in terms of, you know, obviously, Vi isn't... Oh, actually, not going to go for it all. Going to go for the Viego. That's a Viego. Viego, yeah, yeah. Halfway there. Yeah. It's, it's Vi with some extra steps. But they clearly want strong skirmishing power early, not leaning into the tank junglers. So, DRX, you already have a pretty weak mid laner who's going to need some time to get going. You need to be able to match up to Ona in the jungle if you're going to have a hope here. I like the Ksante, especially into the Aatrox. You saw how much threat he was on the flank. 
the Aatrox can kind of just say, uh, sorry, the Kasane can kind of say no to the Aatrox and just drag him away into a dark corner and beat him up. That is the hope. That is what DRX are going to go for here as Sponge's pick. That's what we're looking for. What is it going to be is the question. You mentioned something to deal with the Viego. Well, also just something that Sponge is happy to play. Does help with their team fight at the same time. And uh, Rel Rakan is something that we have seen work to pretty great effect in the past as well. So a well-rounded composition here um, from DRX. And you might look at it and be like, oh, but Zaya doesn't have a whole lot of range. Do they have Corky, so who cares? Yep. Yep. And a lot of the threats from T1 are going to be coming into you. I do think the Rel might feel a bit difficult to play, you know. Playing Peel as Rel is definitely possible, but a bit trickier than it is just playing that straight engage role we often see, but I, I think it's fine. I feel like game one and game Oh, two, I love it! DRX have really been okay, but, you know, we know that the Corky's going to be a problem, a problem later in the game. Now you have this super scaling bot lane off the Orn and the Senna. I mean, realistically, I, I don't see a Zaya Rakan providing that much threat to them. And the Senna Orn is something that we saw Deft and Barrel play already. But what I wanted was the sneaky swap. Because Zaius' on is so good, and he could just play tank v tank there towards the top side of the map and still do a good job, and then play Senna Aatrox in the bottom lane. I'm not sold. Not sold? Not sold. Yeah. I don't think Aatrox will have too much fun in that bot lane matchup. Whereas Orn, I feel like Orn's kind of just chilling. Yeah, he is. He and wants to get fight. the extra levels as well. So if Gumiyoshi just leaves Carrier alone for a little bit, then you could be getting to that level 14 mark, handing out all of the ornaments, having a great time. Uh, a little bit earlier on in this particular game. So a fun draft here for T1, but they have, you know, ran the Corky Risk. And a Corky Risk is something that we, you know, we worry about. Uh, here in the LCK, because Corky's really, 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 really mega strong. Yep. Uh, Satab has also been a Corky player in the past uh, for DRX Challenges. He was um, one of the players that was around during the big Corky meta, uh, you know, in the, the, the Ludens and the silly items uh, being picked up. So an opportunity here for Satab to strut his stuff on the Rift with the big Corky. Let's get into game two. All right, here we are, under the rift for the second game of our first series of the day. DRX moving towards the blue side, now with the Corky composition. Yep. A composition that T1 have destroyed in the past. In fact, the final day that both of these teams played last week was exactly the day that it happened. I feel like a big thing with Corky comps is it all becomes about the dragons. Um, just because once you start getting the package, you start syncing it up. If T1 can get the early dragons, it kind of slows down the Maybe soul stacking. It means you can opt else. out if there's not a good setup. If someone eats, you know, a big one, takes a bit of poke. Uh, but something that I think is a really effective strategy against Corky teams is being able to start up a Baron uh, when the package isn't available. Yeah. And T1, if anything, are a very barony team. They are barony, quite barony. I'd agree with you. We were having the discussion in the last game, in fact. Uh, Sponge moves on over. He's going to be spotted on a ward there as he starts off on his blue buff. Mirrored starts here on both sides, though. Uh, blues across the board. As Faker should have a fair bit of control in this lane uh, early on, of course. Corky known for his ability to do damage later, not earlier. Yeah, no, no, looking to challenge really early already. I mean, that's the thing, you know, like, you're into a tank jungler and a Corky mid-jungle. Ooh, vertical. Uh, I think being aggressive is going to favor T1, but yeah, just a quick response from Sponge just to answer back. Really good defensive vision that DRX have put down earlier on as well. Does mean that Sponge knows that he can do this uh, immediately. Oh, he... And immediately pathing. Yeah, he realizes... Grubs. Interesting. Like, Ona didn't even have... I think he had the information from the blue buff, and he saw Sponge heading over and instantly moves to defend his Raptors. So, yes, yeah, Sponge will get a camp. It's a camp for camp, but Sponge ended up using a lot of time just walking up here, and Ona a bit ahead in terms Ooh, of... Ooh, that's a flash from Carrier very early on here. Let up playing aggressively. You love to see it. As yeah. DRX's bottom lane once again. And the thing is, once you get few levels on Orn, you know, you have your dash, you have your W to like, if you use it when uh, the Rakan goes in for a W, you can cancel out the CC. You're a lot safer 
But level one is definitely a vulnerability, and Carrier kind of just gets caught out there. It's nicely done. Faker as well, trading very well against uh, Satab in this mid lane. Satab just really wanting these minions to come a little closer, as the Blooming Burst is just frustrating yeah. for this Corky to deal with. I built a recall and get a... Oh, that was sneaky. You know, the sad thing is that if Satab just held his nerf, nerf he was fine there. Yeah, he did move a very, 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 very small amount. So maybe that was just enough to move him out of the way. His grand entrance once again. No flash here from Carrier. It could be another first blood for DRX as he's burning, burning. The flash comes through and Carrier walks it off. Oh, it's so close here for DRX on the bottom side. And Carrier has teleport. He can just be straight back here. Yeah, a bit of a heartbreak out there, honestly, for DRX. Carrier kind of misplaying on the Orn there, tries to use the dash to avoid the W, and it just gets interrupted. It nearly backfires. But the fact is, you end up getting Teddy Sums as a reward. Just because it was a little bit of a miscalculation. Oh, that was cute. Yeah, managed to get it in time. Makes their way out, and of course, they can do that together, which is handy. Satap has teleported back to the lane. 17 to 30, though. Faker Not is crazy. really having a great time. Rascal able to dash out of the way of the Infernal Chains. But this is what the, the space was kind of talking about, and that is that naturally T1 are just doing a lot more winning. Whoa. Satab, that's, a, that's an aggressive move. Letter is here, though. Looks for the knockup. Does get it there onto Faker. Just on the edge, in fact. So nicely done. Able to trade back nicely. But you can see uh, Satab just teleporting back. Now doesn't have a bunch of his health. And Faker in a similar boat. Uh, to be perfectly honest, but Satab with just the uh, the tier stacking up in comparison to the two books, Faker is well read. He is known for his reading of books, uh, but he is going to be able to do so in lane as well. And oh man, catches him right on the end as Satab going aggressive. Faker, oh, just flashes, picks that one up. I believe that was the empowered auto there as well. And so yeah. Faker, first blood solo kill. Just way too ambitious. From Satab, I think kind of overestimating his damage. Bear in mind, he had just a tier compared to the two Amp Tomes. I think he was hoping for just a little bit more in that trade to try and turn it around. Very aggressive play from both sides, but Faker ends up coming out ahead and adds one more to that kill tally. Only six to go before 3,000. Just such a huge milestone. Not sure when we're ever going to see another player make it to it. Would like to have sort of the list of players uh, and the numbers that they're up to, because I imagine everyone's pretty far away uh, from where Fake is at, just given the longevity and the fact that Death took some time in the LPL. Yep. As another one, Fake are just finding these uh, Tangle Barbs over and over again. I think as well, there's a lot of supports who have a ton of games, but obviously supports aren't really getting kills. <laughs> no. So definitely role dependent um, as to who gets. It took a very long time for people to catch up to Gorilla. That is yeah. very true. Uh, I believe Lehen's only just crested uh, his assists. It took a very, very long time. Lehen's been playing for a while as well as uh, Carrier. Able to get out of the way of the CC, utilizing his uh, Bellows Breath. Pretty handy yeah. ability. Lin from last time, when he tried to go for the dash instead. Uh, and, and that's kind of the thing is that, you know, Senna can just play at max range, hard to really pressure here, and the Orn can just buffer the, the W from Rakan every time. So it's a pretty safe lane. and. If you have a safe lane with Senna Orn, you're in a good spot. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's have a look at this one more time. This was... The, the Valkyries that Satab have been going for have been ambitious. Yeah. And the problem is he takes full procs off the Q from Faker. So the E just clips him, and then he takes three hits off the Q. I think if any of those had missed, you know, maybe if he had flashed in or flashed over the root or something, I could see it going a bit better, but... Yeah. If you're taking three from the Bursting Bloom, then you're just not going to win. And we saw that that was exactly the case. As Gumiushi uh, slinks off into the fiery mist here. And Rail not going to be able to find too much. Zeus not able to find the CC, but a fair bit of damage onto Rascal here who doesn't get the third Q. And a back to come down from owner as well. Level six now on the Viego. Sponge looking for his. Should be next camp or... Maybe a, a couple more camps. You see, Ono is very far ahead. That's four camp lead here for the Viego. Similar to what yeah. we saw from Cuz yesterday, actually. Really I mean, mopping up the jungle. Yeah, that's the thing is Viego can just clear quite fast if he's left to his own devices, which he really has been here. But it's this entire top side. You know, we have like a 20 CS in all three lanes. Oh, another Bellows Breath going to be used, but Carrier takes a damage. Sorry, continue. 
Yeah, I was just saying, there's like a 20 plus CS lead in top, about 25, 20 CS lead mid, and as you just said, the big camp lead in the jungle. So really, this top side of the map for T1 kind of running away with the game, just having lane gaps. Yeah, all over the place. Uh, Gumushi and Carrier as well are sharing CS. So the lead that could have occurred uh, on the bottom side for Teddy is just not really there. The sharing has sort of really helped out. And so Gumiushi Carrier, they're also ahead. They'll have more money as well, definitely, because Teddy does not have a World Atlas. And Fleta going to go aggressive. There is still the Corky, right? The Corky factor exists. But the problem is, is that he just may not get to the Eclipse Malignant's uh, Mirror Mana situation as Gumiushi does have to use the Flash. There's a Featherstorm as Carrier trying to get himself out of the way, calls the Ram, and they still manage to get the knockup. Ona finds the stun, max range. Oh. Dawning Shadow flies forward as well, and Ona, he helps them pick up their second kill of the game and continues to go aggressive here, moving into the enemy jungle. Honestly, second game in a row where like Ona's made a bot play, and they kill Teddy, and then Ona actually nearly kills Pleda, but like he flashes away last second just to stay alive. Kind of feels a bit of deja vu here, and now, Sponge is going to be able to defend his red buff, but really solid play coming out from T1. And this was the lane that was doing best for the yep. DRX. And they've now just lost a couple of plates and had that kill go over to the Orn. Bit of a disaster. It really is. Let's have a look at it one more time. As it looked okay here, and getting the flash out of Gumiushi really important. Yeah, this is the sort of thing that in isolation is a positive play for DRX, but Owner's coming down. The ult comes to follow up. Teddy flashes badly, unfortunately. Still gets caught. And then here. Owner actually goes for the ult on the Pleda, tries to catch him off guard, but Pleda is quick with the flash, so could have been a 2-0 there yep. uh, in terms of kills, but a nice response by the Rakan. And just unfortunate for DRX. Like I said, good execution of 2v2, but League of Legends in a 2v2 game. It, it definitely isn't. And last time around, it was DRX that had the 2-0 lead as far as kills, and this time around, it is T1. They still have the massive CS advantages and just general global advantages around the map. And Blue Moon Burst not going to hit Satab uh, too many more times. Level 8 now, so it does have his rockets available. And this is one of these situations where Satab has gone the Hex Drinker, which I think is the objective right decision when you're having this much trouble in the lane matchup. But it's just going to delay your spike. It's just going to stall out the point at which this Corky becomes strong, which is always a rough feeling because I feel like DRX are really banking on that level 16 Corky with three items. Yeah. Uh, and T1 can only continue this now as well with the Void Grubs that they've picked up. You can see Zaius unleashing the Mites on the turret as well. And uh, yeah, bad to worse is where I feel like this one's going. Carrier taking a bit of damage here from Teddy, but he's been somewhat muted after that initial kill. As that's the wrong Faker. Sponge looking for something here, but Satab just pushed all the way out and the Rel's not really going to be able to interact. Ona moving over. That is going to deny Satab's recall once again. I think that's like the fifth recall that Satab has been not allowed to do. Yeah, and the thing is, Satab, we know the dragon's up, so him recalling, if he can pick up the package, would allow them the possibility to contest this. They've already secured one dragon, but T1 is going to move in pretty quickly. Oh, oh my. It's, not, it's, it's huge, because the dragon's just going to go down before he gets back. Yep. Bear around, he has no TP. He just has to fly back over. And Sponge, he's here, and he knows what's going on, and he knows that there's absolutely nothing he can do about it. See what the soul is going to be. As this one cloud is going to be taken down, and two games in a row, it's going to be Hextech Soul. It's a lot of value, as that's the right direction. Satap able to get himself out of the range of another Q from Faker if it was to come in. So, keeps himself alive. And yeah, it's two to zero. Uh, not a lot of kills, but you can see in the gold at the top of your screen, uh, DRX are just slowly but surely falling apart. Yeah, and this cork is so far away from being relevant that I feel like it's just kind of fruitless to talk about. Really, it's kind of looking at when is Teddy going to be strong? Because that seems like a more immediate factor. But when you have like this Orn to cut through, who's pretty close to already having a frozen heart, it's going to be a rough time. Yeah. Well, some Void Mites heading towards the turret here as Faker going for a back and cancels it in the end. So an opportunity here for the bottom lane lying in wait. Faker gets that shove. Teddy is going to move into the lane. And Faker is going to go away. So he does have Shape Splitter. So that means that that is not going to be an issue. But now with the bottom lane in mid, this uh, outer turret is not long for the world. Plates going down left, right, and center. And I don't know whether Satab can really offer too much. 
Yeah, and the fact it's a six Void Grub game... Yeah. You know, the, the Void Grubs, I feel like, as far as objectives go, haven't felt the most impactful since the introduction. But if a team is ahead and they get six, the extra tower taking ability is pretty severe. And it just means you have to be so sharp. If you leave a window open, they will just charge in. And, you know, there wasn't even that much time where Corky wasn't present bot to defend the tower. And that was enough for two plates to go down. And that was right before they are going, uh, they are set to fall as well. We've uh, got about 40 seconds until those plates are gone. And all of them have been defended outside of one uh, here for T1. And that early push from DRX certainly a good thing, but just not really feeling like enough to get them any sort of meaningful lead. And we mentioned, you know, the fact that Corky is sort of oh, just a scaling composition I... by himself as the package was picked oh, up. Oh, no. And, uh, and then he's spotted on a ward. But like, what is the point of taking package now? Well, um, so that you can get out of this. Nailed it. Sponge gonna look for a bit of a shattering strike here. T1 are gonna be able to push them away. So, okay. Fair, Featherstorm gonna be used. Pop Blossom comes down, and that is a dead rel. Nicely picked up there. And Faker grabs yet another one. Good grand entrance, though, as there is the Heartbreaker Flash to get Owner out of there. He should be all right, as Carrier takes another turret shot as well. Ooh, Faker taking a lot of damage underneath this turret as well, but should mean that T1 can escape, and it's just Sponge that does go down. Yeah, no real MR on Sponge yet. A lot of magic damage coming out there from Faker. Just kind of gets blown up. 5,000 now, the gold lead. You can see 1,000 gold extra picked up from the plates from T1, making a massive difference. Yeah, just kind of ridiculous. But I just feel like the most frustrating thing is that DRX still have a game plan which is play for package around dragons and try and make that a thing, but you've just desynced it. So now either you skip next dragon and wait for the following one to have package, or if you just keep picking it up off cooldown, it's never going to be synced again. Nope. I uh, also just don't really like the whole situation at all, but maybe desperation here from Satab wanting to try and win some sort of skirmish. But T1, uh, they managed to win that, and now they're pushing even further. This inner turret, man, that would be... Uh, pretty backbreaking as far as an advantage. And Kerry is also just uh, using his hammer on this inner turret in the bottom lane, and there's no one there to answer. Yeah, he's actually probably just going to get that with some support from his AD carry. Yep. Kumushi should, like, a couple of autos. Oh, just uh, one and a Q. Yeah, this, this is not going well. I'm going to put it in the cons column, um, absolutely, when it comes to DRX early games. Okay, now um, the top. Yeah, Ona is going to be able to get Satab here. Does use the flash, but there is the stun. And is he able to do oh. anything? The answer is no. And he also gives the assist over towards uh, Gumiushi as well. Yep, well, really nicely played. Uh, it's Satab's items in his inventory. Kind of look like a mess. You have a tier, a coal field, and a hex drinker. Yep. And here, you know, Carry just goes with the flash stun. They're not able to burst out Satab uh, in time, but get rid of the package in here. I mean, that, that minion's pathing was a little bit sus. You should have suspected that. <laughs> Sponge is just getting caught out. And again, the magic damage doing so much when he has no magic resist yet. Yeah, and Faker collects another kill as well. So he is, I believe, only five away at this point in time. And we're even going to check this one out. Uh, Ona just going to be ulting right on top of Satab. Gets the stun in the end, and the Dawning Shadow helps out. Yeah, everything just hits, you yeah. know? Pretty close to not being able to get it. If anything didn't connect there, then you've got to think that Satab could have gotten away, but everything connects, they get it. And now, a uh, free dragon. No package to worry about here. And look at these uh, money differences. They are very, 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 very large. Um, uh, obscenely large. Uh, I'm really I glad that it was know, only up for a little while because that was... Uh, you know what's the biggest thing for me? What's is that? that Teddy is 100 CS up on Gumiushi and he's down in gold. Yes. Uh, yeah. And Carrier is up a lot of thousands as... Okay, that's a decent engage here from Pleta, finding Zayas, doing a fair bit of damage. Sponge also moving in, but really not getting the Magnet Storm onto anyone that he really wants. Maybe not enough metal players on the side of T1. And yeah, they are just get, going to have to back away. I guess Zayas is Flash, but like as far as summoners to get, I feel like Zayas' is Flash is kind of low, low down in the tiers. Plus, the problem is, Dragon's in like 4 minutes 30, so his flash will be back up in time for the next Dragon. 
Yep. Uh, and yeah, you can see that just everyone on T1 is ahead of everyone on DRX apart from Teddy. Teddy has slightly more gold than Ona, uh, which I'm not even sure is a copper lining. Yeah, no, there's um, the linings are not looking great uh, for anything at all. As Gumiushi already doing a fair bit of damage here, as we can see, taking a lot also as oh, not quite enough for the dash cannon pop blossom, but the knockups are going to be there as the ram comes in, and T1. Kind of okay with this. They're just going to push them away from this inner turret and further line their coffers with global gold. We are approaching a uh, 10,000 gold lead pre-20 minutes. Rather a lot, you know? Yeah. Uh, quite a substantial I would sum. say uh, in the business we call that a big lead. Yeah. Uh, I think. I think that's what we call it. Um, Corky has finished the Man Immune, so two more items to go. Yeah. Not looking so hard. Maybe next game. Maybe next game you can get those extra items. Yeah. Because it's not looking like it's going to be something that you're uh, going to be allowed to do. You know, and as far as anti corky strategies, getting a 10,000 gold lead and then subsequently destroying the Nexus, that's probably a pretty effective. Why didn't all of these other teams think of this? Yeah, I... You know? It seems so... It was right there in front of us. Oh, I don't even. Why was I complaining about uh, Corky this whole time? It's very, that very simple. Silly. That's yeah. straightforward. Well, Shelly, still yet to be used here by Sponge. He wants to find some sort of lane that he can actually get meaningful damage. And there it is. It's this bottom lane. You know, considering how much they lost to get the Herald, like they lost bot tier two and mid -tier damage two. mid tier two. Yeah, um, they don't even get bot tier one. I'm going to go with not worth. I'm going to say not worth. They're also then here uh, for owner to rotate down. The rest of the team also coming in. There's a Magnus Storm from Sponge as we have a look towards the top side. But it finds the quickness. They're looking to lock down Carrier, but... Does he take he damage? Is, no, not really. Uh, he's just trying to turn it around, gets a Feather Storm, and continues walking at them menacingly. Look at him. Just trudging. Trudging down the rift. Breaking his own things. And just not really worried about anything at all. Brittle, not going to be proc there onto Sponge. But he also just takes way too much damage as Faker is going to look to support. And now Zaius wanting to find Satab, and he'll find him. And that is a real scary one. Flash does come out, but I don't know whether Satab can escape this. Where's the Valkyrie? Uh, Seven seconds. <laughs> yeah, he's really dead. <laughs> I don't think he get that long. And, and look uh, at the scratch of the head on the, the player cams there as well. You can see Satab not really happy about how this game is going whatsoever. Maybe oh. it wasn't. Oh. Maybe it wasn't Zekka's fault. Uh, maybe it was. Maybe it's just T1 are too good at dealing with Corky comps. Maybe that's what it is. Well, I think the chances of Sponge stealing this pretty limited. low. Yeah, limited. Uh, uh, those probes, though. Maybe no, he doesn't even get those. All right. Well, the ram comes down. They do manage to catch Pleta here. Arizona looks for a little bit more CC. Heartbreaker comes down. Rascal going to be the next target here. Is Teddy Keep takes running, the face Teddy. gate? Yeah, Faker running. is after him. There's a pop blossom. Teddy able to avoid that, and that will be able to keep him safe. But he needed ghost and he needed needed flash in order to get out of it. Didn't and have Featherstorm, but would have needed that as well. Yeah, could have pressed that button. Pleta still uh, running for his life. Sponge doing the same thing. And, um, yeah, this is, uh, this is a difficult game here for DRX at this point in time. Pleta is going to die, and there's going to be a kill going over to Ona. Now Rascal fighting alongside Satab against Zaius. Two versus one. Uh, I'm almost favoring the one here, but uh, it is going to be Rascal picking it up in the end. As Carrier turns up just a little bit late, and Faker is uh, a little bit distracted by winning the game uh, by the looks of things. Still needs a few more kills, like Faker. Like, He's been on, hunting man. for them. You've seen him trying. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. But you can't... Don't win the game. Then you definitely can't get the kills. Yeah. There are more important things at stake right now. No, precisely. As Rascal is going to turn it here. Carrier going to oh. flash on over. And uh, yeah, Gumushi turns up. He's going to protect his better half. And now you can see uh, Carrier just going to go back home. Satab may just die here. As yeah, that's, uh, that's a bunch of buttons in his face. And Gumushi locks down a solo. Yep. Uh, bad twist, I think, is kind of how I'd... 12,000 is the goal. And three dragons would have been a Hextech soul. Yeah, this is like a... This is a, a vacuum lining. Or a void lining. Abyss... Abyssal lining. I think... There's no lining that's good. I think vacuum lining. I think... You're okay with that? I think that's how I would describe it. Yeah. That's what I'd go for. It's not great. Um, Carrier is split pushing. 
Um, the thing is, no one's even near no I. No one's here. Where? Where is everyone? Where is DRX? Um. Well, they're not mid. That's dead. Well, there's one of them. Yeah, there we go. So Rascal is going to find Carrier, and Carrier is going to ignore him. I'm pretty sure Rascal pressed a button, but I'm not entirely sure. Pop Blossom going to be channeled here as Sponge is going to dive on into it. Looks for a last-ditch attempt as Faker goes golden. He picks up another kill here. That's his third for the game, but he will end up going down. Good package there from Satap, and now he's on the wrong side of this one. Knockup is going to come through onto Zayas. Blade Caller is good, and Zayas will be taken down. But now the cavalry will turn up. There's another Corky. That's that's a decent way of dealing with it, I guess. But he's oh. going to take a lot of damage. Teddy on the fountain is uh, kind of looking like his old self as that fountain laser. But still, these Nexus turrets are going to be turned to. Carrier looks for the dive forward. Good feather storm there from Teddy to avoid him. But now the Nexus will be taken down, and T1 going to look for that swift 2-0. They will find it. Carrier will die. T1 will get the job done in the end. Decent little dash there from Owner, and he keeps himself alive at the last second. So, not able to get to 3,000 kills, but congratulations to Faker on the 600 wins. And uh, also, congratulations on T1 for an early trip home. Yeah, I mean, they, they really were just very dominant. I feel like game one, it was close for a bit, but game two, they just completely annihilated them. Yes. Uh, they did not mess around, and they also uh, very deliberately left that Corky open, is what it felt like to me. I think uh, Faker may at least get an interview after this one. It was a great game for him. As you can see here, 600 wins. We'll need another best of three to get the 3,000 kills, but I have a feeling he'll find it, you know? And you can see depth. It's, it's basically 160 wins, Yeah. the difference yeah. between Faker and depth. Like, that, that's that's what Faker's stats are here in the LCK. It's just an anomaly. It's absurd. Yeah. So far ahead of everyone else. And, you know, unfortunately, he didn't get the kills today, but that means we get to celebrate another day, you know? No, exactly. And we kind of all of the milestones happening at once. Spread it out. Yeah, I like, assume it was deliberate. Uh, Faker is a good guy like that, you know? And, ooh, that was, that was Gusto that we yeah. saw behind that thumbs up. Faker pretty happy about 600 wins here in the LCK. We even get a second one. 3,000 kills, 600. These numbers oh, are so, just insanity. I feel like he was trying so hard to get the kills. I don't know how much he's like just trying to get kills because kills in League of Legends are usually good. <laughs> and how much it was because he's like, I want to get 3,000. But uh, he definitely was giving his all on that one. Most of the time, um, from when we've watched interviews after milestones like that have been hit, the players have absolutely no idea. That's uh, yeah. that's normally it. They're not I focused on uh, their stats. They're focused on their, the opponent ahead of them and what they need to do to win the LCK, win Worlds. It just happened things. to be that Faker getting 3,000 kills and him killing his opponents just kind of aligned. You know? yeah. Both yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the goals definitely do uh, align like that. Um, and we're going to see this. Uh, all wins lead to me. His, uh, yeah, 82 victories out of 119 games on Azir is an absurd win rate as well. Uh, his LeBlanc win rate still very high up there. And the just the comparison to other players as well. Plus, he's nearly at 900 games in total as well. Yeah. And that's a pretty good win rate at over 67. So we'll have a look at some of these highlights. The GOAT yeah. himself starting off with a first blood, certainly good news. Satab just kind of disrespecting there, hitting two procs off the Q, uh, getting punished. And here, you know, honestly, I said it before the series, Platter and Teddy kind of the shining light of this DRX roster, but it just wasn't enough. And Owner making his presence known, heads down here, and we see kill picked up. And it felt like that was the winning lane for DRX, and it wasn't even winning, it was just kind of not losing. Yeah. The bot lane, everywhere else felt really rough. That was the job. Well, that was the lane doing its job. Yeah. Uh, and then everything else was on fire. And then the bottom lane was eventually on fire as well. What a lot of fire. Yeah, uh, it, it was. It was a bit of a Donald Glover situation. Um, yeah, if you were a DRX fan and you turned up halfway through uh, game two uh, to witness what was happening to your team, I imagine that's exactly the response. Yeah. And I just feel like it just becomes so hard because you get to the point where it's like, okay, we haven't really thought about Zayas for a while in this Aatrox, but he turns up in a fight and he's very strong. Yes. And then you also have the center who's skating okay, okay, really okay. well. 
and you have the Nico who's winning lane. It just feels like there's too many threats, really. So even if they do manage to kill someone, there's so much gas left in the tank. No, it's nutty. It is, uh, it is just nutty. And this is the to be expected res uh, result uh, from this series, of course, but the way T1 are playing, it feels like they are ramping up towards maybe finding even more victories in 2024 than they did in 2023, which was marred by the end of the summer season, right? Um, I like things in spring certainly did look good for this squad. I like this final moment where Ona Lily dies because he was being corky and he made the realization, why would I be this anemic corky? <laughs> yeah. Uh, if he had a state as Viego, the rest of the team may have actually stayed alive as well. Yeah. But the entire time, uh, Gumiushi was there uh, and he was shooting a Nexus and then it was over. Let's have a look at the damage numbers here. Gumiushi doing a whole lot on this center, to be perfectly honest. Um, the Corky, even though anemic, like you mentioned, still uh, able to do a fair bit of damage because you throw a bunch of rockets around. And Teddy, it's good to see him finding some form, but uh, unfortunately, the rest of the map really isn't keeping up. Yeah, I just think... I mean, this is always going to be a hard matchup. It's hard to stabilize the top side of the map, but I, you know, credit to the bot lane for at least giving us that competition. And in game one, they got that 2v2 kill. It was pretty hype. They definitely did. They were able to find a kill in the jungle there as well. So there are definitely positives that you can focus on. But what I'm going to be focusing on is the space. Because we're going to go there right now to break down that game. Thank you, casters, for that wonderful breakdown of that series. Fake are the first person to ever get 600 wins in the LCK. Big congratulations to him. Just another roadblock defeated by the man himself, the GOAT in the mid lane, and I'm sure many more to come in other uh, records as well. But that was a game number two that we kind of um, labored through a little bit because T1, they just kind of crushed them in every single lane, in every single aspect, and there wasn't a lot of close competitive gaming going on. Guys. I'm pretty frustrated with the draft here from DRX because like I said in the first uh, iteration of, of the space, I wanted to see a more proactive draft where they maybe they drafted Nico, they draft a little bit more engaged. They played the rail super well in game one, they played it again here a second time, but they went with a quirky draft here. And to be totally frank, if you cannot lane as quirky into Nico, I don't care if it's Faker, I don't care if it's Caps, I don't care if it's Taken, it doesn't matter. If you can't lane into a, a Nico and you're 30 CS behind, you're getting solo killed, you can't draft this. You can't do this. You gotta do something else. You gotta play more proactively. You can play LeBlanc, do something different because Zaytab, you know, he played a, a great game of LeBlanc last week. I just wanna see something different. I don't wanna see like sit back, play quirky, and hope we win. I wanna see this team play proactively. Otherwise, oh, we see games like we just saw and I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Yeah, I'm 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 not as uh, as 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 hot about it as, by the draft as Wolf, uh, but I am by the game. So you know we, we kind of equal out in that matter nonetheless. I think that the draft is uh, name plates off actually pretty decent. Obviously, you know that some form of curveball is coming given the Sano was picked up very early. I don't love the Zyra Khan response because I think that there are a lot of ways in which you could have been bullied way worse than than you did there. But, you know, it gave Plata a pick that he could maybe carry on in, in a perfect world, which he tried, but it, it wasn't really enough. Yeah, he did try. And um, it was, you know, he, he had actually some pretty good moments. So shout out to Plata. I think that the team just, you know, especially after they got a bit behind, it, it kind of just all started to fall apart. And I think the players just weren't really feeling it at that point, which is fair enough, right? So let's take a look at the first highlight, which we have this uh, fight in the mid lane, which, you know, it starts off with this, and then it gets just a bit worse from here as a bunch of kills go the way of T1. Yeah, just miscalculating here, thinking that after the root, maybe it could all in with a Valkyrie. It doesn't have the, the damage, flashes and still dies. And then down here, bottom side is a bit of a disaster after a error of flash there from Teddy into the Orn ultimate. And then Satab is isolated here, was caught by the root. And I mean, DRX are trying to make something happen here in these moments. But unfortunately, they're just a little bit too far behind, and this is just real unlucky. And game number one, there were at least moments, right? There were glimpses. Game number two was just a uh, a, a complete and utter T1 uh, run over. Like, there, there isn't just that much to say about the game, because while all of this was happening, they were also getting ahead in CS. They were also pushing turrets relentlessly. T1, I think, is our most oppressive team by a large margin with a lead. I think Gen.G is still a more stable team given what we've seen, but if you give them like a 2 free k gold lead in an early game, it doesn't matter what the draft is. T1 is just going to truck over you. There's nothing you can do. 
And that they did. Uh, it was a pretty one-sided affair. We can take a look at the last fight that happened in the base, and this one was essentially just the cherry on top, right? Not much else to see in this game. It was a lot of, like, brick by brick by brick. Uh, the wall was falling down, and then eventually T1 just put the nail in the coffin. Yeah, and, and like a stack of Jenga, every time a piece was pulled, like, the foundation of DRX got more and more unstable, and the next thing you know, it's an 8,000 gold lead with only four kills, and T1, I mean... This, this fight is, is really them just closing it out. They, they literally, like, Nico Hill doesn't hit anyone besides Rel. The, the ultimate from Orn also doesn't do anything, and it just doesn't matter. Like, doesn't the, matter. the lead that they got was so monstrous that two of the biggest team fight ultimates in the game were just like, ah, hey, throw me in. It doesn't matter. It's fine. We'll, we'll be all right. It, it really says a lot about how big the gap between these two teams is, and obviously that was what we expected coming in today, but actually, Living through it, I think, is uh, definitely an experience. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping that DRX can bounce back. Obviously, they took their first win against Bro last week. Different, different caliber of opponent, right? Probably 10th place versus 2nd place here in T1. And I, I think some of the drafting could be changed to suit their playstyle, where they have really good engaged players in Sponge, in Pleta. Maybe just go for an all-in dive composition instead. Don't try to play Corky while also kind of having engage. Don't do that, please. But it's OP Wolf. Well, not in this game. Uh, um, this let's case. take a look at the POG for game number two on the side of T1. Uh, I feel like this one was pretty difficult, but it is going to be Faker just pick it up with the three, one, and zero score line and the one solo kill. Yeah, just a strong game. Just a good game, and there's a couple of options here. Uh, I, I wasn't impressed by Carrier's or but outside of that, I think Guma had a, a solid Senna game. Faker and Owner were to stand out though. Faker being able to do uh, a lot in these early team fights and obviously winning his lane very, uh, very decisively, and Owner for taking out like the one small bright light that was there for DRX, which was the bot lane early on. Just visited that once, and then it was kind of over from there on out. Yeah, I think, you know, some honorable mentions and owner who had a pretty good game, obviously. Um, and, you know, Karia had his moments. Uh, I don't know if it's POG worthy, but it was fun to see the Orn come through again. I'll see what those votes do look like. One for jungle, it's only me. Uh, and then one for Guma. <laughs> Ox? What's wrong with that one? Not sure. Ian cast an Ian analyst kick W moment here, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah, he was trying to join Media, but uh, this time Media was with the rest of the crew, so uh, pretty confusing, but that's okay. We all have our choices uh, in life and POG. Um, we should have this interview ready in just a bit. We are going to be hearing from Faker on his 600 win uh, day, so that's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, that 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 also could have gone for the tactical vote. There, I feel like there there was a small voting block there where you could have a, a, an inkling what they were going to go for. Um, Bit of a comes, narrative uh, uh, yeah, When narrative it comes moment. to 600 wins. <laughs> I, I Like I said, I think that uh, Faker owners we both were, were really good. This this type of game, like voting for POG, is, it was the whole team. It was just such a big team diff that I think it, it isn't... Uh, it isn't as obvious. Yeah, I mean the quirky, team. the quirky had to buy a hex drinker early. I mean, I'm still molding a little bit about this. Had to buy a hex drinker early. Faker had two items completed before he finished his Muramana stacking. Um, so I mean, in that regard, like Faker did kind of push him out of the game, and then the OP quirky was, uh, let's just say, the big ones were, were small ones in this one. Um, that's all yeah, I had to say. Small ones weren't real. <laughs> small, <laughs> small ones were like out. auto attacks. Yeah. I think maybe they just decided, okay, well, if we're not going to be able to win lane, let's just try to slowly limp by, and maybe we get something, maybe we can survive. It's kind of like a survival game, but unfortunately, they went out in the first round. But guys, we do have the interview ready to go right now. Let's hand it over to Deer for the translation. Thank you very much, guys. This is Deer for the POG interview translation, joined by Zeus and Faker on the side of T1. Congratulations! Let's hear from you guys about how you feel, Zeus. And now we're able to win against DRX, and I think we're we're on a really good, really good momentum. So I'm very happy, Faker. I'm really satisfied with a clean 2-0 victory. Faker, you achieved another record, your 600th total LCK wins, which is a huge milestone. This is a new record in the LCK history, so how do you feel? 
it's a reminder that I've been here in the scene for a very long time, and I would like to continue to win. And uh, thank you so much for the congrats. Zeus in game one. After locking in Aatrox first, the opponent took Jax. But they were actually hovering Yone for quite a while. And this is actually normally your signature move against an Aatrox. So if the picks were reversed and you were facing Yone as an Aatrox, would you still be confident? Uh, I haven't really played against Yone a lot, so it would be pretty new, but since I have played Yone a lot and I have experience, I feel like I would still be confident playing against him. And in the Drake fight in game 1, there was a triple kill at Drake that turned everything around, so let's take a look at the replay. Would you like to walk us through this moment? Uh, I was flanking with TP. <laughs> and I think I was just picking my opponent one by one, that was it. So it looks like your teammates set everything up, huh? Yeah, so Kumayushi was the one who set everything up. And I'm sure that Kumayushi is watching and very grateful for the shout out. And game one, Baker, you faced Azir with Oriana. And it looks like you're so jazzy with how you dodge Azir ults lately. So, any thoughts, any tips on dodging? I feel like lately, uh, and in the competitive scene, Azir is utilized a lot. And I feel like just being able to face him so long and uh, seeing all the changes that that was up implemented that made me face him even more, It's I, I feel like I'm just more experienced in terms of dodging. So I think you can literally just dodge it while watching the Azir. Just watch the Azir alt and just flash. That's that's all I gotta say. And in game two, you played Nico and played your lane pretty aggressively early. And thoughts on uh, given that Corky is also something that's utilized often now, thoughts on the Nico versus Corky matchup? Uh, so in the laning phase, I told myself that as Nico, I can uh, grab Pryo early. And I feel like in this matchup, it's all about dodging skill shots. And you also had a solo kill highlight here, so let's take a look and talk about this scene. This is how you got your solo kill here. Thoughts on this scene? Um, you re re take a look at it again? I thought that I thought that their support would be roaming, and I was waiting for the Rakan E. But I think I think I got pretty lucky because it didn't happen, and I feel like that was just a miscommunication on their part. And you also had the big. 3,000 kill milestone ahead of you, and the match ended right at 2,996 kills for you. Just four kills left, so were you hoping that you get your 3,000 kills with your 600th win? I feel like, yeah, I was a little regretful that I couldn't get a lot of kills, although it wasn't something that I was too focused on. I, I don't put much uh, attention on milestones. I don't think that's the most important part here in my career. And Zeus, from a teammate's perspective, did you want to give Faker more kills today? Or do you ever feel that way? <laughs> yeah, no, not really. <laughs> and Zeus, it was actually your birthday yesterday. What did you do? Happy birthday. 
Uh, there are a lot of fans uh, that prepared an event by our company building, so I was able to say hi to them. And it's actually my th third year anniversary soon, so a lot of good things have been happening. So, happy belated birthday. And now for the next opponent for T1's fifth consecutive win is OK Savings Bank Brian. What is your goal? Uh, we have one day to pra uh, practice and then it will be our next match. I'll make sure that we are prepared and we'll do well in the next match as well. And Faker, we'll try hard and put in everything into our preparations and make sure that we do well as well. And this will be the end of the interview with Zeus and Faker of T1 and back to the space. Thank you, dear, as always, for that awesome translation. Let's go ahead and take a look at the standings after this victory from the side of T1 as they sit at 4-1, and one, and they are kind of cruising at this point. Their only loss, of course, to Gen G, who are currently in first place. Critical that they have one with so many two zeros, they can actually match Gen G in points right now. So one mistake from Gen G and T1 continuing that momentum, maybe they could actually take first place away. I actually loved hearing Faker say he doesn't care about milestones. He has so many in his career that like i mean he's like yeah it's like my 17th milestone by the way uh, i just don't care <laughs> it, it's also because he is so far ahead of everyone else it's not like he's any f as long as he keeps playing like he's going to keep hitting milestones and everyone else is going to get further and further away right i think it's kind of funny he's like yeah it's it's fine i guess uh you know i got 600 600 that, that's that's cool and then it's just the same faker face that we've seen in a million interviews where he's just like yeah just just winning just winning, I guess. Uh, but guys, we are done with the first series. That one was T1 with the bopping tonight. Let's get into a break, and then we will have Firex up against Nongshim. We'll see you after the break.
long ago, before the ruination ended their line, the royal family of Camivore revered imperial dragons as powerful and majestic creatures. So as one of the few imperial dragons still alive today, Smolder is kind of a big deal. Or he will be, at least, as soon as he masters flying and breathing fire and being big and, and scary. You know, dragon stuff. Sizzle. The fiery fledgling is an ADC who's all about scaling. He may seem like a tiny spark at first, but he can grow into a late game inferno. So, you ready to play with fire? Welcome to the Smolder Champion Spotlight. Go Smolder! Go Smolder! Smolder's passive is Dragon Practice. Whenever he hits a champion with an ability or kills a target with Q, he learns a bit more about dragoning and gains a stack. Each stack increases the damage of his basic abilities, making them extra spicy as he gets more practice. This means Smolder gets stronger and stronger as the game goes on, so let him cook. Q is Smolder's super scorcher breath. He spits the biggest, awesomest fireball he can muster at his target. Okay, so maybe it's not that impressive yet, but you just wait. <laughs> you started it. As Smolder gains more stacks of his passive, he enhances super scorcher breath in three tiers. At tier one, it deals AOE damage around the target. At tier two, more explosions shoot off behind the initial fireball. And at tier three, the flame burns targets for additional true damage over a few seconds. If they drop below a certain health threshold in that time, they're toast. Don't forget that Smolder gains stacks whenever he hits enemy champs with abilities or kills a unit with Q. Focus on last hitting and poking opponents with Q so he reaches those stack tiers as quickly as possible. By the time late game rolls around, he'll be a teamfight terror with tons of AoE damage. Breathing fire isn't without its challenges though, like all that soot in your nose. With W, Smolder sneezes out a fiery glob. This blast damages and briefly slows targets and explodes around any champions in the line of fire. And you thought your allergies were bad. <laughs> During landing phase, a chew is a crucial farming tool for Smolder. He can use it to soften up a wave, then last hit with Q for all the stacks. In team fights, it's a powerful AoE spell. Hitting multiple champions sets up explosions around each one, which scale with his passive and ability rank. That late game damage is nothing to sneeze at. Don't you just love his little wings? Well, they aren't just for princely charm. Smolder's E, flap, 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 sends him into the air for a short duration where he ignores terrain and gains move speed and vision. He'll bombard the closest enemy in range with bursts of flame, prioritizing the lowest health champion. Smolder's E can help him catch fleeing enemies and secure kills, but it's also his only escape tool. So fly with caution, or you may crash and burn. What did I do? Behind every adorable baby dragon is a super protective mama dragon. Smolder's ult summons mom to teach a lesson to any meanies picking on her son. A face-melting, scorched earth kind of lesson. After casting, Smolder's mom flies overhead, breathing down a wave of fire and burning enemies to a crisp. Targets caught in the center take extra damage and are slow. The wave starts a little bit behind Smolder's position and continues over a long distance. Anyone who might be hit by the flames will hear mom's roar as a warning, so best run for cover if you can. Nothing burns quite like a mother's love. While the spell can help Smolder disengage if he's in a bad spot, his mom is best at starting fires. I mean fights. Especially if the enemy team is grouped up. Slow them down with the center of Smolder's ult, then go full blast with the rest of his AoE damage. Smolder's dragon practice stacks are the fuel for turning this glowing ember into a roaring blaze. He needs to farm safely in the early game to stack his passive and improve his Q before he's ready to take on the world. That means he'll need a more lane dominant support, looking out for him while he grows big and strong. Champions who can zone opponents off will make great lane partners for this widow kiddo. On the other hand, he may struggle against lane bullies who can force him to retreat and lose out on stats. Without much dragon practice, his ability to trade is limited, so enemies with lots of poke and engage tools are blistering counterpicks against Smolder. Where he really burns brightest is team fighting. Thanks to his powerful AoE damage, roasting grouped up enemies is his specialty. But like most ADCs, he needs to position wisely to stay safe. Fly in solo and you might just fizzle out. Smolder is designed to be a simpler marksman with an approachable kit. So if you've been looking for a reason to learn ADC, who burns hotter than ADC, consider this a warm invitation to try the Fiery Fledgling. Likewise, if you enjoy marksmen with their own escape tools like Ezreal or Zeri, or adorable forces of destruction like Tristana and Kog'Maw, you may want to take Smolder for a test flight. And of course, if you love getting stacks on stacks on stacks, looking at you Vagar and Nasus fans, then this scaling damage should be just what you're looking for. Whew, is it toasty in here or just me? I gotta go cool off. Learn how to train your dragon at the links below. And bring the heat with Smolder, the fiery fledgling.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, LCK Spring 2024. I'm Atlas, I'm joined by Orcs as we bring you the final match of the evening. And this one could be closer than our first. What do you reckon? I think it would be hard not to be closer than a first. Yeah. Let's be real. Um, bit of a stomp. But now this, I feel like, is a pretty substantial one because both these teams are kind of like not quite middle of the pack, a little bit below, but they're fighting for like that sixth place spot yeah. on the eastern side. And the thing is, you know, if you're winning a game against like, you know, a team at the top, or I will usually lose against them, but like that's not going to affect them as much as like, if you're against Fear X and Nongshim win, it's dragging them close, it's pushing you up, gives you an option. The two way split. Exactly. Yeah. Close the distance. And on the other side, if Fear X win, that gap will enlarge pretty substantially. Exactly. Let's have a look at the standings and have a look at where those gaps truly lie, ladies and gentlemen. You can see Fox in sixth place, Nongshim holding out in eighth here as we do have. Full separation of all of our teams for now. No ties like there were in the first few weeks. Minus four points, though, compared to minus one here for Nongshim. So going to be difficult for them to catch up with Fox, even with a victory here. Yep. The crazy thing is the fact that DK are sitting in seventh place. Kwanong Freaks in fifth after their most recent victory. And Fox currently in playoff position. We're expecting D-plus to kind of bounce back in that sixth place is going to be a very fierce battle. Both of these teams with their eyes on that prize. And I think Therex can really put some distance between themselves and the rest of the Eastern side with a victory here. Um, so we'll just have to see whether they can actually do so. Eager to join the three-win crew. Yeah. And as uh, yeah, Nongshim have been struggling. With their 2-0, they can actually match Quandon Freaks in terms of their game score as well. So a lot of movement possible. With this, uh, with this win, we obviously saw T1 win, and then nothing really changed for them. Yep. But here, a lot of potential to shake up the standings a bit. And as you said, the game score does hold Nongshim back, but they can equalize in terms of series score up against Fear X. Seen Fiesta making a return. Yeah, it's kind of nutty. Call me, of course, uh, came in with a lot of praise from us, especially just because we knew how much he'd been grinding solo queue, was sitting at the very top of the standings there for a really long time, but has had some middling to bad performances here in the LCK. So we're bringing Fiesta back. He has been also uh, hard on the grind as well. We'll see how it is actually going to work. The sturdy pillar of Fox, Henna. And if you had told me that two years ago, I would have laughed at you, but not this time around. Henna is looking absolutely fantastic. And Jiwoo, 
we haven't seen any of his craziness, any of his weird picks. We haven't had the, the Nila technology. I we haven't had a lot of these things. I feel like this is the meta where you really can branch out. The Nila, yeah. like we've heard about people, Nila was one of the first champions that we heard in solo queue of using like a double uh, support item strategy. So it's surprising that we haven't seen it, but also maybe because it's more meta, he's not interested. That might be the way. We'll just have to see as we will welcome Fox out on to Lowell Park here. First up, of course, Execute looking pretty jovial, as you can see there. And no change-ups here for Fearx whatsoever. They are just sticking with it, and it has been somewhat working. Uh, they have been pretty outspoken with their very aggressive playstyle, but needing to sort of fix things up when it comes to objective battles and things like that. And I think that that is some very good feedback to be given there. Shoutouts to Ryu for identifying some of their problems. Nongshim, it's a different story, right? I feel like they do have the coordination. They do have a lot of what Fearx lacks. It's just the raw... And I don't want to say skill, because that's not it. It's just it's that it's that raw killer instinct that they're missing. Yeah. And that's what Fearx has in spades. I think sometimes as well, Nongshim, there's a lot of volatility in some of the lanes where things can kind of just go wrong before you really get your feet off the ground. And I think that can be a problem sometimes where, you know, we saw earlier DRX doing a pretty solid early game against uh, T1 in game one, and then they kind of fell apart after that. I feel like sometimes Longshim just don't don't even get that start. Um, especially top lane, I think Dundun is someone who can vary massively in terms of popping off or uh, doing the opposite. Yeah. Just have to see how it does go here for Nongshim, as they are certainly in a bit of hot water here in the LCK at the moment. It is only week three, so not the end of the world or anything like that. As let's have a look at our key player matchup. Damage percent and damage per gold here for Jiwoo actually still extraordinarily high. Damage percent says a lot more, as we mentioned in our last series, about the team's performance. But damage per gold means that he is eking out a lot from his champions when he is playing. I will say, I feel like the damage per gold stat is going to be skewed heavily by some of the champions we've been seeing. Like Senna is a champion who gets That's crazy true. damage for gold. So not always have to take these stats with a grain of salt. A lot of, a lot of context, especially when we're getting little, little bits of goofiness in the bot lane. We're getting things like the the support, the double support items. We're getting things like the Senna um, can definitely make it harder to really place uh, the real numbers. But kill participation would see very high for uh, Jiwoo, which often means that the team is very centered around bot, but also not doing too much beyond the bot lane sometimes. Yeah, this is the problem. And the damage is definitely split between bot lane and mid lane. And we'll see whether that stays the same now that Fiesta has joined the roster instead of Call Me. Might be that, you know, of course, Fiesta was known for playing a lot of Azir. Um, it hasn't been winning with it in solo queue. Did a bit of a checkup there, and thank goodness. Probably not going to be busting that one out. Uh, as we hop onto the rift here for our very first game of this series. And that is... Uh, to no one's sadness at all, because he has not necessarily looked all that good. I'm looking forward to Closer and Fiesta really going toe-to-toe, -to -toe because we know that Closer really loves his assassins. We know that Fiesta is happy to pick up some of the more crazy picks there as well in that mid lane. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing whether we will get the Fiesta of old, right? The one that was just, you know, playing with reckless abandon, had a grin on his face and would just make the plays, would just go in. And I think Nongshim need a bit of that. Yeah, I definitely agree, especially up against Fear X, because I think if you're not able to match their pace, you're going to have a rough time. Yeah. Uh, and I think particularly someone who I has, think has been a great addition to Fear X is Execute in the support role. And I really hope we see him on these playmakers, because he's just been kind of masterful. Uh, the Nautilus, we saw the ult flash redirect come out from him, something that the Hens also showed off a little bit later. But like, I feel like it just takes a very creative player to get the most out of these engaged champions. You know, a lot of people think of Nautilus as like, oh, you just, you know, press R, throw your Q out. But a lot of these engaged champions, if you're looking for the right angles, if you know that they're missing a kit, you can really do a lot. And uh, he has also been doing the same thing on things like Rakan as well. Uh, I think that he is certainly a player to look out for and something that Peter will have to keep within his sights. But let's see how it is going to go as we jump into the draft for game number one. Poppy and Vi taken away from Sylvie. And there goes the Melio. So already a big change up when it comes to these bands. So jungle focused already. Yeah, I mean, I think Melio is really strong. So I think that makes sense. But the jungle pool is just being targeted. There is still a lot of powerful picks. There's still Maokai, there's still Sejuani, there's still Rel, the holy trinity of these tanks that just become immortal after they get 
Frozen Heart and uh, Kanek Rukin. At, at this point, obviously, can't ban them all, so we'll see what Firax up to do. Corky's still available, is a big one for me. Um, yeah. And There's also a Varus, Lister. You know, Poppy and Vi down could suggest like an early Callista pickup would make a lot of sense. And it's Henna, and he absolutely loves playing Callista, so I would expect that. That does mean that uh, Corky would be left up and available. And um, do you ever want to take that gamble is the question. Senna going to be the final ban here on the side of Nongshim, and Lucian being considered without Melio as a first pick. And it honestly, this first pick, like when it comes to the amount of whelmed I could be, it's pretty minimal. Yeah. And the response also somewhat whelming. Yeah, I just feel like I expected more. I expected yeah. a bit more interesting. Just okay, Lucian, Nami, Zyrakan. Okay, it feels like very bog standard. We just slam these down. Uh, and here, Firex could afford to pick up the Corky, but they're gonna go for the Oriana. Does Fiesta feel confident, uh, confident enough to take the Corky into that? Obviously, we saw Oriana have a lot of headway in lanes where she can bully early. And the thing with the Corky is, if you can't trade autos with Oriana. Oh, no. It's just not really plausible, so you're definitely on the back foot start the lane, and it really would allow Firex to cement control off that mid game. You could also just go for a jungle pickup here, but oh, that is an easy. Wow, that is not the time. They're going full avian. Yeah. Um, and the birds did, you know, outlive the dinosaurs, right? You know, uh, they survived that meteor strike and stuff like that, but. I don't know whether they're going to survive this game. Uh, I just don't see it. Yeah, not really sold. Uh, and neither team really doing anything particularly creative with draft. You know, matching pound for pound. Uh, both bot lanes secured, both mid lanes. Starting to ban away picks in the top lane. There is still those three junglers uh, left open. So a lot of choice, a lot of options still there. Kassante yeah. going to take out the cards. Still the Udia available. Still the Aatrox, which we've seen kind of rising in priority. Just how broken it is with uh, the Lethality Hydra. Now, will it be a Maokai ban? Or do Firex just not really care whether they pick that champion or not? Because I, I don't know whether it necessarily works that well with Nongshim's composition, but I could be wrong. I think the problem, if you ban Maokai, then you set up Nongshim to like secure Rel. I think you just trade it and you ban something else. Or um, ban Rel. But yeah. Udyr is going to be taken away instead. We're really aiming for Dindin, and there is that Rel that they had their eye on. Yeah, so I think the Rel would have been really nice for Fair X, but it does mean that Fair X could take, in theory, the Maokai. But I feel like Willa is probably going to go in a different direction. Um, definitely likes to play more of these aggressive picks. Uh, big thing is going to be like something that can set up the Orianna Shockwave is going to be important, but you, you have to like that. that aren't easy to stick to. Yeah, Zin Zhao comes out. You know, I think it's 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 not the easiest to get on top of Azir or Zaya. You are playing a short range composition. You are gonna have some challenges reaching their backline. But you can disengage from a Magnet Storm, and that could be worthwhile here for Willa. And also it just fits his style, right? I feel like Willa is a Zin Zhao player. Yeah. It just oh, yeah, works. Sure. Last couple of seconds here as we're waiting for a top lane. We'll see what Clear is gonna go with. Jack's going to be picked up. That is a blind Jax into Dindin, of course, one of Dindin's favorite champions as well. See what he does have in response. Of course, plenty of options up and available. Doesn't have his tanks, but does have other things. And the Aatrox has been the bog standard choice. That's been the one that everyone's been going towards, mainly Zeus, and finding a bunch of success. But uh, King in as well, Rascal, a lot of these players do really like to default back to the Aatrox if he's in the meta. That is going to be the decision here by Dindin. And I just tell you what, I was expecting a little bit more cooking. I was expecting some time in the kitchen. Instead, I, I feel like they just went to the freezer and they just reheated something. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like it's very much lacking the spice. Right? You know? um, I, I feel like it's like, a, it's like a stew, you know? Not not in a bad way, like, but stew uh, is just like... Stew's great. If you leave it great. there for a while, yeah. But you just put your standard ingredients in, you got a stew, you're good to go, but there's no, there's none of that spice there, there's none of that, that crazy flavor, just like a really standard, like, like British stew is what I'm imagining. Oh, British stew. Yeah, I should have mentioned Oh, that. God, okay, yeah, no, I, I all of a sudden don't like it very much uh. at all. <laughs> um, Changes everything when yeah. I put that in, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, it really does. Um, really it, it, really yeah. contextualizes. A vast adjustment from the delicious Osso Booker that I was thinking about. Yeah, you got to um, temper your expectations. Yeah, no, not anymore. Um, <laughs> all right, so 
it all of a sudden went from a delicious game to one that I would prefer to set aside for somebody else. <laughs> um, let's dive into it, though. This is a pretty comfy uh, kind of draft, and I also like the synergy that they do have with the Shockwave. I think that if Firex can actually get themselves together, find that coordination that they've been searching for, it is the composition to do so. As Nongshim, they're going for late game. They don't have a lot of range, and they can wombo combo. Let's see what happens as we jump onto the Rift. Oh, oh. Nongshim fans in full voice here today. Firex as well, though, getting behind their team. So, as we line up, looking to see what's going to happen here, it is not too much funny business in the early stages of the game. We're probably just going to have a fair bit of farming, but there is a window, it feels like, for me, for Willa to get a little bit aggressive pre-six. What do you think? I think so. I think you can definitely find angles, you know. Uh, a lot of ganking power from the Xin Zhao. If you can connect that W, easy to follow with the E. I think top is a good lane to gank, honestly. I feel like it'll really depend how things play out, but I think Aatrox definitely something you can expose. And Jack should be the one setting the pace off the early lane. Now, we see Willa put down that ward to try and track Sylvie, but importantly, Sylvie spotted it. And so very possible for Sylvie to purposely avoid this. Um, but the absence of information is information in itself, so Firex not seeing him on that will be clued up to some regard, but definitely can uh, throw them off if yeah. you see him kind of wander around and dodge away for the Raptors for the time being. And also gives him five gold immediately. As you were talking about trading uh, with an Ariana, this is Fiesta in his first game back after 180 days, opting in for a counter matchup, which just doesn't feel great at all, especially when the champion in it, in unto itself is just not doing very well. Yeah, I think as well, just Oriana in general just feels very obnoxious. Oh yeah. Um, I think she's pretty, She like there's definitely team comps which can, she can struggle with, but I feel like there's not many lanes she's really struggling with at the moment. No, I would agree. I think part of it, like, aggressively. one of her traditional counters was the Syndra, which just plays very differently now with the stacking part of uh, the Cinders you get, or whatever they're called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Splinters. Splinters, indeed. Yeah. See a lot of back and forth in the bot lane, just kind of jockeying for position. I think both lanes get a lot of power at level 3, so I kind of expect to see them pop off a bit more then. Uh, Not the fight for the level 2, the fight for the level 3. That's the big one, as they are going relatively aggressive. Nice little ward goes down from Execute, as now Jiwoo has to play very defensively. Henna at full health, able just to walk at this Nongjin bottom lane. Yeah, you got to be kind of careful against Tsunami, because you take some bad trades, a couple too many, and suddenly you just don't have the health anymore uh, to contest. But also, I mean, this is one of the big changes that Wakong got a while ago that just makes him so obnoxious. It's like you hit one Q, and you're good to Whoa, go. Whoa, that's a flash from Sylvie. Execute, he's flashing away, but they really want this seafood, and there is the crash down. First blood goes to Jiwoo. They invested a bunch of summoners, but they got their prize. Yeah, absolutely worth it. And they get the flash from the Nami, so definitely a chance to, to punish that again going forwards. But the timing was perfect. The wave spot, just a brilliant opportunity to gank there. So well played by Sylvie there. And we're seeing Jax is kind of in the Azir. Uh, yeah. Full park of not doing too hot. And was also behind the turret with like no health. And Dundun was just uh, kind of frustrated about it. Saw him respond. But Clear does have a decent advantage right now. And even in, you know, the last time we saw the Jax versus Aatrox matchup, which was in our previous series, Rascal had a decent time in game one uh, on the top side of the map. So see whether we can see Clear do the same thing. So far, so good in that regard. He does go for a bit of a teleport back as a sword and a red thing. Oh, and no. oh dear. Um, execute. May. Oh dear. Is this. Did we. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, that's two quick ones here for Jiwoo. And we've seen two sides of Execute, ladies and gentlemen. We've seen the one that pops off, makes plays, and everything goes well. And we've seen the one that's four levels behind. Um, you know, level four to a level eight compared to his uh, lane opponent. Just really nice from Sylvie. The fact that, one, you have the Q ready to flash, so Execute immediately gets done, but also the remount W. And here, Execute just, fiercely, your AD carry's already recalled. You know you have no flash. This is just so risky to stop the recall. Yeah. yeah. It's not played well. He was just trying to get a ward down. 
and um, hey, didn't he had a notice. Ward, sure. He already had a ward done. He, really? Yeah, he was trying to stop the recall. That ward's old. You can see the one in the tri room. All right. Well then, um, he, none yeah, of that was very good then. Yeah. Oh dear. I, I think he was just trying to cancel the recall and just overstepped. Well, um, a little bit of a whoopsie. Uh, that is a lot of damage onto Fiesta. That is uh, the W Max coming in clutch here for Closer. Yeah, you see, as you see, Oriana has like an, an Amp Tome, so should be doing that much damage. Uh, very balanced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An entire Amp Tome as well, which is a pretty decent end game item. You could write a book about how much damage. Yeah, I know. And right then now. put it in a tome. Yeah. Wait, that's a book. I see what you did there. <laughs> um, okay, close up still. Control the wave and it does have about a one and a half wave, two wave advantage. Nicely done here so far for the Oriana. As Dindin, playing with Ooh. fire, clear, almost missed that. I got a little bit that was uh, tense. afraid of the zoom in. That's lane honest. losing the, the mental damage that can Oh, do. 100%. That's a flash. Dindin immediately going to flash as well as clear. With his ulti activated, Dindin going to do the same here. I don't know whether he wants this. As there it is! Clear oh. locks it down. Fiesta also unable to avoid the clockwork wind up finish of him. Both solo laners from Fear X just get them back in the game. Love to see that aggression coming out. It is a trade back for Dindin there. Clear. A little bit too low, unfortunately. That tower hit he took a bit earlier uh, definitely not helping him out, but. Fear X, their solo lane is putting the aggression on, making up for some of the issues the bot lane have been having. And, you know, top is a 10 CS lead, but you can see already Dundun's picking some farm up. But mid, 20 CS lead, and there was no trade back kill there. Closer kind of dumpstering Fiesta with his return. Yeah. Closer looking really good. Of course, kind of expected that this would be a rough time for the Azir, but we never expected it to be this rough. You know what I'm saying? As Execute and Henna. You know, Still staying in it just fine. Of course, 55 to 56. Ain't nothing in that one. And we'll have the support items, of course, coming in. And then and, and, uh, and Clear. We're just doing battle up here. And Clear was able to win out. Yeah, I mean, here, that was the moment. If Clear hadn't taken that tower hit, I think he would have been able to get the dive, uh, the kill without dying. Yeah, and unfortunately, yeah, we didn't actually see that. We managed to cut the video very effectively to look at this fight happening in the mid lane. Yeah, and honestly, just... Oh just my to, god. Just, that's a lot of damage. Dead, yeah. Yeah. W Max Oriana is unexpectedly ridiculous amounts of burst. It's so much damage. And I love how, like, in every Oriana meta, I feel like it drifts between the Q Max, W Max options. There is always a time where you can do either. It's very cool. And it does certainly change the way that she's played. Oh, so they coming over. Something. They're looking for this. Yeah, Peter closing in as well. I really like that. Flash to come forward. And the Magnus Storm comes in. Good shockwave, but it's not going to be enough. The soldiers come forward. And it's Fiesta that locks that one down. So 4-2. to two, Now in favor of Nongshim as far as these kills are concerned. It does feel a little bit like Nongshim are getting some kills, but control of each lane is still there for Fearx. Yeah, and I feel like we've seen good answers back from Sylvie. I mean, we had the early gank bot lane. We see this to answer back to neutralize the mid lane matchup a bit. Obviously still in favor of the Oriana, but close and closer just... This feels like a bit of an overstep with how deep you're putting the ward, considering you don't have that side rush clear. And you can just see the collapse, the timing really nice from Peter and Sylvie coming to death together to punish. Yeah, just not quite aware of uh, these recall timings to come through. Peter, of course, may have gone back with Jiwoo. That's probably what he was expecting, but instead rotates up. And once again, he is down here. Gets into this bottom lane. There's the quickness onto both Henna and Execute. That bubble, though, just extraordinary. As Execute looking to try and keep himself safe. Henna also going to be out of flash to safety. And now the cavalry is on their way. Ward is down. They knew that this was happening. Wind becomes lightning, and Peter will survive. They managed to make it far enough, but at least this wave will be dealt with and Henna won't miss out on too much. Yeah, really strong bubble there from Execute, managing to break up the play. You definitely think if Sylvie was able to connect a little bit sooner, then Henna would have gone down. Play picked up by Fiesta, though, and that deficit in the mid lane kind of just shored up now. Yeah, closing a little bit. And that is certainly good news here for Nongshim. They still have a decent advantage, given those couple of extra kills that they've picked up. The gold will put them almost a 1,000 ahead. And it... Still feels to me like Fear X are finding some leads here and there, but it's going to have to be better than this 
As Nongshim's composition, if they are able to do what they want to do, which is team fight, right? Um, they'll be very happy moving with even this lead into a, uh, you know, 25 minute plus game. It's just they have to keep it there. We'll see whether Fox can actually execute on some of these plays. I keep saying it. I say execute way too many times when he's playing. Yep. And I don't when he's not. I, I, it's because you keep looking, looking over I know, his name. Keep reading up. Uh, Sylvie going to be able to do that rel thing where he takes stuff away from people. And Willa doesn't like it. Shockwave does come forward. Magnet Storm in response. There's circles everywhere. As Emperor's Divide just says, out of here, Willa. You don't have to die, though. It just seems crazy how strong this mid jungle is already. Like, the fact Willa and Closer 2v3 can nearly kill Sylvie. And it's, it's Nongshim we have to disengage in that situation. Really showing the power of the Orianna and Zinzao. The Zinzao able to gap close pretty comfortably, and then the Orianna follows up with all that burst available even this early in the game. It's crazy. I don't know. I feel like uh, Closer is eking out a bit more than I've uh, I've seen recently. Still, impressive stuff. So, last chapter, now completed. Does have some cooldown boots as well. And Nash's Tooth on the way here for Fiesta. He should have that one in uh, not too long. Sylvie so coming down to grab himself some grubs. They haven't really been looked at. Uh, Kev, Steve, and Bob have been just uh, kind of lonely. And Clear now going to look for a bit of a back as well. So just one of those grubs for the extra uh, experience like you were talking about in our previous series, Ox. And yep. uh, Sylvie just going to back away. Yep. Going for that momentum uh, and not willing to spend all that time going for the grubs. And I think this kind of illustrates how the grubs aren't that substantial in terms of the buff they give because you know if the five and six were really that important, Sylvie would have stuck around uh, to try and secure more. But it's kind of yeah. just like, XP is nice, having a few is good, but it's not worth investing a ton of time. Whereas Dragons, Dragons are pretty solid. And it looks like Nongshim really have a ton of control. You can see on the minimap how many wards there are on this bot side river. Uh, Dundun might be in trouble. We're looking to start tanking the turret, but he can actually do so. Heals up very nicely. And yeah, Dundun, he has flash. He uses it, but he is still dead. And this time, Will is going to be able to make it out, so no casualties underneath that turret. Should mean that this Drake does go to Nongshim, but I think that Virex prioritizing getting lane advantages and getting kills at this point in the game is really going to help out their composition. Yeah, you can deal with the Dragons later. It's not that big of a deal just losing one, especially at 12 minutes. It's not the earliest dragon, so you have plenty of time to deal with that later. Getting your Jax ahead, the fact your Orianna's already ahead, really putting you in a good spot. 20 CS advantage as well, almost for uh, clear, or at least 17. And Trinity Force now done. That's a happy Jax up there in the top lane. He could be a big issue as this game goes on because there are two really good ball delivery servicemen uh, in the Zinzao and the Jax. And so Closer will be spoiled for choice uh, when it comes to starting off fights in the later stages of the game or two even uh, pretty soon. Two is meant more than one. Yeah. Not quite as many as three. It might be three, because he could use himself, right? True. He could just put the ball down. That's true. And no one. So four choices. A lot of options. Yeah. A lot more than we considered. No. Uh, it's, it's almost too many, I actually think. Um, I rescind my statement. Uh, I think that now Closer has too many options. It could get confusing. Um, Willa is now just... Moving towards the rest of these bubs, that might be where we see the next fighters. That's a flash forward from Clear, uh, and Dindon is just dead. He this just is the, him. And this is the Clear that we were waiting to see. This is the guy that was carrying DRX and Challenger in half of their games. Him and Peach together. Absolutely amazing. That was quite some time ago, though. Yes. And finally, we're ca catching a glimpse of what we were expecting. Second solo kill. So this one obviously helped the jungler, but the setup is the important thing. The fact that Dundun's already low makes this an easy dive. And there's just not much you can do. Uh, I do think that maybe Willa, what you can do is you can like pressure Q, stack it up on the tower, and then instantly knock up. That might be a cleaner way to do it, but it doesn't matter they get a kill regardless. And here, the Nuch commits his cooldowns and kind of disrespects how strong this Jax is. He will chase you down. Flash advantage being a big factor here. And can it just beaten to a pulp. Yeah. Do like that Clear holds the, the Counter-Strike for a, as long as he can as well, just to make sure that if Dundon uses anything to try and get out, Umbral Dash somehow comes back off cooldown. He was going to be dead, but he was definitely dead regardless. And Clear is now a huge problem. He is something that Nongshim are going to have to have a big plan for, and so much of that does come down to Jiwoo and his ability to navigate teamfights. We know that he's their ace. That's what we've 
been putting in every single pre like pre-match that we've gone through, right? For Nongshim, it's all about Jiwoo. Well, he's set up to be the guy this time around. He's the only one on his team that does have any sort of advantage in gold. And it is actually spelling out to be a decent number because you can see that Nongshim are still ahead, even if it is by only a few hundred. Uh, but there's a lot on his shoulders now. Yeah, I mean, get that first, first tower, pretty massive. Uh, and with it being an Ocean Dragon first, and then a Chemtech Dragon, Ooh. we're at a pretty good spot to get a strong soul. So Nongshim securing this next Dragon would be really impactful. You can see they are looking to try and apply some pressure, just challenging in the enemy jungle here. Jester will find Willa, could have been poked down. Yep, Sylvie comes on over to clear out the control ward there as well as the jungle is face off. And yeah, of course, Will is going in. That's a shockwave. That's a Magnus Storm. And now Empress Divided manages to catch closer. Sylvie dives on top of him and they take down the Orianna. Will is trying to get in there though and he is going to be able to do so. And now Fiesta, he doesn't have that ult. And Willer, I think, could have just kept auto attacking. But instead, Fiesta is going to walk away and they will just leave one for one. So jungler on the ground as well as mid laner. Possibly a trade up here for Nongshim. Yeah, I mean, ended up being a bit chaotic there. I think a big factor was Sylvie not having any magic resist. Man, the Orianna did so much damage to him, but is able to turn it around. The Nashes, the Azir, really good in those extended fights. We'll see the replay. So yeah, Sylvie just kind of has already dismounted, walks up. A lot of burst comes in, but then the ult, the Aftershock, keeps Sylvie alive a bit longer. They managed to take out the Orianna. Almost yet, robbed there. He almost, he, I, I swear he got Emperor's divided by not a Sand Soldier. That's what it looked yeah. like. Uh, yeah, I think Willa just had no cooldowns at the end. Yeah. Um, and there were three soldiers down for Fiesta, which is a... Probably would have minced him, but it was looking all right. Um, and the Zin's out, just pretty strong. I feel like every time we see the Zin, we're like, damn, champions, kind of ridiculous. Sundered Sky, also kind of ridiculous, and clear is, um, yeah, he's got a Trinity Force. He does tons of damage, absolutely. He'll take down this turret. He'll also deny a cannon. And that is Savage. Something that now is going to be a huge problem. And that's, it's not going to stop there. Herald now going to make its way towards this mid lane as Dundon has to ult early again. And it's a free disengage here for Clear as he walks into the enemy jungle. His work is done. And now he can inflict himself on the rest of the map. At this point, it's just like Dundon building his ult for basically nothing. Just a bit of an aggressive trade on clear. Do you think Fiesta will survive? Well, I think you get the tower. I think you put up your own tower, and then I think you hope for the best. Well, um, Empress Vibe going to be used here as Fiesta moves ever closer to the enemy base. That flash um, was a flash of all time, and he is going to be taken down. Dundon now in trouble. Infernal Chains do work out, but the Tidal Wave is going to come in. Execute just straight up missing the bubble. It doesn't matter, though as another kill happens towards the mid lane. Peter is just dead. Not sure how that one happened, but nice work, Hannah. And now Will is going to move towards the Drake, and I feel like this was just catastrophic for Nongshim. Ox, can you make sense of it? Not really. It kind of just feels like, what well, could it be in a marginally bad play? Like, you lose your Azir, it's not great, but it's not the end of the world. Turned into an absolute disaster. Dundon teleporting down when he doesn't have ult, and... Like, we already seen Fiesta kite away from the tower, just really not a great play. And then Peter just, I don't even know what happened there, just ends up dying and all three of them burn flash as well. I haven't seen a Jax this fed in such a long time, dude. It's crazy. And here he comes. Um, the flash from Fiesta to try and avoid the uh, Counter-Strike stun, but he's flashing towards an inhibitor turret. Uh, the acceptance of his fate might have been a necess necessity in order to hold on to that cooldown. Yeah, this is a very fed Jax. And here, Peter just... Oh, just uh, gets Wind Becomes Lightning. What? Why are you going that way? He wants to get to the rest of his team. Oh, and then... Oh, oh, oh dear. And the Flash. Lucian's a range champion. He doesn't need... <laughs> He can still auto you from that distance. I feel like we really did Peter a disservice with that replay. Yeah, he, no one needed to see that again. No, we did not. We didn't need to see it in the first place. No, just, just let it, let it be assumed that he was, he was dying valiantly for the cause he instead was, of for no reason. He was at all. trying to defend the river one v two. You know, he's doing everything he can, outplaying. Uh huh. No, he just kind of wandered into, into Willa, and then um, Hannah just walks out of the way of the grand entrance. Hannah's still farming, still doing what he needs to do. Uh, might die here. Um, does have Feather Storm, but not going to use it. Just uses the heal. Needs Feather Storm. Oh, no. If they're ever going to win a team fight, they need that. As now Clear and Dundon are fighting. Well, 
Clear is hitting Dundon, and Dundon's doing his best to avoid getting hit. He's got a whole item lead on him. Yeah, he's Sundered Sky and Trinity Force as well is like, that's a lot of power. Yeah, and like the cooldown from Sundered Sky, he's going to basically just be able to, every trade, he's going to smash Dundon into the ground. And Dundon has committed as well to this uh, lethality build, so it just doesn't take Clear very long to get through the health bar. No. I feel like Aatrox is one of these champions that even if you build Glass Cannon, you're deceptively tanky because you get so much value from your healing and your base stats are really high. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. But when you're behind, you don't get the value from the healing, you just die. Yeah. You just run out of health before you really can buy more time and this kind of feels like one of those situations where Clay can just one-shot Dundon, basically. And this is also old here. Okay, she we're gonna have to use the Feather Storm this time, that's why he saved it. And it's gonna keep him alive and now Clear looking for that flank angle. We'll be able to get it. The recall does come in. Does a fair bit as Fiesta is committed to side laning, and he will be able to take down this outer. And they do keep the mid alive as well somehow. They'd even already put the ward down in preparation for the turret being destroyed. I don't think that turret's going to last too much longer though. I, I feel like it may die. And the money is going to be picked up here there we go. by Henna. There we go. So that gold advantage sitting just shy of 2k but still exactly where Fearx want it. And this is, like, it, it really does play into the, the Fearx just like to go forward. They just like to play aggressively. Um, and if they do have a lead like this, in a game like this, where in the mid game, they, their composition in general is just strong, this is the strongest version of Fearx that we can get. Yeah, and I mean, I just worry how they're going to deal with this Jax. Because he's starting to build a Frozen Heart. It's a best of three. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the strategy. That's, 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 that's certainly a strategy of all time mm -hmm. that you can look to employ, but when he gets in fights, he's three levels up in Dundon, by the way. No, it's absurd. And now he's just, he's got a Warden's Mail. And Jax, Jax is one of these champions that scales pretty well with levels. Oh, you know, yeah. There's not a bad ability to get points in. I feel, I feel like Jax also just scales with everything. Yeah. All of the stuff. Happy to get, like, it makes w incredible use of items. We've said already that Sundered Sky and Trinity Force do offer him just so much. Each item that he will put together is going to make him more and more difficult to deal with. Looks like it's going to be Frozen Heart next. Is it Frozen Heart next? I, I think so. I think some Randuin's next. Nah, know. there's no way you go around this. Frozen Heart's too good. Yeah. Probably, here's, you, here's what you do. This little nifty trick I've learned. What's that? So he's built his cool items, the Triforce and the Sundered Sky. Yep. And then you build Frozen Heart and Kenic Rukin. That's what I was thinking. And then... <laughs> and then you well, never and die and kill the Nexus? And you do a ton of damage, yeah. All right. Um, any, and then fifth item. Sojin or something. As Jiwoo going aggressive. Tidal Wave. Going to be following him. Gets the knock up as Magnet Storm will answer here. And everyone piles on top of Hannah, but he flashes. Emperor's Divide goes wide. And now Clear is looking for this Counter-Strike, but the team calls him off. And he is going to say, all right, he will live this time around. Willa now looking for his opportunity. Closer comes in. There's the shockwave. And Sylvie's in trouble. He's trying to crash his way out of it. They get on top of Henna, but have they dealt with the problem? No. Clear has not taken damage yet. And look at them. They are getting pulverized. Dindon takes one. But maybe that was a mistake. They've reset the gold for Clear to pick up as he puts him in the ground as well. Seven, one, and two on this Jax. There's, oh dear. There's no other way to spin how that fight played out. It was just Jax's difference. Honestly, oh yeah. I think Nom Shim could have won that if the Jax didn't exist. But he did a lot of existing and it was... <laughs> he existed so much in oh, that fight. Yeah. I mean, we actually see the fight. So, not the greatest passage of play for Nong Shim. Like, they actually get a nice engage onto Henna. But we don't get the follow up. There's not enough damage to take them out. But a sum spin. But then Clay comes in with a flank. He's like, you know what, it's 3v5, we'll take a break, we'll take a short hiatus. And then this is where it actually goes quite wrong for Fear X, you know, get the engage from Willow, which does a lot of damage. But he gets focused down, Jiwoo's close enough to chunk him. And that nice redirect from Jiwoo is so good to Lucian, but then Jax exists. Uh, yeah. And look at him existing. Yeah. They just, like, it's like they just try to pretend he doesn't, he, they are pretending he doesn't exist. Like, if we don't look at him, he can't hurt us. And they were so wrong. Yeah, he really does. Definitely can't hit them. Yeah. The redirect from Jiwoo was pretty sick, though. Um, up until that point, it didn't look doomed. 
Uh, well, now uh, it certainly feels it as this inner turret, not long for the world, will be taken down. Clear lurking in the shadows. He does have the Spectre's Cal now completed as well. Just wanting to make sure he's got a bit of magic resist, That's a bit of armor. Feeling fantastic. If he goes back with like 200 gold, he'll be able to finish a uh, Frozen Heart because it's so cheap. And Jiwoo's, uh, he's going to Feather Storm and then he's oh dead. God, this uh, um, the W is dumb damage here with uh, just how fed he is. And Sylvie is also going to die. That's Henna picking up that kill. Fox, if you'd like to, you can go grab yourselves a Baron. You can also walk up the mid lane and possibly just win. Uh, there is just no end to the amount of control that they have. And I would probably just grab that POG form and just put yeah, the pick in the say, top lane it's, now. It's such an easy decision. Um, this is where you can tell if some of the voters didn't watch the game. I feel like even if you just look at the scoreboard, you know, it's pretty obvious, but the game has definitely panned down a way where he has just taken over. It's just, if you are a Jax enjoyer, it does feel good though, because it's just been forever since we've seen what a Jax can actually do. Yeah, I remember. Do snowball. I remember in the draft, you were saying how, like, you know, you have the Oriana who can shield the Lucian and the Nami, so it's kind of like, you know, a little bit of double support. That's not the case now. It's just they both. Oh, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Jax, and he runs past the Featherstorm. Well, they have the double support, but not for uh, Henna. Henna is not relevant in this composition anymore. Um, you just press any supportive buttons on Clear. Yep. Uh, and you convince Willa to not ult because Clear would like it if the bad guys are closer. Yeah. Uh, if that's okay. And he has Kanek Rook here now, that really broken item. Oh, dear. That basically makes you immune to magic damage. Um, and the fact that he can build that in the face of a lethality Aatrox, he's like, I have Warden Smell, that's fine. That's enough. Yeah. Uh, now Fiesta does no damage to him. Uh, he doesn't need to worry. And he already kind of did no damage to him, let's I be honest. But now it's really no damage. Yeah, and it's really hard for G to do anything because he can just press E. Yeah. Uh, yeah, counterplay, well. counterplay is missing. Um, we're going to question mark ping the counterplay. Yeah, not too many. It's as you said. It's been a while since we've seen a Jaxus fed. Yeah, it's it's good. I don't like it if it happens every game, right? Um, you can see the little. It's nice to see it work. The XP track on the left, just to make. Uh, it oh dear, Closer really got punished for doing some auto attacks onto Closer. That's a lot of shockwave Sorry, damage. Sorry, Fiesta got punished. Um, and now Sylvie able to avoid the wind becomes lightning. That might have just been a team fight. As here's the flank. Dun -dun 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 -dun. In comes clear, and he'll kill a ward. And the rest of Nongshima just getting the heck out of Dodge. Well, Dundun's split pushing. Hey, there we go. So in a turret. Uh, I don't think he gets this in time. He might get it if he full oh, sacrifices, no. and he will. Um, ooh, the turnaround was actually kind of cute. Tidal Wave going to come in. He avoids it. Um, we can see the minimap, so we can see the fact that Dundun is dead, even if he doesn't think he is just yet. Uh, he is just yet dead. Yeah, so I said he, I didn't think he'd get that, because I assumed he would try and avoid dying. But no, 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 no. This be Dundun. Yeah. He actually got a lot of gold from it, to be fair. So in terms of gold, it was worth. And it was for his team as well. Yeah. The selflessness of Dundun. Well, he did get a lot of local gold. I think he cared more about that. Oh, okay, yeah, that's good. Oh, he actually went the Randuins instead of the Frozen Heart. That's kind of surprising. Yeah, it is. It's one of those like team fight jacks items, though, that the active works very, very well. That's so true. I guess there's that. And they already have a uh, frozen heart. Oh, but come I on. yeah, come I on, know. Max. We, we see like seven fro frozen hearts on one team per game. Yeah. Um, I feel like if you could double up and just buy several frozen hearts, each one would reduce attack speed by another twenty percent. Oh, baby. Well, I would just buy five of them. <laughs> oh, it reminds me of you know you see Closer's item right there. It looks very similar to a Hextech Revolver. I loved it when Vladimir had an item build that was just five 1,200 gold items. The yeah. same one. It was beautiful. You never needed to learn anything about the game. You just built green gun and win. Those were some of the best times. It was. It was a beautiful time. I remember, you know, this is such a weird memory to bring up, but one time I played Aram with Arise, and he was just, like, I was wondering when he would stop, but he just kept building rowers. <laughs> I kept stacking them. And, it, you know, he got up to his fourth rower. I'm like, well, I guess he's probably going to build something else to fit that, like a rabbit. Nope, five rowers. Whoa. Did he stack all of them? Uh, no. It's an A-Ram. It doesn't last that long. Uh, yeah, but true. he was working on it. He was doing his best. Yeah, he was ready for that game to go late. Yeah. As Closer could be in trouble. There's uh, a Flash Emperor's Divide, and uh, Shockwave going to find a couple of them. Fiesta now in trouble, but able to offer a fair bit of damage back. Oh, almost cometed to death. That was pretty cool. 
Meanwhile, Clear is doing the yeah. winning the game problem um, that Nongshim may have to deal with. Unless it's more ostrich treatment for the Jacks. It is Dundon going back home, and though. Sand. He's going to look to try and uh, help out. It's certainly one of the strategies yeah. that you can do. Mm. Not very effective. No. The no. thing is, now the tower is gone. Clear can kind of just go take the inhibitor when he's whenever he wants. I I feel like you need at least like three people there to kill him. Oh, like, I, yeah, I maybe think two maybe is enough. four. It depends which three, I guess. Yeah, it definitely depends which three. Uh, Jiwu helps a lot. I think if Jiwu is one of the the three, it makes it a lot easier. If Jiwu's not there, yeah. Mm. And as long as Jiwu uh, has his ultimate available as well, because he could also just instantly die. Which is something that Clear would be keen to do. Now, Fox, clear out all the vision around this Baron. And in fact, there's not a lot of vision left on the map uh, here available to Nongshim. Soul Point also happened at some point um, yeah. during this oh, game. And so, not only is the Jax getting even tankier because of those mountain stacks, but he has now got a Seek's oh, On Guard. God. Yeah. So, uh. Okay. I feel, like, I feel like immortality doesn't do it justice for how uncomfortable this Jax is. Yeah. I think he, he was very frustrated that he died to the turret um, after the solo kill. Yeah, never again. He's like, no, I must make sure. Uh, if he gets another kill, he's legendary, though, and that is pretty impressive here for Clear. Oh, no. As uh, Crashdown comes in, there is no Jax uh, in this fight, and Fox still uh, haven't actually been touched. Yeah, there's the Shockwave. It does find Peter, and that was a really cute little flash there from Willa. It's him over to the other side, but Nongshim, they are scattering. Um, yeah, let's not do the yeah. zoom out because we want to talk about this 4v4. This could be an interesting one as Jiwoo taking so much damage. Yes, the Nexus is dying, but that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. The heal. We're back here. Fiesta oh, also. Handy. Wow, that was obscene. Continuing to scale is closer. Uh, back to back to this then, I guess. As I Clear like is underneath two Nexus turrets and taking next to no damage. I feel like it's more interesting. We don't watch what's happening. That's with what that. I'm saying. Yeah, and yeah. They pan over to him just whacking the Nexus. And they don't even need to pan over. It'll automatically do oh, that yeah, when true. it explodes. It's true. fine. It's it's built into the game. Yeah. Big gold lead. Uh, I want to see the individual gold differences. I want to see what what we're at for this Jax because he is so very farmed right now. Yeah. Does he just complete his Zonias here? He probably does. Unless he sells it and buys, like, a silly item, fun item. That'd be cool. I think he just completed the zonies. It gives so much AP as well. Yeah, and Jax just likes every stat. Yeah, I think that's kind of the beautiful thing with Jax. You can't really go that wrong with builds. Aiming should play Jax. <laughs> Crash down, going to be used here by Sylvie to get himself out of here. And here comes Clear. And uh, we're going to try this team fight once again. As Look at them. He was in amongst four people. Look, oh my goodness, he went down to half health. That's crazy, but he's got a zonies. And Nongshim, they did manage to get a kill here. And now Clear's going to have to get out. Get them back away? Yeah, he does so. Oh. And Shockwave going to be used on a single target. And Fiesta able to get himself away from this one as well. But there's no cooldowns left remaining. Nongshim wanting to go for a bit of a retreat. But that went way better than I was expecting. Yeah, I think what's being cl made clear is five people is enough. In, in terms of dealing with the Jacks, five is like... Oh, oh, oh That's dear. not five, that's three. Yeah, Leap Strike going to be used. Shattering Strike connects here. And can they actually kill him is the question. In comes Fiesta, throws him back forward. But he has the Counter-Strike back up and available once again. Henna trying to get these autos, oh, but there's him. the kill onto the Jax. They take down the Azir in response, but killing the Jax, I thought was going to be impossible for the entirety of this game, and they achieved it. Nongshim pulling the impossible out of nowhere. Raid boss down, they get the will first, and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, it took a lot of effort, you know? A lot of cooldowns being here, I think, initially is a difference maker. The fact that he jumped in, ended up using his ult and the stopwatch and the flash, meant he was easier to kill later. But here, yeah, I just find it crazy how little damage he was taking up front there against an Azir Zaya, who was just so typically good at shredding through targets. And he really took a long time to chunk out. And then here, I wasn't sure if it would be enough, but they just fully commit. Clear, not really able to turn things around there. The TP coming in, it's actually a beautiful shuffle from Fiesta as well. Yeah, it's nicely played. Onto the one target, but that is the one target they needed to get rid of. Absolutely true. Execute just barely mistiming the bubble. Still able to get the kill on the Azir, though. And regardless of that, uh, Fierex still in a pretty good spot in this game. A couple of uh, turrets have, uh, sorry, inhibitors have been removed. 
Uh, there is a Mountain Soul that was denied. Yeah, that's actually big. Yeah, that is big. Um, would really make a hard... I mean, Kanek Rukin plus Mountain Soul... It just takes so much time before you're actually dealing damage to the champion themselves. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 nutty. And it is still likely to happen, right? Nongshim need to take two more. Uh, Firex just need to get into position around a dragon at some point in this game. Should be possible here as the Baron. Still up and available. Four minutes on that next Drake as Henna going aggressive. That's an absurd amount of damage for just a W hit. No, I know Nami obviously used E as well, but still. Six items now completed here for Henna. And I do really like the item build. The, the full crit style will be able to do a fair bit of damage. Uh, and yeah, all that. Employed on the Fiesta. Who's oh. going to get shot? Oh. oh no, Jiwoo! He stepped in just the edge and is taken down. Oh, you can see, I, even though it's the champion doing the walking, I saw the guilt in the stride of the Shuriman Emperor as he was making his way out. Closer saw him as the target, and it's Jiwoo that pays the price. I feel like those situations where you're right on the edge are the worst, because if Jiwoo was firmly in the shockwave radius, he probably would have ulted. Yeah. But when he thinks he's outside, that's when you get baited in. As soon as it connects, that is just over. But do you want to know something crazy? What's crazy? So, take a look at Dundon on the scoreboard. Uh-huh. He's oh. got a bounty. He's got a bounty. <laughs> Does that, that feel okay? That is so Dundon. Oh, yeah. Oh, man, that is so right close. On the edge. Good play, though, from close. I feel like he's been doing a pretty good job of sniping these. But yeah, I just think that bounty looks so crazy. So funny. <laughs> it's very funny. Oh, Zonya is now completed here for clear. So he's got the six items completed as well. Uh, well, getting closer and closer. He can't closer. build any more items. Yeah, he can't become more of a problem until he like sells shoes or sells one of these luxury tank items for more damage or these damage items for more tankiness. Dun -dun. He's also got, you know, well, he's got three and a bit. Uh, it's not looking great uh, as far as Dundun is concerned. He might, might have that bounty, um, but it's not really echoing. Uh, a powerful Aatrox at this stage of the game. Yeah. A lot more work needed, I think, is, is the way I'd describe it. I'd say that too. When it comes Lightning, Willa looking for the opportunity. And Closer can just give him an orb and send him to it. We are able to fall one beautifully. And he is going to continue doing so. Then with a Steric, interesting buy. And the culling just going to soften up the Esther. My goodness, that does so much damage. And now Clear and Dindin sort of fighting, but more just Dindin watching as these inhibitors go down to the jacks. Oh no. Yeah, not There's a lot of damage the, happening here. There's just so little they can do, and the top tower is going down in a second. Okay, they've lost two inhibitors. Top tower is so close to death. Yeah, that is uh, just a hair's breath away. Closer, teleports back in. They, have they to managed eat. to take down the last inhibitor turret. This is close to 40 minutes, this game, even though it does feel like Fox have had a huge lead for the majority. And if you have to close in on this last oh, inhibitor, though, and it's just Nexus hit. turrets in the way. Uh, as soon as Triple Inhib has gone down, it's oh, kind of storm. Mm. That air really uh, took a beating. Unfortunately, now they don't have a pretty pivotal ultimate for this base defense. Dindin loses his Edge of Night as well as Clear, just looking for that moment, looking for that opportunity. The poke damage flying forward. Every time Closer throws this orb around, it is doing massive damage. As the first Nexus turret does go down, Clear is going to teleport back in. They find the knock-up, but Willow is just going to split the fight. Now Clear dives in. He's got his Zonyas already prepared. A shockwave onto two. Both bottom laners taking so much from that one. Dundon trying to be the valiant hero here for Nongshim. And they are standing their ground. They are surviving at least. But their Nexus is getting torn apart, and in goes Clear again. I just don't think this is going to be enough. There's the shuffle. They do manage to pick up Henna. But look at this, some free time with an Nexus, and down it goes. Firex will take game one. Yeah, and I feel like just the, the top gap made this game so impossible. I, yeah. I, I feel like it was a slow build-up. It wasn't the quickest game. Firex definitely didn't push the pace super fast. And I think Nongshim, given how bad the state of the game was, did an okay job of holding on, but they never really found life again. You know, they we just yeah. saw clear. They needed to be you on the challenges uh, co-stream yeah, because like you found life, life, life yeah. five times. Yeah, they they needed some some tricks out of my book, but it just felt like 
what the Jax was just such a problem. The fights were playable if the Jax didn't exist, which yeah. is a not a great caveat to have because then you'd be playing four v five. You'd hope you'd win four v five. And Dundon is a man that we love, right? Uh, he is a fantastic part of Nongshim, um, but he does sometimes just have these stinkers, and this was one of them. Clear, really rolling over the top. It did take a long time. I think that that's something that Fox will definitely be looking at. Um, they would have liked to have closed this one out a little bit earlier, but still, a win's a win, and it did not look very close, especially for the last 20 or so minutes. So, well played to Fear X. They will take game number one, but it's best of three. They'll have to do it again. We're going to go to a short break. When we come back, the space will break down that game. We'll get to game two. See you there. あ、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、ちょっと、
Hello and welcome back to The Space. We're here after game number one of Firex up against Nongshim. And that one was, uh, again, quite a beatdown this time from Firex and Jax. Clear up in the top side doing a great job. I'm still Valdez. With me is Wolf and Chronicler, who will be breaking down the uh, games for us here. You'll see them in, the, in a moment, I promise. Um, let's talk about this draft, guys. What did you guys think about the draft so, to start off? I mean, this game, but before I talk about the draft, I mean, this game was so Firex versus Nongshim. Like, Jung-Hoon dying twice. You and I were predicting it. We were like, oh, I think yeah. he's, he's either so, going to get first blooded or he's going to get first blooded. I was like, next kill, going to be uh, a Fiesta kill in the mid lane solo kill. That happened. Happened. And then uh, din -din things happened also. Like, everything just kind of lined up. Yeah, it was something interesting. was like, Execute's gonna get first blooded or have first blood. I'm like, that guy knows what they're talking about. Like, I don't, I don't know who that was, but you were very on point. And it's really funny because this match went exactly according to that, with the one big surprise, uh, and we'll talk about it later, being that Jax and particularly Clear's performance, the clear that was promised is finally here. The Xinzo, though, I really want to talk about for a little bit. I think outside of that, Nongshim went for a super standard Nongshim draft, a lot of team fighting power. Great front to back with uh, Fiesta on his comfort pick, even though we don't like the Azir. I, I think for Nongshim it makes sense, and Fear X plays something that is incredibly aggressive. But specifically the Zinzao, I think the itemization for tanks right now is so busted. And still this champ seems good every time we see him. I think particularly on future patches when a lot of the tank, like things like Frozen Heart and, and Kenneth Rooker aren't going to get nerfed. I really hope we keep seeing the Zinzo because I do think that in the current meta, he actually is in a great spot and he gets to do so much early game. I mean, the other thing about Xin Zhao is that it doesn't matter whether he has MR, it doesn't matter whether he has armor. When he presses his R button, that's the best armor you're ever going to get. <laughs> That's the one. He yeah. Can't get hurt. When he can't get hurt, it's really nice. I like it when he goes in, he splits the team, and he can't get hurt. That's uh, that's the best armor you can buy. And he's actually threatening, you know, and he can itemize still into those tank items if he would like, which we did see, you know, go Sundered Sky, and then you just go Frozen Heart and Koenig Recurrent, just like everybody else. Um, guys, let's take a look at highlight number one, which was a Jax kill rail. This is basically just the clear show up in the top side. Dun -dun, a little bit known for getting punished in this way, and clear was able to do just that. And for me, this is a really big moment because we haven't really seen, I think, this season. We saw some glimpses of it last split, but that was obviously on a sandbox that was really struggling. Now, as Fair X, we haven't really seen the fact that this player was one of the best tops in Challengers. And he all starts by uh, getting a great dive here. Obviously, one for one, but he still gets the crash. And then from this point on, he takes over the game. And this is also a problem where Sylvie is showing repeatedly while Dundon is in dire need of help. And Sylvie is trying to make plays bottom side and keeps showing himself on wards. So Willer is able to make this play happen here. And one of the problems with Aatrox in general, too, is he's a champion that if he falls behind, he does very little in a draft like this. And so there is no utility to this pick. There's nothing he can do. And he's just making big mistakes up here. And Clear is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So you have a huge problem growing while you're basically losing a champion on your team at the same time. And the reason why it feels so busted, Aatrox specifically, when he's played by Zayus, because Zayus doesn't miss skill shots. But as we saw there, if you're playing against a good player and, and clear out a couple of great sidesteps, plus some misses from Dundon, then all of a sudden, if you miss like one out of your three Qs, or in that case, all of your Qs, that's the end of it. Yeah, and clear will punish you. We did get to see that. That was really nice to see from him. He got very, very fed. And then eventually we got to this uh, mid-fight 23 minutes into the game. And this is kind of where we thought the game was over. The game went to 40 minutes afterwards, so it did take a little while for Firex to actually put the nail in the coffin. But this was a good fight for them. I mean, there's just a lot of things that go wrong here for Nongshim. Um, the Orianna engage is going to be a big one here, and obviously Clear is just so fed at this point in time, he doesn't really take damage. And even though Hanna took a lot of his health in damage and does step a little bit too far forward here, he is, uh, you know, unfortunately going to take a ton and get taken out. But the rest of the team just cannot deal with Clear whatsoever, and he's just sitting here at full health for the entirety of the rest of this fight. There was another fight that happened bottom side as well, where Nongshim ended up trying to make a play with Fiesta and it just totally went wrong and this this Jax just became too big of a problem to deal with. And what I want to highlight, even though obviously we voted clear, like it, this was, game was all about clear and I think that the biggest criticism of Fear X would be that they didn't know how to use this fed Jax, which is why the game lasted as much longer as it did, it was also uh, just the synergy between Willer and the uh, closer shown with that little combo there with the double R as well. Yeah, absolutely. I was kind of surprised Nongshim kind of just stood there and said like bring it on in that moment, but either way, it did end up working out for the side of Fear X. Guys, we have our PRG on the side of the team. Let's see who does pick it up for this game number one. It will be clear. 
And it is his first POG so far, but a good POG at that nine kills in this game. That POG profile pick as well. You guys saw that. That was, uh, yeah. that was looking slick. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the guy had a lot of help, obviously, not in, so much in this moment, but uh, in the follow-up moment where Willer comes in there, which we'll skip here. Um, this dude didn't, didn't kind of missing a lot, but, you know, we'll look past that. It wasn't really about these moments that was POG worthy. He got ahead, but then his team fighting and his setup for counter strikes in moments like this uh, were, I think, what was more impressive. But the game was quite literally all about him. And I wonder, I think given how uh, how fed he got, it will just be a good old 12 out of 12. Not surprising there. If if he didn't get as fat as he did, I think it might have been some split votes. Wheeler, I think, had a really good game as well. Uh, but outside of that, let's be honest, the game was all about him. All that you want to see for Firax in game number two is you guys a little bit uh, better actually really allow this Jax to shine in the 1v1 a little bit safer, which they don't do because they're Firax, so I know why I'm asking. <laughs> It's a, it's a good ask, though. Uh, guys, we do have a substitution for game number two. Fiesta is out, Call Me is in, and the Fiesta experiment for this series is done for now. Last week, I was really calling for Fiesta. I was like, I, I think they need to give him a shot. Um, that first game, unfortunately, though, did not uh, really go the way that I was hoping it was going to if Fiesta returned because Call Me had a bit of a rough one last week. But I think this is a good call. Give him another shot. Uh, I hope it goes better than what we saw in game one. Uh, but it's tough to say as Kalmi is still finding his footing here in the LCK. Yeah, and uh, Nongshim will move over to the blue side for this next game as well. But guys, we are done here on the space. Let's go back to the casters for game number two. Thank you so much, astronauts, for the breakdown of game number one. And yes, here we are, ready to call me once again. Um, I was, yeah, we, we mentioned the amount of whelmed that we were after the draft. I think that the worst part of it was the Azir being picked. Of course, Kormi's most played is also Azir. I don't know whether that's going to change, but maybe they have more scrim time with Kormi playing Corky, and he's not just going to fall through the draft again, which I think would be kind of crazy. Picking it into Fear X is a weird thing, right? Because they do like to play so fast and loose. In the early game, we might see what happened in our previous series from DRX, where the Corky has like half an item and then the game's over. Yeah, I think Oriana was a big problem. Closer seemed so comfortable on it, was consistently finding these big shockwaves and just decimating. You know, that was a big moment as well, the pick on a Jiwu with the, the Oriana, but the laning phase was just so advantageous. So regardless of what Nongshim up to do, I don't think they should let Closer get Oriana again. Yeah, I think that might be a good idea. We'll see whether they do opt into a ban like that. Is LeBlanc going to be taken away here? Might be angling for a first pick, Oriana, as well, uh, because they do have the blue side now. Uh, we saw the Lucian first pick, though, last time, and uh, the follow-up was Zaya Rakan, much to our chagrin. Um, but could just be a little bit of an adjustment, a little bit of a rearrangement of when champions are going to be picked and which ones, and that would be nice, in my opinion. So LeBlanc, center. And then the Poppy is going to continue to be banned here. Uh, the Vi was another one, um, and then Varus. But this time, we're going to be banning the Talia. Currently, half of uh, the Talia games that Colmy's played were wins. Um, a sample size of two. Love to see it. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to just put some pressure down. It's interesting we don't see the Oriana ban. So I wonder if Nongshim are going to first pick the Oriana. Milio is still open and available, but Lucian banned away does lower the priority on that. Yeah, last ban. Ban ends up being. Vi, perhaps? Vi could make sense. Um, I don't think what else was really substantial for... Hmm, the Varus, no, okay. Varus, yeah, finally box standard. And it is going to be that Oriana Facebook. So I like that. I think that was the right call. I think Oriana's so obnoxious on lane, scales so well. It's not really too many... I, I can't think of many bad things to say about Oriana, other than I guess she's a mobile, so if you get on top of her, you can blow her up. But that that's kind of like the only weakness I feel like she has at the moment. And I guess Ranger, Ranger is no longer, so into poke, she can be a struggle. True. Um, ooh, is it just going to be the other side of the coin? As the Rakan currently being hovered here. Oh, there is a Callista up and available that they could go towards if they would like to. Not opting into it. Maybe picking away Zinzao could be an option here. Maybe just locking in the Vi for Willa. Or just go for the Zaya Rakan. You could do that too. I quite like Callista Rakan. I like uh, having Callista when executes on the team um, because it means he doesn't die all the oh. time. But instead, it will be this Zaya Rakan. What compels a team to pick Rakan Zaya, not Zaya Rakan? Um, it's on the same rotation, you know? 
I think willingness to play a re relatively mediocre bottom lane is probably what does it. Yeah. Well, we see Jinx Tom come out, so playing really to that range, and you have a lot of protection already with the Orianna, obviously a, a mid laner who can provide that shielding and also a pretty good peel with the ultimate. And now that Tom can safety net, but we do see that rumble locked in, and considering how top lane was already a rough point for Dundun, this, this is a worrying look, so... Now we have the opportunity for Fairax to target some of those top laners they don't want to put this Rumble up against. And I know that we've seen Rumble actually picked into Udyr quite a bit, but I, I think getting rid of anything that is relatively easy to bypass the lane on um, is a good option. They are instead going to get rid of the Aatrox, which is what Dundun went for last time, but Clear dealt with very easily. Uh, just to, to make sure that he comes up with something else. Akali going to be banned away. I was wondering what Closer was going to go with as far as his answer to the Orianna. Um, I thought about Orianna, uh, so thought about Akali, but I don't know whether Akali would even have that much of a good time, especially in the early stages uh, against the Orianna. But Colmy just wanting to remove it. Closer, a great Akali player just in general. So not wanting to let him play it. Nocturne going to come out. Makes sense. Nocturne and Orianna, just such a obnoxious combo. But I'm just surprised the Vi has been... Oh, yeah. The thing is, I don't think Fear X picking Vi is that great because you're into Tom Kench. No, exactly. You can always pop it. It's no worries. I think Xin Zhao would still be absolutely fine. Uh, splitting up the team from their Tom Kench could certainly be a way to win a team fight and allow Closer to grab that counter pick. Could be a potential here. Um, Corky is still up and available, um, by the way. But against Oriana, you do feel pretty awkward. And that is Cassante. Yeah, so... So unless we're rumbling in the jungle, uh, it's uh, going to be a Cassante mid. Interesting. Yeah. I feel like Oriana is not going to struggle too much with that. I don't think she's going to have too much of a bad time, so... Not sure what to make of it. We'll see how it pans out. Look at the other side. We see actually the Viego locked in. So, obviously seeing it being pretty successful recently, I'd say, in like the past couple of days. Yep. Uh, pretty fast clear time, so Kurz used the great effectiveness. And then the Gnar coming in. And there's the Silas. So Rumble is being at least considered for the jungle. Oh, love it. There it is. It's the closer special. And he, I mean, Willa does need to play the skin. If you don't play Rumble in the jungle, in the jungle, yeah. then you lose. I, I think it's really just, it, it's always what happens. So Super Galaxy is for the top lane. Rumble in the jungle is for the jungle. Peanut knows this. That's why he won a lot of games on Rumble Jungle. Um, and we'll just see whether uh, Willa is going to do the same thing. Otherwise, it's kind of a foregone conclusion that we're heading to game three. Yeah, a lot of dive threat on the side of Fair X. You know, it really feels like this is a comp that I very much attribute to how they like to play. Oh, yeah. Where they're like, we just want to go in, skill check you. Whereas Nongshim have a lot more in terms of sort of scaling protections. One thing I'm wondering is, I mean, Nar can have a really rough time into Aurelia. Later on in the side lane, the Aurelia can just completely bully him out. So 1-3-1 might end up being a pretty big issue in this game. Certainly could. And I'm interested to see where the lane is going to go as well. You could just put closer towards that top side and then opt in for the Aurelia versus Nar matchup. We've seen Aurelia work in that instance, and we know just how good closer is on the champion. That's why Firex often just see random Aurelia bans, because this is his favorite champ. He is the, the Aurelia one-trick guy, and he's back on it once again. I think this is a really cute flex in this draft. Remember, it was picked third. The, the rumble, and then you escape a lot of the bands. Really, really cool. So let's jump onto the Rift here for game number two, see how it works. Okay, here we are, ladies and gentlemen. Ready to get into it. See whether Nongshin can bring us further. Yeah. Bring us to that game three that we'd all love to see. Jinx into Zaya is tried and true. That one certainly works out. Very solid. I'm glad we've seen Execute on a engaged champion, though. I feel like his worst performances have been on, like, Enchanters. And Ghost is kind of just going to get Henna out of here. But, you know, a little bit of a chunk. Burn of Summoner. It's not the most impactful, but definitely a positive. 
Just Peter getting a good angle there with the Q from the Tom Kench. Oh, whoa, flashes everywhere as Colmy's getting welcomed to the rift uh, in the worst way possible. He is really dead. And that is not the way that you wanted to see it go down. Execute is the one that picks up the kill. So that is suboptimal. But uh, sharing around a bunch of that assist gold. And Nongshim, it felt like they had pressured them out. But unfortunately, they didn't check all their angles. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. If Closer had been the one to get the kill, I think Call Me might just pause and ask for Fiesta to come back in and be like, nah. Yeah. yeah take I this know. one. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Has to burn TP already. Yeah. That's nutty. All right. Just such that that ward is so greedy, so deep, you know. They're like you could have put it over the wall into the wolves and not nearly had to go as deep and had the blast cone to back you up. Just far too deep, I feel, and gets punished for it. Yeah, maybe they just thought they had more information than they did, and Willow was waiting for a uh, blue side start. So it's a little bit sad here for Cormy. Does teleport back to the lane and now doesn't have his flash into an Aurelia, but still. You should have lane advantage, especially here, as you can see. Huge minion wave stacked up, and Close are not going to be able to fight him for the minute. Let's find himself a cheeky little stun. Yeah, that's the thing with the Aurelia is until level 3, you're not posing that much threat. I mean, level 2 has a decent all-in, but really, you want to be able to reveal your abilities. Although at this point, where you can just kind of queue to the minions, you are able to sustain through a lot of damage, level 3 hit, and... <laughs> Call me instantly just backs off like, nah, I've seen this before. I am not interested. This is where the pause comes in. He's like, oh, I'll deal with it until level three. And then we out. Um, speaking of out, that's not Sylvie. He's in this bottom lane and Execute and Henna are in trouble. There's a teleport to the bottom lane oh. as close as like, I want this one. And already Sylvie's dead. But at least they didn't give a kill to the Aurelia. Now call me, remember, doesn't have flash. And Will is just going to flash on top of him. And he's dead. Wow. Huh. Well, at least the Aurelia doesn't have a kill. True. <laughs> um, that was possibly... I don't know how to phrase it, but it was not a great passage of play. Yeah. Not, um, a, not a great passage of play for the side of Nongshim. I would put it in the cons column. This, um, most I absolutely. Just, See I it mean, again. It's very ambitious. And also, no, Peter doesn't have the great health. So it's, he can't tank as much as he wants. Sylvie gets aggro because of the red buff, but like they were so unclose to getting that dive. <laughs> <laughs> I love the use of unclose there because I don't think any other phrase would have uh, would have done it as Willa you know, with the big old drill. He does have the wrong skin, so technically they should yeah, lose this game, but they're not doing a very good job of that. Yeah. I think I'm pretty hyped over that one. I'd feel pretty hyped. You know, 1 0 up already. And again, this game has pretty big ramifications for Fair Axe. Pushing on towards the western side. Oh, yeah. With D plus dropping down, ample opportunity for Fear X to really make headway. So. It might be Fear X and Kwandong. Maybe D plus don't even make it to playoffs. It's, that mean, would be crazy. There are, also, there are crazy outcomes that could be possible. I feel like for such a long time, it's kind of been, you know, everyone looks at the start of the season, you look at the teams, and you go, right, well, this is the left side, this is the right side. We get the one bonus one in playoffs, but it's a realistic oh. outcome. Oh. Call me again in a little bit of trouble here as Close is diving in. Grand Entrance is going to miss, and there is the Abyssal dive. Sylvie coming on over, finds some decent damage, and Execute should be taken down here. Sylvie grabs that kill, and Closer is able to limp away. Nice play here from Nongshim. Good reactive work in the mid lane. Yeah, good from Call me as well. The movement speed for the distortion coming in at just the right time to get him to a safe position. Could have been devastating there, but ultimately, Call me gets out, turnaround play comes in, and I feel like that is a much needed turnaround uh, at this point of the game. Oh yeah. I think any any anything more going in Fear Axe's direction could have been a bit of a disaster. And icing on the cake, mm -hmm. they get the void bubs. Oh baby. There we go. So Sylvie able to lock those down. We do have some uh, steel caps picked up by Dindin, but let's have a look at this replay one more time. Peter and Sylvie in good position to answer this play. Yeah, and I think just the distortion speed came in at a really unfortunate time uh, for executing. You know, it is hard to connect the uh, Grand Entrance onto mobile targets. Uh, I believe it was also the phase rush from Call Me that came through. So like the double whammy of that movement speed. It's, it's, hard, it's hard. It's hard to connect against that. And then as soon as that W missed, Closer wasn't level six, wasn't able to follow up more, and the turnaround comes through.
Might be that uh, pretty soon there is going to be an opportunity execute currently level 4, but when he does have that level 6, it'll be more difficult for Colmy to uh, get out of that situation. He will have Flash, though, for what feels like the first time this game. And that has just come off cooldown now. So that's certainly good, but now he's going to get stunned, and this could just be it. There's the ulti from Closer. Sylvie, he comes forward. That's a cute little flash. As now Colmy's walking the wrong direction, oh. and the W comes through. Harpoon lands onto Sylvie as well. And I think Closer might just be happy with this. Sylvie so able to dash his way out, but this Aurelia is starting to become an issue. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. He looks rather good in this champion. He is pretty uh, good at this champion, yeah. Ankle's broken for Nongshim's mid-jungle there. I feel like he kind of just played it as, as basically as perfectly as you could. Bit of misdirection going back to the minions and then the re-engage, the flash out from the stun from Sylvie. Just so well played. And I feel like you have to do a lot of work on a champion like Aurelia in the mid lane. Going up against a champion like Orianna. Oh yeah. You get harassed, you can get bullied. Yes, once you're fed, you can roll over the lane, but when you're not super far ahead, it does take work to get a solo kill and you can see that coming yeah, out here. Oh, very nice that we're getting the point of view. Yeah, lands the initial stun, goes for the ult, and then sees that the Viego is coming, flashes the stun again, and then gets the W and the auto to finish off. Oh, that's that's very clean. The fact that he sees him charging the Q, so he's well prepared to get that flash off, and then, oh, we're we seeing it again. Alrighty, um, doesn't have ulti this time. Now it's, you know, I said before he had to do so much work to get the solo kill. Not so much anymore. Now he's just in a pretty good spot. Yeah. Uh, so call me not having fun, but I, I feel like there's no no criticisms at all for that solo kill from close. It was perfect, I have to say. And now freezing the wave here. Oh god. Oh man, is an Orianna. You know, call me just have to recall and TP back in. He just got back to lane. Well, uh, they're going to look for another stun. They don't find it there. Sylvie dives in. Good knock-up on the Tom Kench is now Willa. He finds an equalizer, and Peter, he is just burning down. Shockwave is used. It just doesn't really do anything. And now Closer's looking for even more. The W is channeled. They do turn on him, and he should be taken down as Jiwoo turns up to save the day. Nice play there, and giving the kill to Jiwoo is massive, because as you can see, he's already having a good time in this lane. Yeah, really huge one from Jiwoo, and I feel like the two factors that kind of didn't help for X there was Execute not having ult yet, and Close's ult wasn't available, so felt like they were just missing the little oomph in the play, and I, I feel like that has to be the reason why, especially when you're playing with a Rumble, having like the Rakan ultimate, or even just the slow from the Aurelia ultimate to keep them locked into the equalizer can make such a big difference. Yeah, I think uh, Vanguard's Edge equalizer combo is pretty very, cheap. very powerful yeah. uh, if you can actually make that one work out. But you do need to have those buttons available as Meganar was hit, but we're into a replay and we're going to check it out one more time. Missing the stun as well. I mean, there are a lot of things that really contributed to this. Yeah, and I feel like Closer was very non-committal at first, using the minions to dodge the Shockwave, but it's at this point. All the minions have died. You can see one left, but it's about to fade out. And Closer ends up queuing on to Call Me without anything to reset the cooldown. So at that point, he's fully committing, and Jiwoo just comes in at the perfect oh. time. Linden is going to survive, walks his way out, does have to use his flash in trade for the Ghost, and Willa's flash as well. So actually a positive trade uh, for the top laner of Nongshim. And this Nara is working out so much better than the Aatrox was in the previous game. Um, would be difficult for it to go um, more poorly than that, uh, to be perfectly honest with you. Oh. As Super Mega Death Rocket going to be flying forward, 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 and... Nearly. Nearly stopped the recall from player. Went, went for it um, and didn't quite work out. They do get a fair bit of information, but um, the information is mainly about their own team, so never it's mind. It's like an Ash E, but way higher cooldown. <laughs> yeah. Um, and would theoretically do damage if uh, if that was a thing. As Okay, Closer once again doesn't find the stun, but that's non-committal, right? And uh, Colmy is not allowed to walk up to the minion wave. Yeah, it's so scary. And I'm glad we're seeing a matchup actually punishing the Orianna, because I feel like she's kind of just been an early blind that's gone un unchallenged. Yeah. Well, she kind of beats out a lot of the mages, really comfortable, scales very well. And we're seeing Closer bring out one of his signature picks to say, actually, you can't just do what you want in this lane. Yeah. If and you auto me, I will kill you. And all right, Execute looks for the grand entrance and he'll find it here. Jiwoo is by himself and Execute tanks the turret. And one more hit and Henna locks it down. Beautifully played. The coordination between these two players who have barely ever played together uh, is starting to look better and better. Yeah, yeah. Definitely some good plays where you see them on the same page, but here it was just Really powerful uh, engage coming out from Execute. 
And Hannah doing pretty much everything uh, under the tower to make sure he gets that kill. Laying all the feathers down, you could see Jiwoo was trying to go for the turnaround kill and execute. And it ended up costing him. Yeah, yeah just kind of not there. Uh, no, no other way to phrase it. Uh, Willow is spotted. And now Closer could be in a bit of trouble. Shockwave does come down, but he was channeling the W. We'll see whether that keeps him alive. As there's the Equalizer Vanguard's Edge combination. Peter going down very, very low, and this time he will die. Sylvie tries to get the Heartbreaker for the Executor onto Closer. It doesn't work out. Wouldn't have done enough damage anyway. And Jiwoo is running up, throwing zaps left and right. It's not really going to do too much. So now, second Drake of the game should go over to Fear X. They're going to continue their onslaught. It felt like there was a little bit of a speed bump in the game. Um, as Execute finds Sylvie, uh, who is going to get a bunch of his health back, sure. He'll be fine. Yeah, we did see the Vanguard's Edge uh, Equalizer combo there. Pretty pretty strong. Yeah, it wor worked stay. quite well. Uh, yeah, very effective. I, I think is is a statement I would make around that situation. It is going to be... Uh, Mountain Soul. Mountain Soul. So, a lot of extra durability. I think Nongshin would love to have a Mountain Soul in this situation. Um, I think they'd like to have a lot of things in this situation, <laughs> Orcs. Yeah. We'll make a list, I, yeah. I think. I think two wins in a row in this series would be Probably relatively up high up there. Yep. Yeah, I, I think that's valid. I think that's fair. We'll see the replay at the engage and execute just standing back. Waits out the flash as well. Goes over the chompers. And here you can see G would try to get the trade back. Ends up uh, repositioning to where Hannah just has all the feathers stacked up in here. Yeah, Peter, not the best engage pick with the Tom Kench. They do a lot of damage to Closer. And then the E comes in to keep the Oriana healthy. But the problem is the Oriana's the one doing damage. So it kind of just guarantees Peter goes down for free. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have eaten the Oriana, but I just think the whole pay play was not a great plan. No. And uh, they, they're, they're desperate to try and do something, right? To stop this snowball from uh, falling too far down the mountain. But it is almost a foregone conclusion at this point. You can see 1,000 gold to lead for Closer. Lead the King now complete as well. That's a big spike for Aurelia. And 45 CS left on the cull that he also has. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Uh, what's um, item number two for the Aurelia these days? It's been a while. Um, Does he just Sundered Sky? Do you just go... <laughs> Frozen Heart Rukun? Uh, I don't think you're Frozen Heart Rukun. I think you probably just go Bruiser items. I feel like a lot of champions just go on that. Yeah. Um, especially like with Aurelia, since they changed it so her ult like reduces her Q cooldown. If you get a hefty amount of ability haste, you can kind of just Q normally without having to like get resets later in the game. It's it's pretty disgusting. No, that is pretty absurd. He actually um he builds a bunch of different items. I feel like you know Closer has played so much Aurelia, he's just happy to mix it up as Equalizer comes through Nongshim. It's going to burn down. I mean, Jiwoo, I mean, that was just equalizer damage. And now he's at 50%. That's a bit sad. Yeah, I think it's kind of situational, the Aurelia, where you can really lean into different builds. Wit's End is a pretty good option um, into a fair bit of magic damage, but it is really just Calm that he's dealing with there. Probably Dindin in a side lane that he'll have to worry about, as that is the Featherstorm now that's going to be used. And Execute going to try and stop Calm from coming on over. Virex really not pulling the trigger though, is now Dundun trying to get in a position for a Nah, but that Nah bar is dwindling. Execute and Virex know that they can just fight. Execute still has ult on this flank. Like, you can see Kormi trying to zone him away, but if Execute gets in here, it could be massive. Yeah, Kormi does find a dissonance, doesn't really do too much here to Execute though, as the Rift Herald is going to be secured, and now Execute looks for it, goes for that engage, closer. Wanting to find the opportunity, doesn't get there though. Vanguard's Edge just hits the wind and now Clear is going to pay for their sins. Does try to get out, but it's not going to work. It's Sylvie that locks up the kill on the Cassante and now Willa is running. Execute, can you actually stop this as, oh, that's a decent little attempt, but he may still die. Never mind, Blast Cones exist. Shout out to Valdez there, who probably feels fantastic about that one being used to break up the team fight. And Closer. Is up the wave and Firex, they just lose their top laner in that instance. But I actually kind of thought that they'd be able to find a little bit more of a fight. You miss Vanguard's Edge though, and the Aurelia feels a little bit muted. Just feel, felt like they struggled to find the right setup, but I think part of it was the only person on the flank was this Rakan, who wasn't really posing too much threat to the Oriana, and everyone else was kind of all grouped on the other side. It just felt like the coordination wasn't quite there. Normally, when we see compositions like this, a big hallmark is having attacking from multiple angles and people getting the timing right. But we kind of see here, you know, X being zoned away. 
Spherex are the ones who are on the objective. XQ tries to go for the Orianna, but the stun from Sylvie blocks it. And then the rest of Spherex are like, right, well, we just been two of our biggest tools. I guess we just run. Yeah. And uh, Clear just got caught in the crossfire. Good positioning from Nongshim, though, and the close-in was great. I think making the sacrifice and making sure that they just don't go for the Herald and they look for it. Oh, dead. He's really big-time dead. Um, big-time dead. Not sure about that one, Atlas. Let's, uh, let's think about our words a little bit more in the future. But I'll have I some opportunities there. Accurately. Yeah. Was big time dead. Yeah, he, he was really dead. And Henna really flashed. Uh, Super Mega Death Rocket comes on forward as well, and that is going to be a Pistol Dive picking up the kill there by Peter. So Nongshim answering back nicely here. As Henna's getting punished. Execute now on a ward, but closer is uh, killing turrets. And the 4-1 is still very, very scary. Yeah, I mean, the timing was really good there. The ult just came up like five seconds after Henna died, so great timing. The side lane pressure of this Aurelia is problematic, but taking down the AD carry, I think, puts Nongshim in a pretty good spot to just take this dragon. Yeah, and starting to stack up these Mountain Drakes, really important for this squad. They are going to be able to do so. So no teleport for Closer, no chance for them to do anything about this Drake going over. Just going to have to look for Soul Point next time around. As uh, call me, the old court doing the vision thing. It's kind of reminiscent. Level 1 as Execute just uh, corrals the Orianna towards the Death Chamber. Once again, nicely done here by uh, Sylvie. And the Super Mega Death Rocket makes sure that at least Jiwoo gets an assist. Yeah, I love the flash. And then to get the flash out of Henna holding holding the W to get the stun afterwards. Really well played. Uh, pretty solid execution on both sides to get those picks. Uh, and the Dragon being picked up for Nongshim is the main thing. You can actually see in terms of gold, it's only Closer who actually has a substantial lead over his counterpart. Yeah. Um, top lane, Dundon's actually ahead, and everyone else is, is pretty, pretty much even. Um, it is a 2,000 gold lead for the Orianna, uh, for, for the Aurelia. Um, so that is, um, it's, a, it's a big number. But if they can actually deal with her, and that's, uh, well, Colmy is not really dealing with too much here, as Clear is just doing Cassante things. Um, find yep. you, and back to the mini wave. Well, you remember I was talking about <laughs> the 1 through yeah. 1 being an issue. Uh, you didn't specify which champion, um, and that is maybe for good reason. Yeah, so one of them is Aurelia, who's obviously able to dash around a load, do a ton of damage, hard to kill. The other one's Cassante, who's able to dash around a bunch, do a tons of damage, and it's hard to kill. Ah, got it. Um, that's cool. That that really does um, make it make it different. As Dindin finding some hyper procs here on the closer. Meganar, of course, is a way to deal with Aurelia, and even finding the ice cube here. Well played. W going to come through. That should mitigate a little bit of it. And not able to find him with the wallop. So this is a huge turnaround for Dindon. This is much, much better from game number one. May not necessarily be enough to pick up the win, but good to see him bounce back. And we know that this guy, I mean, mental isn't even a conversation that we have when it comes to when it comes to Dindon. He's just unaffected. He, he can, he can back. Yep, he can just he can feed completely in one game, and then it's mental reset immediately afterwards. And this was really nicely timed. The ult, yeah. as the wave came in, as soon as that happens, it's just so, it's so over. Even finding that last Q, not going to be able to speed himself out of that one. And so it is a Sundance guy coming in, so whew. broken bruise right in. Yep. And now it's probably Frozen Heart. Right? Uh, could go like a Black Fever. I would like it. I'd like it if he just kept doing uh, damagey things. I mean, like that build, like Black Fever and then Frozen Heart Kernick is like a pretty solid full build. Yep. Could go defensive early if you felt like you needed it. But uh, yeah, it would end up being a very bulky Aurelia. Yeah, and at this point, you know, uh, two items now completed compared to the one and a bit uh, that Colmy has. And a lot of it is utility as well in the Seraphs and now with the Oblivion Orb coming on in. Clear and Dindin just going to butt heads momentarily. And Willa waiting on the side. Does have level 2 equalizer. Fair bit of extra power here. And Dindin might even face check. Oh. oh dear. Able to use the crush. Gets himself out of the way. Good heads up play. Playing carefully. And Henna. Blade cooler now on cooldown. But a teleport is coming forward. And this is Closer making his way in. The orb is going to come down. Dissonance slows up Closer. But you can see he's just not really too phased by it. And as soon as these teleports come in, as soon as the Aurelia is on screen, Nongshim 
you can feel it. They play so much more defensively, understanding exactly what kind of threat he poses. I do think Firax haven't quite gotten like the coordination yet when they start to set up for a team fight. You know, you can see they you know what they want, you can sense their intent from how they're playing, but Nongshim are doing a good job to respond and back away and with the Oriana, with the, the Tom Kench, it, it isn't easy. And if you make a mistake, if you overstep and Nongshim get resets, like between a Viego and a Jinx, if one person dies, that could just be the fight over. Yeah. So far really working out. Henner, of course, uh, one of his favorite champions is this uh, Zaya. We were very upset uh, when he was on Bro and he kept playing Lethality Zaya. Thankfully, that's not a thing anymore. Um, but oh, has a that. lot of practice on this champion. Man, wasn't it? It was just a... I, I still don't even really know what the purpose of Lethality Zaya is. I mean, there was that point where it was really broken and then they nerfed it. Yeah, but then it, then it kept getting played over and over again. Yeah. Like, it was super overtuned, and then they kind of gutted it. Um, yeah. And then it still kept getting played. It was a bit weird. Yeah, it was a sad time. But I uh, don't want to reminisce on times like that. We want to be talking about times like these, yeah, which is... Yeah, crit, Zaya. Yeah. And it, it just it feels better to be able to actually do damage with some of these feathers flying around. Fox now looking for the soul point, and may not be able to do it with uh, Clear missing a ghost now. And he does definitely need to go for a reset. Let's have a couple of items. It's feeling all right, but you can see Dindon with his Black Cleaver yeah, and his no, Trinity Force feeling great. And yeah, they are going to give it up because uh, Call Me is in the bottom lane and Jiwoo is trying to take down this turret. Execute going to block a Super Mega Death Rocket by accident. And Nongshim. On purpose. Yeah, they grab themselves this outer turret in the mid lane. There's a flash forward from Executor. Sylvie will get charmed, but there's the eat from Peter. Teleport to come in and now Nongshim. A re-engage possibility as well as executes the target. They will take him down. Beautifully played. Now Dindon on the flank angle. Not a lot of Narbar, but he's building it, building it, building it. And Henna oh. just destroyed. All right, Nongshim. They just stand their ground and say, bring it. And Fox says, well, we'll try, but we won't be able to. Dindon just styled on Henna. Henna had flash on ult and just didn't expect to be taken down there. And now five members to two. That's just barren, Nongshim. On a dime, like they didn't contest the, the dragon, and they just find a perfect team fight. That was absolutely gorgeous. Let's have a look at it once again, because I think the strategy to kill Henna was just keep auto attacking. Yeah, I mean, this was a. Like, Execute played it pretty well in terms of dealing with Sylvie's cooldowns, but the ult from Peter blocks it. They get the Risa here, so I'm, I'm looking at Henna. And that last Hyper proc, I think, just did way more damage yeah, than Henna expected. expected. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, he did way more damage than I expected. Because, uh, yeah, he had an old time flash and just didn't use it. He just popped. You can see Irene very, very happy. And uh, Fiesta's there, like, oh man, <laughs> that's a tough series. And it absolutely is. It's not over yet. It's probably still. Like, I'm glad I'm not 0 5 on Aurelia on a yeah. right now into an Aurelia. He's just sitting there thinking, was I the problem? <laughs> <laughs> Well, he was the only opportunity uh, to mix things up, and I think that that's what Nongshim were struggling with, right? Wanted to make sure that they had the right team atmosphere. So, right now, in a great position. Baron now stacking up. Power play only at 1,500, but they have two minutes to utilize it. And they are getting a ton of vision here in this bottom side jungle. That will mean transition between the inner and mid lane and the inner in bot lane. Try and break these two down get all of that extra gold. In the meantime, you can see Closer with Teleport at the ready up in this top lane. Just getting that shove on. Might even be able to take this turret if given a fair bit of spare time. You know what's crazy is, is will it just finish on yours? And I feel like he's been on an item and a half for such a long time. Yeah. And he's only just completed his second item. Well, turret for turret is the trade. One of them is the inner though. Yeah, a lot more gold value. And typically harder to take. See Closer stealing away the Gromp there. And the Gnar has been sent to answer. Uh. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Uh, Sylvie's going to have to use the Heartbreaker. Uh, Quickness going to come down. There's the Equalizer. Sylvie should just be dead here. That's one Baron taken down. Jiwoo could be in trouble here as Hanna. He's um, not exactly as durable as he wants to be. Executed in a similar boat as the Zap connects onto Willa. But now Closer has made his way in clear as well. This kiting from Jiwoo is working out nicely. Super Mega Death Rocket is optimistic. And Fox may have just bought them some valuable space. You can see this uh, Rebel Baron power play at two minutes to go on that uh, Baron clock. It was sitting at 1,500, and that number is going down.
Yeah, I mean, honestly, it looked a little bit goofy. Execute flashing away from the stun. But the turnaround makes sense. And I think Execute's doing a good job of understanding the Viego, uses the W, forces the ult, and then charms to get the follow-up CC. Charms everyone up. But you can see Henna knowing the limits, getting the root here, not going too much further. Willa isn't able to finish off Jiwoo from over the wall, but big summoners burn here on top of the kill they got. Really yeah. helps deny Nongshim using Last of the Baron. Uh, not going to be able to see Rudolph actually pick up a kill there, so going to be once again polluting the skies of Runeterra with another Super Mega Death Rocket continuing to just travel around and around with all those enchanted crystal arrows as well. And I think this is a point where Jiwoo doesn't have flash. Unfortunately, you do have to deal with the, the prospects of Tom Kench as well, but Fairex, one more dragon will get them sold. If they can secure that, it will make such a big difference. And the Baron is now done. And the gold lead has moved a little bit in favor of Nongshim, but 1.5k, something like that. I think this is still a very honest game of League of Legends between the two teams. Clear, wanting to be that front line. Sylvie engages on him. He almost takes a damage. Doesn't even have two of the broken items yet. He's gone for the uh, Frozen Fist and the Rookern. Sorry, the... Uh, what is it? The Jack shows? Yeah. Jack is showing you his item. Yes, indeed. Um, does... He's very, very close to the uh, Frozen Heart. As I hold my thought, there's a good engage on to Peter Equalizer as well as Jiu has to get out of the way of that one. There's the Feather Storm as Henna doesn't get hit by that Super Mega Death Rocket. And now it's clear and execute, trying to be that front line. Clear, also doing some work here, but closes out of the fight. But no, they expose Jiwu. And it's clear that does come in. Still very low health bars. And Dundon, is he going to be the savior of this team? That's the question. Willa locks down one kill under Peter, but Dundon, he's finding it. He's doing it. And the wallop comes down. It's a triple for this Nar, and he might be the savior for Nongshim. What a redemption arc for Dundon after, honestly, a very poor game one. Game two, he is the driving force. Fearax get everyone so low. Looks like they're going to be able to take the team fight, but the Gnar comes through strong, able to follow through, and now Dragon secured and the fight win. You can see Henna flashes on Jiwu so aggressive here. But Fortune doesn't manage to get the damage down, does have to ult, and then dodge, does dodge away from the Super Nether Mega Death Rocket. But then in the ensuing fight, you can see you know, a lot of health bars starting to get chunked out by Fearax, and then the re engage from Willer and Claire to take out the Jinx. It looks favorable, but Dundon is just so strong still, and he's stacking up the mega, mega bar here. Gets close, and uh, close and execute just end up a bit too close to the wall. Man, what a beautiful team fight here from Dundon. And they just weren't able to do it. And I feel like even though this Aurelia did get very strong, was able to pick up an extra kill even in that fight, now has a death stance. He just got so low that he couldn't re-engage. Yep. Yep. That's the problem, like, you're getting chunked out pretty consistently. The Orianna, even though it's 0, 6, 7 Orianna, it's doing actually a fair amount of damage. And there isn't really much magic which is picked up by the side of Fair X. So if you just get hit by, like, one QW from Orianna, that's so much health lost going into the next fight. Yeah, I do think that, you know, if Closer had gone for something like a Wit's End, well, he is going to go for a team fight now. Trying to find the angle. Clear, not quite getting on top of them. And Closer puts that teleport on cooldown and really find too much joy for it. Yeah, the concept was fine, but very hard to find these engages when there's a Tom Kench there offering that, that safety net. And also they just saw it come and disengage the left side uh, of the mid lane. So those are still looking for a window. There's minions there now to dash to. Yeah. And execute. Oh dear, he just blows up. Not going to find the opportunity to get in there. Looks a little bit silly as he gets stunned immediately. Equalizer not also doing what it wants to do. And Closer keeping his health bar high, but clear not so lucky. Doesn't find the stun. And Firex just lose two members for free. Longstream just too many tools to disengage. And the Orianna, as I said, doing so much damage now. Execute makes a misplay and just gets completely popped. And the rest of the team, without their primary engage, don't really have a way in. Nongshim gonna get the second Baron off the game. Oh man, and Dundun now like 404 Mundo's not found. Uh, it is just, I don't know. It's like the first game didn't exist and he's like, I'm on Mana. I'm just having a great time. Let's have a look at this one more time. As Execute, he feels like he found it, but he went straight
straight onto the Flame Chompers. Yeah, just gets popped completely. And then in this play, you know, Clay doesn't even have a chance to use his ult, really. Trying to get some damage in return, but just basically running away. The chase down comes in. And that's the thing, if you miss execute on the engage with this Fear X composition, you'll they just did, get they chased didn't. down. No, 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 they hit execute. They really did. Oh, no, they they missed him all right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he... Oh, you were, you were talking about Fear X. Fear Got X, it. Yeah, 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 they, yeah. they oh. definitely missed execute for that fight. <laughs> oh, no. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and now 2, 6, and 7 uh, for this Orianna. So call me back in the game. Oh, but G would just missed a cannon, so that, oh. that has Doomed. a lot of ramifications, you know. Yeah. Uh, closer also, uh, it's a BF sword that he's put into his back pocket alongside the first three. So just sticking to damage, uh, as is Dundun, who's done the most in the game by a considerable margin. And somehow it's also Colmy that is second. Perhaps Orianna just needs to be banned. Maybe yeah. this champion is just a bit too strong. I just find it crazy they put her so far behind, and she still just does so much damage. Yeah. Uh, even gets hit by a Q from uh, Clear and then gets to ignore everything. That is largely in part to do with all of these minions and barons and crazy stuff as Jiwoo just freely throwing rockets at Fear X and there is nothing they can do about it. The range advantage just a little bit too high, especially given the state of the game. And now Henna going to get bounced on here by Dindin. The easiest feather storm of his life. And Execute going to pay for his sins here as he's trying to get himself out. Equalizer going to be used, and the Super Mega Death Rocket still not landing. So that is fine. Clear still finding these Qs, but it just doesn't matter. They're just standing their ground. Shockwave does come in. All out now down as well here as Clear is trying to stay alive. The Devour going to be used onto Jiwoo as Fox closing in. They hadn't lost anyone for so long, but now these health bars are starting to melt. And now they will bring us to a game number three. Nong Shim! They're back in it, they're back on the board, and the losing streak has been stopped, at least as far as games are concerned. And I mean, Dungeon just going from a game where he looked like the biggest liability to a game where he was the carry who brought them over the finish line. You know, for a lot of that game, it felt like it could go either way, but the team fights came together. The composition that gave all that protection to the Jinx and the Aurelia, who had such a strong start, you didn't even see it. For nope. the rest of the game, it just felt like the presence was not there. Just didn't happen. Dunan now just sitting down with the rest of his teammates, ready to study what went on and how to fix it. Yep, he's looking at the damage graphs now and he's going, look how good I am. Yeah. You guys need to take a lesson from this. Yeah, and then they're tabbing between the two damage graphs. They're like, Dunan, come on, man. Yeah. Um, they're probably not doing that. They're probably just congratulating him because look at this. He did, what, three times the amount of damage that Clear did? Maybe yeah. a little shy. And you can see Fear X did manage to get some gold advantages, right? It was only ever to the tune of about a thousand or something like that. And what they needed to do was try and drive this red line. They just weren't able to get a hold of the game, get a grip of it, because Dindon was right there. Yep. Just throwing boomerangs all around the rift. All those two. And then uh, Jiwoo just had too much high range. So ladies and gentlemen, we are going to go to a short break. When we get back, the space will break down that game and then we will have the decider, the game number three. We'll see you there.
야나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나나
and welcome back to the space. We just had a game of League of Legends where there was one guy named Dundun who was the only guy who mattered by the end of it all. Um, able to bring it back for Noshim and win a game number two. Guys, what do I, we think about that? I have something to say. You might have been subbed out, but that game was a fiesta! <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was. Yeah. It certainly was, wasn't it? It certainly yeah. was. And um, call me, he was subbed in. And uh, he made an illegal decision. He made an illegal play. At level Didn't five. matter. <laughs> um, he did go zero and six, but as the casters pointed out, you know, he did come back in the end. He did a decent amount of damage. He crossed the 10K he, line. He had the steel mantle of Nongshim, as did our, I'm sure, future POG, the man in the top lane. A true noodle. Finally <laughs> having a good game again. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, uh, I think this is very fitting for both these two teams. I think at their best, this is how they look. And at their worst, this is also how they look. But so well I think said. it's, yeah, I think it's very fitting. <laughs> Should we talk about the draft? Yeah, we'll talk about yeah, a little, little bit. Draft out there, you know. it's, it's closer, right? So this is, for those who don't know, this is a closer special. He was the Aurelia player. He played behind Faker on T1 actually in 2021. And he played a lot of Aurelia back then because that was kind of his specialty. Um, he's, of course, since moved into Sandbox and now for your X. But he's very good at the pick. He's very well known for the pick. He had an advantage early, so he was able to snowball that lane. But he was still, ultimately, at the end of the day, Aurelia. And he was still, ultimately, at the whims of the support player in the bottom lane who continuously uh, failed to make successful engages um, in the mid to late game. Yeah, I, I, so when you look at pure draft, I really like the pivot from Nongshin. Uh, I, I genuinely thought that the I think that the Jinx Kench really works well both for their team style because they like to play around Jiwu while simultaneously also being really good into Fear X because if there is one thing you know is that they will draft a melee comp and dive your backline. So I think that that actually was great. Uh, the level of play, obviously, Oriana is notoriously strong because she's very safe. And I do think in lane, obviously, will struggle against Neuralia. That's just the reality of the pick. But um, the way in which it happened was somewhat surprising. Yeah. We got to get into this. Let's get the highlight number one, which is basically just the craziness of the early game in its entirety. This is the first illegal move. Uh, he moves into the dark jungle, gets spotted, knows he's spotted, goes deeper for a ward, and then dies. Yeah, that, that one wasn't okay. We skipped the part of it that was most egregious. Now, I'll, I'll, I'd like to keep it that way. Did we skip the part that was most egregious? Because yes. this is also pretty egregious. Yeah, uh, so we can't get through that health yes. bar. Yeah, so Peter uh, gets aggro there, and then uh, Sylvie has aggro, tries to drop it, but he has aggro from red buff. Yes. So it's just a disaster. Call me didn't have flash because the level one. And we're looking at this, and you're like, oh, fear X. I mean, Easy. Willer had a good game on, on Rumble, by the way. Yeah. The ults were great. Like, the, you know, the, nothing really went wrong for him. But call me, you know, unfortunately, he's just being uh, frozen out a little bit here. Gets caught by this stun. And closer, he's just really good at Aurelia. Um, flash. It's about it. to come up. Yeah. Oh. Looking good. And then they lost. And then and they lost the they game just... somehow. <laughs> yeah, that did that did surprise and, us. Yeah, and I, I think that part of that is just the way that uh, that that for X play in, in that they do take a lot of risks. And Nongshim, even against some stronger teams, I think have been really good when teams treat them with no respect because their team fighting is actually pretty decent. I think their map move and everything isn't great, and all of this drew zero attention to where the real battle was, which was the top lane. Yeah, just quietly getting slowly ahead and just becoming the carry. Unbeknownst to us, we didn't. We were distracted by all this. We had early no stuff. idea. We had no idea. And then highlight number two happened, which uh, you're going to see Hannah disappear. I believe this is this highlight where um, Dinden just pops off like a madman, and all of a sudden you begin to believe in Nongshim again. Yeah, execute going in here gets caught and rooted, and then they have the, they decide to go for the re-engage. Dundon's heading down here. Call me teleports into mid, and then uh, yeah, executes dead. Lost a lot of his health bar there, and Boop. some hyper proc action. And uh, yeah, that's that's where the comeback kind of started here for Nongshim. It did take you know a significant more amount of fighting and some other skirmishes that they did successfully win for the game to actually close out, but. That was kind of the moment where we all looked at each other. We, we all, knew. We all looked at each other. We all made eye contact. And then we all said simultaneously, it's going to three. And, uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
that's what happened, and that's where we are. And I, I don't know what to expect going to this third game, but I hope it's as wild and uh, interesting as the first two. Very interesting indeed. I, that's a good way to put it, Wolf. Uh, right on the money with that one. Let's go ahead and take a look at the POG here for game number two on the side of Nongshim. It's got to be the man on the top lane. You'd imagine there he is, deathless and really high damage numbers for an R. You know, this guy was actually always in the right place at the right time. And I forgot who said it, uh, but this was in one of the first matches that Nongshim played. And the reason why Dundun goes like zero and seven on everything, but also makes plays like this, is because he is the true top laner. He never backs down. He just goes in. And, and that uh, in, the, in the Atrox game, we saw to what horrible things they can lead. But when he does have a lead, I genuinely think that he is really good for these type of messy games because he will go in and he will win you fights. Yeah, and he, he's just not afraid to, to, to make those engages happen. He's obviously uh, a player who has a very strong mental fortitude, uh, as we talk about a lot. And very necessary. It, and that's very important. And we did see a support vote here um, and a jungle vote there for media. That's that's fine, but and I think it was a dun-dun angle. Yeah, I, actually, that support vote. Actually, Peter's uh, devourers were really, really big, but it is a bit of a, he is Kench. <laughs> Um, but That's I, what Kenz, Kenz actually was game winning in a couple of those engages. Sure. I, I do think the selection of the champion itself was pretty good. Peter was in the right place. You know, he stood next to you. That was good, right? Uh, Fox are going to move, or Fear X, sorry, are going to move over to the blue side. Um, blue side has been winning. I think this is fine. Can just go with it. The drafts have been pretty interesting. I don't feel like either side is really utilizing like this, except the Aurelia pick, I guess, for counter, but it didn't win. It was yeah. a cool flex with the rumble, right? Yeah. You didn't see it coming. Okay. It was unusual. Like if it was 2021, we would have been like, oh yeah, I see this. I could I could see the angles, but I just want to see Fear X draft a little bit more standard. They, they won't. Just they a little won't. bit more they standard. Won't. No, come on. I'm just they saying won't. what I want. I'm they not won't. saying what's they, gonna they, happen. No, they, they won't vote. Can I be so for they, a moment? They've been this way since like five years. This 2018 let me, sandbox just, just is let still me here. Have it. Just let me have it. Just let me have a standard draft, please. All right. On that note, guys, we're done here on this space. I'll hand it back to the casters. We have one final game. Please break it down for us now, Atlas and Ox. Oh, gentlemen, we will break it down in many more ways than one. And I am personally not looking forward to what Wolf was asking for. I don't want a standard draft. Keep the insanity. That's what we need. It's a game three. It's the final game of the evening, and I think that that's where both of these teams thrive. That's what we need to see. Just more dumb stuff. You know, I have been analyzing, doing some studying, some research oh, yes. uh, in between last game and this one, and I've come to the conclusion that Orion is pretty good. Oh, okay. So 100% win rate in this series, even when I got set behind, still seemed really strong. So I, I feel like that's going to be a priority pick. I wonder if Nongshin will ban the Orianna and not let it be first picked away. I think that would be a great call. Ban yeah. Lucian now. Well, Lucian uh, and Ash have been banned. Uh, Poppy and Vi have also been banned. Varus would be the third ban if uh, Fear X were going to keep it exactly the same. Uh, Senna and Nocturne were both banned away. Uh, the Lucian's a new ban here uh, as far as red side Nongshim are concerned. Uh, so what is the last ban on the side of Fear X? Because they will. I think just first pick Ariana. I, I think that that is something that uh, Closer is also happy to play. Talia going to be taken away here. And so Call Me not going to have his hands on one of his favorite champions. And is it? There's the center. Okay, so Ariana first pick. Has to be, surely. And if it isn't, uh, it could be congratulations Nongshim. Yeah, uh, I mean, the virus has been left open for the first time, so... Aha. Uh -huh. It's not Orianna. Okay, well, still going to be locked in. So if so, if Nongshim now do, like, Zaya Rakan, I will be extraordinarily sad. Um, but I expect... There's no way, there's no way. You the Orianna button will be virus. pressed, will it not? The Orianna, it will... No, my... Oh, God. No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Oh, ah, Rakan Orianna. Rakan Orianna. That's... That's the angle. That's what we're doing. It's Rakan. It's got to be Rakan. Why do you pick Rakan here? It's so necessary. Well, you want to deny it for... Oh, there we go. That's better. That is something, at least. We have upgraded. We have definitely upgraded. Um, If they last minute pivot to Zaya. Um... You may need a new commentator. Uh, okay, no, never mind. It is going to be locked in. And Execute is baffled. 
Uh, they picked Oriana? No way. That's crazy. We were going to do that. I could have sworn. Okay. Now, what is Willa going to do? Corky angle? No. Unless? No. I mean, Corky Varus would mean that you do not need to team fight. Yeah, he can just sit back and be miles away. Um, wow! Whoa. Well, I yeah. think you can't base everything in League of Legends on the numbers. But if you're going to, that lock-in, that final lock-in for Firax uh, definitely hits the rods a bit. Is yeah, not being doing... You know, at the start of the day, at the start of the week, sorry, his win rate was really low. I think it was like under 12%. And I think he's only lost since then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he did win one. Oh, okay. Didn't he win one yesterday? Maybe. That actually makes up... You have to... To make the win rate worse, you really have to lose a lot of games. So if you want yeah. one, that'll actually help it out. Yeah. No, I, I, I think that... I think a win did happen. But I'm uh, I'm not entirely sure. I, I know Karis did lose on it as well. Um, so it has certainly been plummeting. So Rumble and Nocturne both taken away here. And... Okay. Zyra Khan versus Azir. Zyra Khan has lost both series. Azir uh, also hasn't done very much winning, but Oriana has been doing all of the winning. The winning power of Oriana versus the losing power of Zyra Khan. That's the challenge. That is it. Top match is going to be really important. We've kind of seen top lane be actually really impactful both games so far, uh, one way or the other. So it's surprising that we really have I mean, I guess the Rumble is a top lane ban, but we have a lot of jungle focus with these bans coming out here. I would like to see Nar ban. Well, you are not going to get rewarded with that. Ah, uh, it's, it's a bit sad. So the question is, is there something Nongshim can take here that they think is just unstoppable? Brand jungle. Um, no, I don't. I don't know whether that's uh, the answer. Yeah, I'm not so sure either. Oh, headband guy could be cool. Mm. Briar always getting hovered, but never picked. Uh, and Viego. Yeah. Often it is Briar and then Viego, and that is because in Korean, B and V are very close together. So alphabetically, they are next to one another. Yep. So you may as well give Briar a good old hover before you lock in the Viego. Uh, now, Henner and Execute. Going to round out this Fearx draft. It started off poorly. It ended poorly. Yeah, I was but now we're into the next round, and this is where things can come it's out. It's kind of been shocking how little Maokai we've seen, but yeah, yeah, into Rakan, he's pretty good. Can keep your your guys at a range with your Varus, who's obviously quite powerful distance. And Clay gonna go for the Aatrox, so didn't into the Aatrox. You know, we saw obviously Clay find great success as the Jacks of that matchup. Oh go, my hey. God, Dindin! Even Clear is having a giggle about it. He's like, what the heck? Clear and Dindon obviously have a lot of history playing against one another over the last couple of years uh, in Challenger. And I don't think Clear saw that one coming from a mile away. And honestly, I, I, I love it. It's going to be difficult to execute. We've obviously seen like Zayas play it so well. Dindon isn't Zayas, but um, I think the big thing as well is that we typically see Yone as a counter to Azir. And yes, it's not going to be a lane counter here. But the threat, the ability to get onto an Azir when a lot of champions are unable to do so, gives so much power in team fights. A big aspect of the composition of Nongshim is going to be closing the distance. You know, they're against a composition with a lot of disengage. They need to reach <laughs> that backline somehow, and the Yone definitely can provide. And uh, yeah, um, I think that Nongshim fans certainly going to be experiencing a bit of whatever was written on that sign. Uh, that is 100% the truth. Because this has been a roller coaster, uh, to say the least. And going into this game, this game number three, Ox, I'm going to be real with you. I have Ready? little to no idea what's going to occur. Uh, what I do know is that the top lane exists. Uh, that's that's what I know. I don't know how much like how Dundon's going to fare on this Yone, but his Nah was so good in the last game. I'm almost ready to believe. I'm almost there. And here we are, almost, into game number three. Let's do it, right now. I mean, I don't want to be that guy, but I reckon the Nongshim fans are feeling it. Yeah, right. yeah I mean, they're half a win. Yeah? 
It's it's very and close. All they need is Dundun just to put on a Yone Masterclass. It's that simple. Yeah, and I, I look. After what I just saw him do in the last game, uh, then I look. I'm ready to believe. I'm still mind blown by how much damage the Hyper Proc did to Henna. I yeah. I would have paused. I'm not even gonna lie. I would have paused and said, someone check that out. That seems like a ridiculous amount of damage. It was too much. And now Henna already so taking damage here. There's Colmy throwing orbs into the brush. And now he has teammates here as he goes to put down a ward not quite as deep as he did in the previous game. So there we, there we are, learning. And Sylvie moving towards his bottom side, going to be starting off on his blue buff. Same thing to be said here for Willa on the Maokai. Very different champion to the Rumble. Rumble was uh, Willa having a little bit more fun this time around. He is going to be on engaged duty and just taking care of his teammates. Colmy misses that first CS. Which feels bad and he gets angry at Closer for it. Yeah, really sets the, the tone of the game. You missed that first CS. Is it worth continuing? Should you just FF? Yeah, if it was a scrim, I probably would just get out of it. Uh, opt in once again. As Zyra Khan, like I was talking about, has not been doing winning very much. Has been, you know, able to do some things, like losing, for example. Uh, certainly able to do that. But the amount that uh, teams have been picking a lot of these poke options into it, and I guess the, the real next level is to uh, pick the Zyra Khan into the poke option instead. Yeah, I... I just find it so weird. Like, Zaya wants people to come into her, right? That's the kind of the goal of a Zaya is, like, people run at you and you can kite back instead of your feathers. And that is just, like, the complete opposite of what Firax comp Composition wants to do. Yeah. Like, they're going to be the ones sitting back and firing arrows at you from miles away, and you're going to have to push into them, which just doesn't suit the Zaya very much. So, I'm not a big fan of this pick. I think really just doesn't fit with the composition that Nongshim have and might cause them trouble further down the line. We're getting a little bit of a zoom in as Quoza oh. does decide to go slightly aggressive. Sets up some Sand Soldiers in good position here to make sure that Colmy can't win out on too many more of these trades. Liking what I'm seeing, both of these mid laners completely out of mana. As, wow, that's a seven, seven win streak. Even Morgan. Is that, isn't that, that one, the one win for... Against DRX, yeah. Yeah. And I was away. Crazy. The things that happen. Yep. Well, we'll see if that streak continues. So far, so good. Have well, a look at that. that look, at, look at the, the numbers. Yep. They don't lie. No. Ah, uh, that is a grand entrance on to Henna. Peter getting a lot of work done here. And Willa is just going to space walk into this bottom lane. I do some damage towards uh -oh. Sylvie. Actually walks straight on top of the sapling. They get the flash out as well. Nicely played here. A little bit unfortunate. And Sylvie has to put that one on cooldown and could alleviate some of the pressure here that Jiwu and Peter were building up. Yeah, not the best move from Sylvie there. Walked straight into the brush with sapling. Went for a little bit of a poke trade. Yeah, um, Execute really wanted to kill that ward. Uh, he's not going to be able to, and he may just die. Still walking forward, has the Grey Health to eat as well, because they know that Hen is there. He's flashing for it, as now Will is going to come in. The flash comes through. There's a twisted advance. They still have the heal. Oh, my goodness. The bait sapling. was extraordinary. The sapling not going to quite be enough. And Fear X just barely unable to get it. I loved the unbridled aggression. I mean, the fact that Execute looked basically dead when he went for that play. I think if you look at the portraits at the right and left of the screen after that play, there just wasn't health bars for Willa or Jiu, both of them surviving on what must have been like single digit health there. Just really absurd. a good scenario. Very absurd, very aggressive from Fairax to try and set that one up, but it doesn't quite pay off. But a lot of summoners traded across the, the board. I will take note though, Dundun doing very well in this matchup. He is dominating. This is like, this is the class. He takes a punch and then he's like, he absorbs it, powers up, learns how it works, and then he throws it back at you. And that's precisely what's happened. He would like, I don't even remember what happened in game number one because it doesn't compute in my brain with how this series has, uh, what it's turned into. Yeah, game number one, shh, yesterday's news. Yeah? Not even yesterday. It doesn't exist. It's been erased from the incredible play that he's now done. Look at Execute. 
And he's like, all right, they did buttons at me. It's yeah. fine. I'll just go through my gray health and flash. And here, she was so close to going down. Oh. Does the sapling actually hit him? Oh, we got the zoom, we got the zoom. Yeah, the sapling does. It Look at the health him. bars. Look how they're both... What? Like four health that was or something on the on the Zaya and Ma Maokai must have been similar. Oh, that's insane. All right, I'll it's a it. game of inches. And you know what? That's a lesson too. Drink your potions. Yeah, absolutely. Sylvie, gonna stick around and uh, grab grab uh, Kevin Bob as well after securing Steve. Nicely done. Peter and uh, and Jiwoo. Underneath their turret once again, range advantage work, working out here for Hannah. As there we go. So Void Bob secured. Close is still at 50% health. Call me similar story here, but he is full on mana. Yeah, they're trying to get control of the wave here, but gotta be a bit careful with Willis stepping up. Yep, throwing some saplings around. So we'll be able to avoid that by That's slinking right. into the mist. Nicely done. Does need to be a little bit careful. He's been caught by these saplings before. Yeah, and because Spirax have bought Pryo, they're going to end up being the ones who have control over the area. Yeah, I've never really thought of uh, Maokai as this 1v1 pressure jungler, but that is uh, what he's doing here. You know, don't let your mind be limited by these archetypes and champion strengths. If you want a 1v1 of Maokai, then do it. Yeah, no, I'm, uh, I'm never going to do that again. Assumptions. Can get you killed. Okay. As there's a knock up. Uh, Sylvie so gonna take a fair bit of damage. Peter actually playing very nicely, trying to avoid that. Still, Sylvie is burning and he's gonna have to go home and he will lose out on his blue buff. Oh no, call me the flash forward! But he has command protect. And that is going to get him out of there as well as his flash. But I haven't seen an Azir win this matchup in a really long time. And that is a nature's grasp. You know, we thought it was as simple as pick Oriana and you're good to go. Apparently, that's not the answer. And uh, oh. What is going on here? Well, uh, Closer did the Shifting Sands ability and um, didn't quite make it there in time. As Here we go. There's an engage from Execute. Does get knocked up, though. Now Peter trying to make his way out. Henna auto-attacking some things. And now Willa trying his luck yet again. Sweeping out this vision. Why? Go I home, Call me. You're bothering. It's, it's making me nervous. Still, Sylvie is coming in. I don't even think he's been spotted yet. Finally, the ward will see him and actually probably saw him a while ago. Still, close he uses the last of his mana. Shift the sands, get himself out of the way. Something happened in the top lane and now it's looking a bit even. But uh, in CS, not so much. This series is crazy, man. All right, there's a shockwave. And Closer, he's down to one auto attack. And finally, we have a first blood. There we go. Sylvie locks it up, and it looked it looked obvious. And I think if you just turned on the stream, you're like, Atlas, why didn't you know he was going to die? It's Dindin! He's going aggressive towards his top lane, lands another knockup. The Infernal Chains connect, and he rebinds the soul to go back once again. Ulti's exchanged here on the top side, and Dindin, I mean, it's a nice edge. It's working, man. I haven't okay. seen this side of Dindin. Who unlocked Dindin? He's unleashed. This is like that arc in, in, in those animes that the kids watch, you know? Where, where all of a sudden, he realizes what he was meant to be and just goes ham. Yep. He really is that anime protagonist. And yeah. yeah, the shockwave coming in, icing on the cake, and then still just has enough damage to get the kill. And considering how low Cormy was for that entire passage of play, getting the wave crash, getting the assist, and getting the recall freely, best case scenario. Cannot go better considering how bad the lane state was prior to that. Oh. There's an Empress Divide. Continue. Yeah, uh, he just didn't appreciate PW up in his grill. It's understandable. If you've got an R button, use it. That's what I that's what I say. The Get your skills on cooldown. Yep. And then you can use it again sooner. Yeah. It's about the amount of times you use it per game, not about the effectiveness. That's called value. Yeah, there's a quickness, and there's a knockup, and that's a really dead Azir. Wah, that's the second one. And now Sylvie's already over here. Uh, Execute, able to get out, uses the Abyssal Dive, and Dundun getting out as well. Everyone just snapping around the map. And you know, if you take stock, top lane going really well. Jungle now has two kills. Mid lane was going rough, but now Cormie kind of feels a bit back on top with those two ganks that have come in. Uh, two deaths for the Azir. It's and so weird seeing Azir lose, though. 
Because like, isn't it a really strong champion that's been winning a lot? Yeah, isn't it really popular on pro play? It's kind of crazy that he's sitting at 0 and 2. Yeah, kind of insane. Yeah, might look into that on the stats. I assume that I assume that he has a it really must, great win rate. It must be an outlier. It must be an it's outlier. It's got to be. Yeah. And he's been focused by the jungle. People wouldn't keep picking a champion if it was losing. No, of course like, not. They would stop picking it and pick champions that win. It's that simple. No, exactly, exactly. And like you do... If, if you're against uh, Orianna that has been, because we've seen it win a fair bit, like you'd first pick it if, you know... Right? Weird. Yeah. Crazy stuff. Anyway, Fearx going to be able to lock down the first Drake here. And Sylvie looking to augment his first three bubs with another three. Kev two, Steve two, and Bob two. All going to be taken down. Yeah, I don't think you want to hang out over here. No, he is uh, going to go back to his turret where it's safe. And that was a pretty good play. As now, Nature's Grasp going to be flying through. Let's see what they can get done here. Chains of Corruption go completely wide. Oh, that was. What was that? That was Mirkred. Ah, value. Yeah. Peter uh, getting out of the first route just in time so he could dash away from the ult from Henna and dive successfully mitigated. Void Bub secured. All six over long shim. And again, we do have to talk about these not being the most impactful buff, but if you get momentum in the game, it really can make a bigger difference. And looks like they're going to try and find Claire here. If they kill him, they could just take a ton of plates for Dundon, and then the game might be done done. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That's that's great. Call me also moving up here. Clear knows what's going on. Dundon going to ult right past the Azir, but there's a Shockwave available. And Heartbreaker going to come through. Still, Clear able to get one back, so not exactly the cleanest. As Closer shows up just a little bit late here. You know, in my career as a League of Legends commentator, I have seen better dives. Um, yeah. I would say that I've probably seen a couple of better. I've seen worse, though. <laughs> in fact, in the last game, you, you might remember. <laughs> So I'd say that Sylvie <laughs> what'd you rate, what'd you uh, and Longshim are improving. What do you rate the dive out of 10? Oh, it's almost on the board, I reckon. Because uh, it was it was a bit of a goofy one. So Dundon, uh, he's like, dash it aside, ult, completely miss. He nailed um, the turret, though. Yeah, and then Sylvie ults into turret, which just means he's definitely dead. And he gave a shutdown over, which isn't ideal. So I'm going to give that a solid 0.3. Point three. <laughs> That's a bit harsh. All right. Uh, one point. They got the kill and only one person died. I'm gonna give it like a four. All right. All right. Uh, beginning. Yeah. Uh, okay. Chains of corruption. Get a land once again. That gets a cleanse out of Jiwoo. Piercing arrow going to go slightly wide here. Ghost blade now completed for Henna. And closer and call me still just exchanging waves here in the mid lane and not in the friendly greeting kind of way of waving. Uh, it's more like waves of minions that they're exchanging. Oh which is Brutal Murder. Easy to confuse those two. Yes, yes, yes. Just need to make sure that everyone is aware of that. I'm just, I, I still am very worried about the uh, the Azir situation that we have on our hands here. Oh, we're seeing an Eclipse first, Aatrox. Huh. We used to see that. Yeah, a long time ago. Not. It's, it's really been about the pro Propane The Propane Hydra, hydra yeah. Lethality pro Hydra. Propane Hydra? Propane and Propane Accessories hydra. Petrol Hydra, heck yeah. <laughs> uh, Henna is going to press his Hail of Arrows, and that is going to get him out of there as now. Dindin getting ulted. Willa comes on in here and has the sapling. Nice little ulti, and he might even be able to get the kill. Oh, oh my oh. god, Dindin's a monster. Can Willa get out with his life? That's the question. They pressed every button, and it wasn't enough. Dundun just lands every single skill. The Blade of the Wind King coming in clutch. Jiwoo manages to dodge away for the Tongue Lash. I have a closer. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh dear. There's the Emperor's Divide from Closer. Gets Call Me out of there, and Closer may still just die. Yeah, this is here's not holding up so hard. Oh man. Still, still perplexed. Oh, Peter. Peter, he's got Ignite. Bird versus Bird. I think the back will come through in time. 3,000 gold to lead for Nongshim, though. They are just careening out of control this game. Yeah, top gap, pretty hard. Yeah. And Closer's like, I'm going to TP back in, and he's <laughs> like, me too. <laughs> Same. Have this matchup, Closer. How does it? How, how is this one? Probably worse. Yeah, probably uh, not exactly the greatest. 1-0-1 one, one now. And let's play before. This is called Executes Walk at Jiwu and Tongue Lash him. He's been doing that a few times this game. Yeah, I can see that. Judging by the health bar, Jiwoo <laughs> has not enjoyed it. No, it's really not fun. 
Uh, looking at the CS numbers, though, uh, Jiu is feeling just fine. Not really the main character this game. Certainly did feel a little bit more like one in the last game as it progressed. Let's see whether that is going to be the case this time around as well. Let's check this out once again. Dundun, the man with the, the mechanics. Mechanic. Yeah. Where's the sweet spot? Where is it? Oh, it doesn't exist. Not Clear can't find it. I think he legit just hit every single Q. Yeah, 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 whilst I'm avoiding really every single Q. Yeah, I mean, really well played, really well played. Uh, Blazing King, a huge spike for the Yone, but just kind of just dumb strings clear there. And it's not going to get better. You know, if you fall behind in this matchup, you're never going to be having a good time. We ha we do see it's now done up against Closer, but I don't think that really goes much better. No, um, and that was, you know, a product of the opportunistic uh, teleport from Closer, getting back towards that bottom lane. Chains of Corruption going to connect once again as, wow, the W-empowered Q going to be hurting. As Peter taking some damage as well, Execute brings out the tongue once again. Yeah, and I mean, the is not in that fun position, just getting poked out by the virus. Uh, but when your teammates are winning, oh. you're going to be okay. This is just ride the Dundun bus, 100%. Uh, that's what you want. Will it going to be able to avoid the stun there as Peter taking so much damage? Olmi comes on over. There's the shockwave. Devour has come through, but can they actually survive is the question. Nature's Grasp comes down. Teleport coming in. The cavalry has been called. The Hail of Arrows not really going to find too oh, much. And now Dundun. Dun Dun. Oh, he was going to press it. And he does. He manages to find closer here and isn't actually pushed entirely out of the way. Still has to flash because the rest of the team's coming over. And now, oh my god, the turn. He may have gone a little bit too far. Or oh, who has? Closer is still alive with sub 100 health and they'll transition into a dragon. Fear X. Yeah, they're named correctly. There is no fear here. Yeah, huge shutdown. Closer completely going ahead with the confidence to make the play happen. He wanted that kill onto the Yone, and he does get rewarded. Dragon picked up as well. It ends up being Hextech Souls, so pretty big that Firex already have two on the cards. And considering how disastrous this game was looking, a solid bounce back. We see here, this is such a scrappy fight. Peter's already heavily chunked. The Shockwave comes in, a nice gobble from the Tom Kench. Uh, and the, the Grey Health comes in just in time. And we see Sylvie having to ult out, but here, Dunder was actually on vision, they knew, and he led with the ult. So the problem is, when you E, obviously, you're getting the extra damage, but because he led with his ult, he lost a lot of damage potential on the closer, and he just ends up not quite having enough to the end. The dragon actually aggroing, I think, yeah. was what got him killed in the end. Oh man, I wanted to see whether Closer had any close, uh, closing thoughts uh, to that particular exchange. There's another Chains of Corruption going to go wide this time around as Jiwoo has to Feather Storm, and oh, they still want more. Peter's going to be there. Yeah, looking pretty on fun for the Zaya. If only they could have not picked Zaya. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's a battle of the I wish they didn't pick these uh, champions. It's Colmy coming on over. He's an example of a good thing to pick. Wow. Henna is just going to destroy Peter, though. And now the Abyssal Dive going to come in. Colmy just going to walk this one off as best he can. But some low health bars on the side of Nongshim. Dundun is lying in wait. I no. love the, the transition from <laughs> all of this action to Dundun in a brush. I feel like Rakan has really been on Struggle Street in this series. Just getting one shot, basically, whenever he goes in, it has not worked well. No. Bear in mind, this is a Rakan who has the item whose name I definitely know, but I'm just not saying it because I choose not to. Ah, the one yeah. that reduces damage to support one. Yep. The shieldy thingy. Yeah. Again, I do know the name. I haven't forgotten it. Yeah, no, me too. I'm just choosing not to yeah, say it. Yeah, we're preferring to... to It'd be very obvious if I said it, you know? Yeah, yeah, I want yeah. you guys at home to think about it. Yeah. Uh, this is a choose-your-own-adventure. You can call it whatever you'd like to. Uh, I'm going to call it Shieldy Thing. I'm going to call it Crown, because that's what go. it basically is. Heck yeah. Uh, Jiwoo is going to call it a sad time, as he does have to flash, but will keep himself alive. And uh, then Colmy comes over for the flank. Yeah, how does Peter die so quickly? Oh, I see. He just runs out of health. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, that was what happened. How did we not know? <laughs> oh, came out of nowhere. Definitely not something Peter was prepared for. No. Uh, in hindsight. He'll think further about that. But he has done it twice now. So, I don't know. It's crazy. Anyway, Shelly coming out. And see whether she can finish off this outer turret in the mid lane. Should be able to do so. Do we take it? Uh, that's uh, uh huh. 
Ah, the, Where are the, you going, my The friend? good old-fashioned redirect. Uh, Sylvie pox it into the wall. Right, well, that... That's definitely a fail. That's a lucid. We call that a lucid. Yeah, that you're uh, not passing nowadays. your driving test with one of those. Yeah. Sylvie, so just shout out to his uh, his challenger brother there. You know, Nongshim are young players, so who knows if Sylvie's actually passed his driving test? Um. Well, yeah, probably hasn't. Uh, I know that I can drive, but I probably uh, I'm not very good at piloting uh, Shelly, so maybe it's not correlated. Does it class as like what's the t like? What's the reckless endangerment? No, it's like the high, like the hate is a HGV, the vehicle, high grade vehicle or something, or you know, like heavy, heavy vehicles. Like you know, you have to need an extra license to drive like a truck. Oh yeah, like it's it's not armored vehicles because that, I think you'd need a to be in the army for no, that. No, not armored. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's it's like an acronym for it that I can't. This one I'm admitting I can't actually remember what it is. Um, but there's an acronym for it that... I don't know it. Yeah. I can't drive a truck. Would Shelly class as one of those, is the I, question. I think so. Yeah. As Execute going to do the walk left uh, treatment to Peter. That's going to deny his uh, potential engage. And arrows still flying in. As Nongshim feeling like they're back on the board just a little bit here. Still have a gold advantage, but it feels like Fierex have won the last couple of exchanges. And there are some back pings coming in. Dindon wanting to join this fight. He is a lot of the value of this squad. Now has himself an Iceborn Gauntlet, Frozen Fist thingy, and a bow and arrow. And some nice boots. Yeah, some shoes. Looking berserk. Now, Sylvie, into the mist. Jiwoo, yeah, Jiwoo just... Obnoxious. How are you supposed to play the game as Zaya? Well, you know, we did talk about this. Yeah. If only that someone could have warned them. At least they didn't pick it second. You know, if they had a picked it second, that would have been really sad. Yeah, that would have been really silly. Picking it at all was hey, look, also look. a problem, but we're gonna we're gonna take the wins. Peter just healed Jiwoo up. Hey, like, there we go. And and the the Drake got quite upset as now Kloza going aggressive onto Dundon. Sylvie finds a stun, but not too much really going to happen afterwards. Chains of corruption, and Peter has been still for a really long time. This Drake. Should have been earned here by Fear X. And Peter dives in. What? Run! What the heck? How do you see? He's got Guardian. There's no unsealed spellbook in this game. Okay, Peter. Uh, I'll take your POG. And, uh, and we'll move on. That was gorgeous. They steal away Soul Point, and that could actually be a really pivotal moment in this game. And Willer is losing his mind. He's like, what? <laughs> How did that happen? How did that happen? We're going to need like a slow mo replay to be able to piece together that one. Huh. I, you know, he ulted in with Zeke's. Was it the Zeke's that actually got it? That's what we're wondering. Okay, close okay. up. Gotta focus in. So he gets hit by CC, and then yeah. CC, and then Chains yeah. of Corruption, and then he's out. out. And then. And then I think it's like here, he like eased to call me ult. Yeah. It's just Zeke's. I'm pretty sure Zeke's, because it went to 28 health and Zeke's does 50 damage. I think Zeke's just got it. He just Zeke'd it. Yeah. And then Dundon gets in, Zeke gets a bit of CC. Yeah, he's like, I don't know, man. Peter, we knew he was a wizard, but I just did not quite know that he was this good. So calculated. Yeah. You know, the foresight to see that happen is really something else. 7D chess going on here. As Nongshim, they steal away the soul point opportunity from Fear X, Yo, something that they would have really liked. Yeah, if they were on three at this point and there's a Hextech soul, I would start to really be concerned about Nongshim's chances, especially with Vi Oh no. I'm starting to be concerned about Willa here, who's going to have to flash, tries to get himself out of the way. Dundun's in there, finds the fate sealed, and that might just be that. But Close is able to lock down a kill, and that is so much damage. Willa, Willa survived for almost too long there as Sylvie going aggressive. Close are down very, oh. very low and clear. The damage is just too much. He'll pick up a double and Sylvie will slink away tail between his legs. And we thought it was the Dindin show and then Clear just turns up with a billion damage. He's unchecked and destroys them. This keeps happening where like a team forgets the Aatrox exists for a few seconds and instantly just gets one shot. Like this champion does so much damage and if you're not prepared for it, It'll just mid so here, I mean, the Maokai, unfortunately, not a great target because he is so tanky. The Shockwave flashed away from, and Dunn has to commit so much damage. The Shuffle actually comes in as well for the Azir. Dunn ends up going down, I believe, to, like, 
The Grom. <laughs> the Grom. <laughs> right. <laughs> he aggroed the Grom. Oh my. Okay, I didn't even focus on the rest that of the was team the, fight. It was, was, it was beautifully most, played by Clear, but. That was the most dun dun way to die, you know? What? Huh. He, he. I. I mean, it, won't, it wouldn't have changed the outcome of the team fight, but he didn't really have to die like that right there. It was very dindin. Chains of Corruption going to sail towards him. And uh, not really being too much uh, issue as Peter does take a few of these shots, but they are just brute forcing this and they will be able to take down the outer turret in the mid lane. Okay, so Baron for Fear X, but they have lost a turret now. Quoza just uh, dealing with this inner. This is one of his favorite things to do. It's sit in a side lane and just uh, kill structures. This is so broken. <laughs> yeah, this champion's just I, incredible, guys. I bet this um, champion wins a lot. No, seriously. Uh, must just be the greatest. And I guess the thing that we're learning is, oh dear, um, mind, is that sucks. perhaps... Um, look at, there was a Never mind, this champion's great. Oh my lord. He can construct his own turret? Are you kidding me? That's so unfair. He can dash and he can kind of go like one way then the other. Oh, silly. Nutty. And uh, well played uh, by Closer. Of course, he is one of our uh, Azia guys. Certainly is uh, a big fan of this champion. They have a lot of LCK mid We We do. We're like BDD, Karas, Faker, everyone. And no one's really been having the greatest of times, Zekka, um, on the on the Azia. So. I don't know whether he is necessarily their trip to victory, but you know, I uh, so much of this doesn't come down to the draft, does it, Orcs? It's just no, not really I, that. I feel like I feel like the more you focus on the draft, the less it matters. Yeah, I feel like it's like that inverse thing. Um, he is he is very so far, ahead. far ahead. How is he that far ahead? He was zero and two. Yeah, I mean, I think he picked up some nice kills, and he does have a forty CS lead. Yeah, and, and he did take that tier two tower by himself, and now he just wanders casually out of the grand entrance, and he's going to continue pushing forward. Is he is busted? Too strong. Yeah, I don't know. Oh. Uh, Bramble Smash, pretty good at get, uh, dealing with Sylvie here. Takes oh, the majority of his health bar. And level 16. Oh, I can feel it. All right, the Nongshim team fight is coming on in. Nature's Grass to come out, though, as Fear X. They are offering a lot back, and Sylvie is out of this fight. Dundun also has to vacate. Yep. Three members left underneath this turret, but Shockwave has to be flashed Dun -dun was by Hannah. Dundun able to buffer the ultimate, so he will get himself away. Yeah, Dundun was actually locked in a 1v1 against the Grom. Um, trying to oh, get this is... <laughs> Worst, most dangerous opponent. <laughs> His <laughs> rival on the rift. Oh, God. It's not clear. It's the Grom. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty clear that it's the Grom Hawks. I don't know what you're talking about. That should be Soul Point going over to Fear X. And this, this game really did feel like Nongshim were in a bit of control. And now it feels like Fear X are going to take this Drake that is going to get them Soul Point. And they and just had Baron, and now they have a large gold lead. If it wasn't for <laughs> this thing the right Rapan here. Zeke's. Look at this. Sylvie is just eradicating Gromps from the Rift. Yeah, he's like, don't worry, Dun Dun, I'm locking it down. Yeah, he's like, and look, this is in dangerous territory. This is on the other side they, of the map, but he still has to do it. They know it's the weakness yeah. of Dun Dun. So <laughs> <laughs> clear it out, he can XL. Um, yeah, and if it wasn't for the 50 damage from the Zeke's from Peter, it would just be Soul for Fear X. Yeah. I told you, it's pay to POG. Or bust. Grump, and they have to win. Grump POG, I think. <laughs> it's a neutral POG. That's all we're going to have. And I actually think that that is the perfect way uh, to end this series. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. It's just a neutral <laughs> POG. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, we see Nongshim sitting around Baron, trying to establish some vision. One of the issues with going to Maokai, though, is you just kind of throw saplings in the brushes. And he feels immortal, probably for good reason. Has a thorn mail, has a frozen heart. You know what's crazy? He hasn't really built much MR, and I just don't think he cares. No. I think he's just refusing to respect the Orianna damage threat. And to be perfectly honest, there's not really a damage threat at this stage of the game uh, as well, especially with you know money going into Oblivion Orb and things like that not quite getting towards item number two in any uh, swift fashion, and he has a Banshee's Veil. So, it's going to be a while before the Orianna is really doing massive damage in this game. Yeah. 
And still, I mean, Willow will eventually get a Rook earn, right? I think that's a, that's Mandatory. a guarantee. Every, every tank gets a Rook earn at some point. Oh, yeah. Even against full AD teams. We've seen before in the LCK, yeah. you still buy a Rook earn. Hey, you know why? Yone does mixed damage, I'll have you know. Oh, that's okay. Uh, Wit's End does magic damage. True. He's basically uh, a mate. Peter Zeke's does magic damage, was strong enough to steal Dragon. I think exactly. To justify a Rook earn. And they are, they are gonna, they're gonna respect that now as Willa is yeah um just a brick wall or a wooden wall hmm. Hmm. i don't know what to make of this game I also but i like it, it so interesting that like maokai was just overlooked the first few games and then they pick in this game it's like whoa this champion's pretty good yeah <laughs> who'd have thought <laughs> i wonder what would happen if they realized that corky existed wait corky exists no not really not in this series not in most series, it's often he's banned, but in this series it's more just because they want to play as hand shook and they're like, neither of us will pick, we won't waste the ban, just neither of us are going to pick Corky, because yeah. who wants to see that? And you know what? A Corky free series, I'll take it. Oh, I'm down. Absolutely. I would just prefer to not see as much of the Azir and Zyra Khans. Um, I think that that one it has been a bit of a struggle for a lot of our teams. And Jiwoo has been better on so many others. I mean, the, the Jinx, for example, was a great one. And I feel like he might be able to do an auto attack against an enemy if he was something with more than no range. Yeah. And also, I mean, at this point, doesn't quite have LDR yet. You're still going to take so long to cut through the Maokai. Yeah. Not a fun time. You can also see that Clear is going for quite heavy armor now. They know that the Orianna hasn't been the biggest threat. Baron being started, Chains are jumping on the jungler. On exactly the right target. target, that is a lot. Already poked out as Willa clearing out vision. Peter will be able to use his body to find some, some extra, but Nature's Grasp to come down. Willa looking for a turn if they can find it. Closer goes golden though, Dundun uses his ult as well. That is the most high value Zonyas I have ever seen in my life. That was just absurd. And Clear gets on over, Umbral dash as well, eats an ult. Nongshim threw everything in the kitchen sink at Closer and Clear, and neither of them took anything. Yeah, just honestly, beautiful from Closer, the timing, flawless on that Zonya's. Everything banned by Nongshim. Baron now for Fear X, and 48 seconds until the Dragon. Not all of those ults are going to be back up in time. Oh man, Nongshim's parents are going to get home. They're going to be like, where's the kitchen? Like, what happened? And and they're going to say, we threw it at the end. And the parents are going to ask, well, what do you have to show for it? And they're going to have to say nothing. Nothing. Oh no. Well, Zonyu's is on cooldown. That's that's a takeaway. Also, that it feels really bad that Call Me has two large rods and hasn't finished the Rabadons and is now having to fight for Soul. Uh, but, Fear X are like... Oh uh, god, oh god, oh god. I remember oh, this. Oh, Dragon for Nexus. Dragon for Nexus is not the trade that you want to make. If you're the one getting the dragon. <laughs> um, that's what I have learnt. Dundun is going to buy a bow and arrow of his own. Ah, I see. Fairax are doing this, this this twist on the dragon for Nexus. Ah, where they don't get the dragon. They don't get the dragon and they, they lose still an give inhibitor. Up. Yeah. Not a great trade still, but at least they don't give up the Nexus. The dragon is still there though, so they can fight for that. If they would like to. Chains um, of Corruption just sailing by, looking beautiful here. Like the Arctic Ops skin for that. And yeah, the last Siege Minion will be taken down. They can get Dragon Lair, there's no rush. Yeah, there you go. They may as well just win the game first and then get the Dragon. As uh, clear, you can see off to the side, looking for that flank angle. Honestly, I would just reset now and go for the Dragon. I, I, I think that Hexel would be a decent idea. Kind of golden. They'll take the inhib though. They feel like they're strong enough to do this with you backing off. Now I would reset and get the dragon. Yeah. Now. Or just walk and get the dragon. Now. Oh, but what about Nexus turrets? You could take some Nexus turrets. The dragon. No, but what about in the Nexus turrets, though? Okay, this seems like a gamble. But they are ahead. They're on a good spot, so it should pay off. Ooh, they waited for the Chains of Corruption cooldown. They'll get a cleanse for it. And Nature's Grasp going to be used. The first Nexus turret is going low as Peter dives in and oh, gets no. on top of a Maokai. Oh no! Emperor's Divide swipes them all up. And now Jiwoo and Dundun are the last men standing. And they may not be standing for much longer. Yeah, the dragon doesn't matter if you just kill the Nexus. As Closer is almost just murdered by Execute.
Oh, the redemption for Azir is massive. Dundon unfortunately unable to win his game on the Azir. What a strange series <laughs> of Firex come out on top. Yeah, if they didn't need the Dragon. They could just brute force it. The Zyle looked super rough that game into the Varus. The Varus doing so much damage there. Um, and honestly, just a pretty pretty excellent comeback from Firex in that one when they really looked like they were struggling initially, really managed to bounce back. Whoa. I don't know what to make of it. All I know is... I feel like my brain gave me the good chemical <laughs> when Firex were doing the things and going in and finding all of these moments. And maybe my preconceptions of champions like Azir and champions like Corky, maybe they need to go out the window. Yeah. Maybe it's not about that. Maybe it's about execution. Maybe it's about friendship. And maybe it's about Firex just doing what works for them. And to be perfectly honest, it worked. They picked up a win here. They dropped a game, but I don't think it matters too much because now they are going to be challenging for that uh, that Western side. Yep. I think the big thing for me is I, I just feel like the desire really hit them into the virus, but I, I think like the composure that Fear X had, you know, with and the, the, the drafts, even though like some of them were like this wasn't too spicy, the cohesion was there for the most part in a lot of them. The cohesion was there in this draft, right? You outrange yeah. the Maokai playing bouncer. If you dive in heavily, you have an Aatrox to deal with as well. You have the Tom Kench for safety net. And they have Nongshim to thank for that, to be perfectly... Because it wasn't it wasn't a reactive draft. It was the wrong reactions made into champions in the draft yeah. on both sides. And we're not saying that this is just, just Nongshim, but that bottom lane range mismatch, that was opted into. It's but like, then the Azir like, was opted into. It's like if you look at like what champions are played against each other, and you're like, oh, they're playing a lot of Varus. Like, Zaya plays in a Varus a lot. I guess it must be a good matchup. But it's like, no, that's because people pick Varus against Zaya and kill her. No, they pick Varus and then they pick Zaya into. Well, I think that's that's the, the <laughs> conclusion that Nongshim took, and it wasn't a good conclusion. Because uh, no. I don't think we really got to see Jiu play the game. I think he basically just hung out mid, lost his health, and that was about it. And it's so crazy. We had such a strong start from Dundon in this one. Yeah, and he, and he played that 1v2 so nicely as well. Um, even this moment wasn't the worst until it was. And I think Closer just being left alone in a side lane for so incredibly long and just accruing all of this money. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah, a lot of these fights... And look at... I big, mean, yeah, let's, let's get the super slow-mo. The Zeke steal. 28 health. But it just felt like the execution on these engages wasn't quite there. Uh, great job done by the Tom, just gobbling people up. But also the Varus. Like, I feel like the Var Varus was a silent hero in this game, you know? Yeah. Nobody talked about too much, but doing kind of crazy amounts of damage in all these fights. I feel like we're going to get to see the post-game damage, and it's just going to kind of be Varus and then everyone else, is my prediction. If, I, think, uh, I think you might be onto something there. I feel like uh, Henna... Certainly uh, missed quite a few ultimates, but landed a lot of them when it counted. Yeah, hit the Q, right? Uh, uh, that's the important thing. And uh, it's a bit sad that uh, Willa gets rewarded for playing a tank, because I really do like it when Willa's having a good time uh, playing his more damaging heroes, but it is the Maokai that finds his success in the end. He's accepted the conclusion that Genji made, um, that Canyon made, where you just stick your jungler on a tank. Yep. That easy. Just build the tank items. Like Frozen Heart and Kanic Rukin and win. <laughs> <laughs> Execute was 100% just trolling him there. Yep. 100%. Yep. He was committed to the play. That's uh, that's beautiful. Uh, Closer is going to do the most damage. Yeah. And I mean, POG is such a weird question for this game. I didn't even have to think about it, uh, fortunately for me. But you did. Yeah, I went Closer. Yeah, I think it might actually just have to be that. I mean, he had such a good stop watching that fight, and honestly, just really solid throughout. I think, you know, there was consistent play from Henna as well, but I, I think Closer just had a a good Azir game in my LCK. In 2024? Crazy. That's absolutely ridiculous. And now, to make sense of it all, thankfully, we have three men standing alongside at the space, and they can unravel the mystery that was that best of three. Take it away, gentlemen. 
Surely, definitely, yeah, we'll do exactly that. Thank you, casters, for your wonderful cast on the day and getting us through that awesome and wonderful series we had there between Firex and Nongshim. Uh, Firex on top at the end. They did take it in a fierce game number three. Just as I predicted, just as we all predicted. Yeah. Uh, you know, Firex uh, predictions, predators <laughs> over here. You know, we have the west side of the LCK where we play slow. We have some clean macro. There's a lot of strategic choices, some prio in the draft, you know. Okay, I'm playing around top side of the early game, scaling. And then you have the east side where things get a little bit weird. And then you have Firex versus Nongshim where we don't need strategy. We don't need planning. We don't need top tier drafts. We just go in and press the buttons and somebody's going to come out with a victor. And it was Fear X tonight. It was Fear X tonight. They did win. <laughs> yeah, I, I, so we're starting to see really uh, an, an emergence in specific styles, depending on where you the ladder you look. <laughs> And I think if you look at the top of the ladder, Gen G and T1 look really clean in their wins. Exactly know what they're doing. Mechanically, it looks great. Everyone's in perfect sync. Wonderful. I think it's a little messy, you know, DK some games. They look great. KT, other games. Yeah, Hama, another good example. And then you get, in my opinion, to the sweet spot. The Kwangdong. Uh, although, I don't know if Kwangdong is going to stay there. Nongshim, Fear X. Well, you don't know what's going on. So you just got to strap in and get ready for a ride. <laughs> We had a bit of a ride. Uh, let's take a look at the draft gold. because we are obligated to. Um, <laughs> what did you guys think about these uh, champions? Did they have an effect on this game? Put it down now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I Vinden, decide Vinden was bold enough to play the Yone. Yes. We were, we were, like, we weren't sure if it was going to work out, but we knew it either was going to be a winning din din. Or losing Din Din. He was I still don't until, know what he was. He was winning until he wasn't. Maybe the, the pivotal point was when he died to the Grom. Um, but I like that he was willing to try it, you know? Uh, I think the Zaya was the, the only one that we really have an issue with. Zaya is good if you know what you're picking it into and you know that you're not picking it into something with a lot of range. Picking Zaya when there's already a face up. Uh, combination of Varus and Azir, I think is going to make your game really hard. And I think that Jiwoo not necessarily had a great game, but I also think that this is the type of game where, like, how how can play? It's actually can play? basically impossible. Well said. Uh, you know, you can pick other stuff with Rakan. I know that Zaya is uh, his partner, but it doesn't have to be that way every single game. Uh, let's take a look at our first highlight because, you know, uh, we should. Let's take a look at this fight here. Um, I want Peter call, gets in there. I want to call back to uh, the original Peter meme that Valdez and I brought where he's Peter Parker, right, and he's Spider-Man. It was definitely a Spider-Man moment where he swings here, and we're gonna, we, our observers did a great job of actually capturing, you know, the, the photo here, just like the Daily Bugle needed. And it's the Zeeks, um, actually, that they capture here that's so beautiful, that's this field. 28 health. And and um, it would have been even better if this was the moment where then they win the game off of that because they don't lose the soul. They don't lose the soul, though. That, that didn't end up happening. So, actual win for Peter. It was a win for Peter. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty nice moment. Uh, not more than a minute later, they decide to go into the blue side jungle of the blue team. And we can take a look at that second highlight now and show off the wonderful moments that was uh, Dindin dying to a Grom. I just, just let the Maokai go. Don't, don't use everything on Maokai. Must hit Tank items are broken. Hit They're three. so good. Why? And Dindin is arch enemy. <laughs> the shutdown. Oh, the shutdown. He also died to the dragon earlier on in the game, by the way. Um, that did. was in a much, you know, closer fight. We didn't actually grab it, but there was also a moment um, where the game ended where everyone used all of their ultimates on a Zonia's. Um, and that okay, was but really the turning, uh, or the deciding. That, that was, that was, yeah, that was when the game was over. I, in, in, <laughs> to give to give some credit, I do think that was really well timed there by Closer because he specifically, uh, preemptively, when he saw Rakan coming, used his ultimate and then immediately followed up with the Sonya. So Rakan didn't get to fully see him, and obviously they should have just stopped at one ultimate. I don't think Dundin needed to throw his ultimate there, but at that point, it would have mattered. Who knows? Like I said, this game is all about you go and you press your buttons, and there's a there's a, the end. A result. Something comes out. <laughs> It's true. I mean, I think Firex pressed their button slightly better at the end of the day, and uh, they were the victors. Let's see who is the victor of the POG vote on this game number three. Uh, we at the desk here had Willer on our minds, but it will be Closer who does pick up the POG. I couldn't vote for his ear. 
couldn't do it. <laughs> I actually think that he got it because he made Azir look pretty good, which hasn't really happened. Closer is an interesting one when it comes to specifically this champion because it is like the one champion he plays that isn't melee that I think he has had really good performance on in the past as well consistently. And in this game, he just had a couple of clutch moments. And Closer, for all of his faults, I do think is a player that, uh, you know, with all his moments of overaggression, his inconsistencies, his champion pool, there are just moments where this guy will win you the game. And I think it's really cool to see that even like a couple of years after he's been on Sandbox, now uh, Fear X, uh, way after he was at one point a starter besides Faker back in 2021. Um, Surprisingly, not that split of a vote, to be honest. I, I thought there'd be votes everywhere. We do see some some votes down in the bottom lane. Two of us going for Willer. We thought his ults were pretty good. He had a lot of map control. Didn't die. Didn't die. Uh, but yeah, closer, decent game, maximized his damage. And sometimes when the, the, the games get this down and dirty, those zero ultimates, those stopwatches, the damage of the Sand Soldiers, what you need to, to finish it off. What do we think about the Henna votes? Like. What do, what do we think? Is so that I, okay? Or? I think simultaneously, what the casters were saying, I think Hannah played a good game of hit people with the arrow. He did not do even good a game remotely. Of hit with the chains. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, I think so change to me is, is like, it's kind of deceptively hard, but he did have a lot of setup in, in the rest of his team. So I don't think he had to throw out as many as he did, but it's, it's Lethality. Varus, right? Like it's a it's a 30 minute, 30 second cooldown. Yeah, I feel like it can be difficult when the when the team fights are so just objectively all over the place. It's like I don't even know when I'm gonna press my alt or what I'm gonna do just because there doesn't seem to be a lot of um, teamwork going on. You know, the enemies are flying at you at all different directions. It all seems somewhat random. So you're like, ah, I don't know when I'm gonna use this. It's a tough game to break down. To to put it to put it frankly with everyone watching right now, uh, there was a lot of chaos. There was not a lot. There was not like a where we do the usual thing. Where we're like in highlight one. This was the, the critical moment. It, it it really just wasn't like that. This this whole series wasn't. It was very fun though. <laughs> it did exist. I think. A besides a lot of other League of Legends, it, it, it doesn't quite hit the lows of the, the Bro DRX series, right? Where you're just waiting for something to happen. They did ensure that we were entertained. And for that, we thank them. We were entertained and uh, we're not done yet with the entertainment. We have Deer on the line to translate this interview. Let's jump into that right now. Now we apparently have Clear and Closer, the CL duo. This is your first win streak of spring. How do you feel? I know that this was a important match in terms of our ranked news battle. I'm, I'm very happy that we were able to secure this victory. And I also believe that today's victory was important. So I'm glad that we are able to win today. Yes, just like you said, today's victory was an important one that contributes to the inevitable rankings battle. And as the opponent swapped their mid laner out, there must have been a lot to consider. So what was the main focus for today? So Fiesta and Call Me, we expected that they both can come out today in today's match. So we were expecting that. And we knew that they have different play styles and different champion pools. So I think that's what we focused on today in terms of preparation. And clear in game one, you had the unanimous POG votes. And you ended Jax's nine losing streak. And we noticed that you picked Jax over Aatrox in the second phase of the draft. So what is the source of your confidence here? Just comparing the drafts uh, from the enemy, I believe that Jax was a better pick uh, than Aatrox, just looking at the comps. So what do you think is the reason Jax has such a long losing streak? Uh, with a different new season, I feel like the changes in items um, 
When Zonia's was a lot cheaper, uh, Jax probably utilized it a lot, but with the item changes, I think Jax kind of loses uh, prior in terms of uh, utilizing all these items. So I think that's probably why it had such a long losing streak. And with your aggressive winning, it seems like you got a solo kill and you traded that. And so, is asserting dominance a big part of the Jax versus Aatrox matchup? Yeah, so I think you need some sort of momentum when it comes to that top lane matchup. So, that's probably why I was so aggressive. And closer, although game two was a loss, your signature pick. Irelia made an unexpected appearance, so how did you come up with this pick? It's a pick that I really like, and against or Oriana, I was contemplating on what to pick and play, so uh, in the end, I decided that Irelia would be a good pick into Oriana. And in game three, clear, you faced Dindin's Yone with Aatrox, and with Yone versus Aatrox match up so hot lately. Many believe that Aatrox is very much playable, so what are your thoughts on this? I feel like in the laning phase, it's not very inconvenient to play Aatrox. And uh, Yone used to be more, ha have more advantage as, as you get more items, but I think Aatrox, you definitely can say that it's viable when it comes to just Yone versus Aatrox uh, matchup as of late. And in game 3, Closer, you had an incredible performance with Azir. And it looks like you are the, the sole person who got a POG with Azir, with so many losses that people got on Azir. And you made Azir look like Yone today, with so much aggressive action. Uh, what would you say Closer's way of playing Azir is? I feel like when it comes to Azir, his melee fighting is actually still really good and it's viable. So I would say that it's a very good pick when it comes to just team fighting or fighting in general. And now that you successfully secured your second consecutive win, uh, you'll be up against Gen G next. So what is your resolution? Uh, Genji is a strong opponent, so we'll make sure that we put even more hard effort into preparing and we'll make sure that we are able to win. And closer? I believe Chubby is a great player, so I have a long way to go in terms of practice, and I'll make sure that I, um, I stand my ground against Chubby. And this will be the end of the interview with Clear and Closer of BRX, and back to the space. Thank you, dear, as always, for that awesome translation. Let's take a look at the standings now after Firex get this win in the 2-1 victory. They're still on the east side as they do have one less point than Kwangdong Freaks with the same match score, but they're feeling pretty good about their current spot. That's the, the hotly contest contested spot right now is that final playoff spot. I mean, yes, D-Plus has had a pretty tough schedule sitting at 2-3 and three right now, but... You know, a lot of people are saying Fox gets that last spot. Some people are saying Kwangdong gets that last spot. D-plus now has to contest with this, but this is definitely a bit of a shakeup here, um, you know, that could go down. Kwangdong Freak's on a hot streak right now. It's hard to say who's going to get that sixth spot right now. And it really will be very interesting as we go deeper into week three, but especially what will the break do? We'll of course, have a break after week three. And how will the teams look coming back? I think DK in particular right now is looking rough. As you mentioned, strength of schedule important there. Um, Kwangdong though, I, I can't wait to see more of this team. Like they've actually been uh, been really exciting, which is a breath of fresh air. For Nongshim, I, I, I gotta say, uh, these are the type of games that ideally you'd really want to win. As uh, tomorrow, we'll see Kwangdong. I, I, I mean, I, I think that they're a lot better than they were. I, I don't know about that. We'll see Kwangdong. I don't know about that. <laughs> they're up against Gen G, who seems pretty unbeatable at this point. And then we got D Plus up against Humble Life Esports. Any D Plus Predators? <laughs> yeah, D Plus just <laughs> lost to Kwangdong. And uh, Humble Life Esports only had two Predators, right? It was you and who? Yeah, I mean, I, I mainly did that because of Viper. And after the. The, the, the series against Kwangdong, I feel good about that specific reason for my prediction. I do not feel good about my D-plus prediction at this moment in time. <laughs> I'm a 
little bit concerned yeah. about what it Same. could mean for my prediction correctness percentage. Showmaker and Lucid are really good. Maybe they can turn it around. Quantum Freak seems like a strong team, so who knows? Who knows? What what does it all mean? We'll have to just wait and see tomorrow, guys. Thank you so much for watching us today on the LCK, and we'll see you tomorrow for more action. Have a good night.